Hello, everyone. My name is David Danzig. Welcome to SAS's third annual virtual conference, Opening the Ancient World. As director of Save Ancient Studies Alliance, I would like to express how happy I am, and we all are, to have you join us today and tomorrow. This year's conference theme is Discovery, Science, and Tra Technology in the Ancient World, Traditions and Innovations. I'm going to spend the next several minutes giving some introductory remarks, after which we will move on to the first session of today. First, I will introduce myself and our virtual conference team members. Next, I'll explain what SASA is and give you a taste of our goals and programming. Then I'll introduce the conference's theme. And finally, I'll explain the conference's format, where it's being live streamed and how you can participate. Again, my name is David Danzig. I hold a PhD in Ancient Near Eastern Studies from the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World of New York University. I started SASA over three years ago, and in that time, we've had the wonderful pleasure of benefiting from the time and effort of over 300 great volunteers. This conference is the third that SASA is hosting for the third summer in a row. This year and last year's conference have been created through the amazing work and dedication of Ahn Nguyen, our conference coordinator. Although Ahn could not make it on today, I'm sad to say, I'll introduce her anyway. Even in her absence, her fingerprints are on every aspect of this conference. She has personally been in touch with every speaker you will hear over the next two days. The next time, the time amount of time that she's invested all year long to bring together this wonderful group of presenters and sessions has been quite exceptional. So Ann earned her BS and PharmD from the University of Connecticut and her MA in Egyptology from the University of Manchester. She has been part of SASA since 2021 and she currently works as a pharmacist in New York City and is a member of the South Assasif Conservation Project, currently excavating at Luxor. I'd like to truly thank Ann for all the great work she's done. Ann has led our virtual conference team, whose contributors I will now recognize. Austin Blackman helped with setting up partnerships with our live streaming partners and facilitated the Independent Scholars Working Group, which was begun as an outgrowth of the first SASA conference and continues today. In fact, we'll hear from one of the foremost members of the Independent Scholars Working Group right after me. We thank him for his efforts and wish him well in his new job. I would also like to thank our summer interns, Sam Honchak and Taylor Hayes. Sam is an undergraduate student at the College of Charleston, majoring in classical, classical studies and archaeology. She is a library student assistant at the college. Taylor is an undergraduate student at Central Connecticut State University studying public history and anthropology. In addition to her academic work, she is a museum, museum educator at the Noah Webster House and Hartford Historical Society. Along with all the work that the two of them have put in the past two months into finalizing details for the conference, both Sam and Taylor will be moderating some sessions this weekend. I would also like to thank our other moderators for parts of the conference, in addition to Sam and Taylor, and they are Cassandra May, Julie Levy, Megan Lewis, and John Haberstrom. Next up, I'll explain what SASA is in a nutshell. The mission of Save Ancient Studies Alliance is to promote ancient studies in order to reverse the current downward trend in the study of the ancient world by building a grassroots movement through outreach, collaboration, accessibility, and public scholarship we work together toward our goal of inspiring a wider inclusive community of learners and scholars. SASA's projects and programs are based on seven strategic areas, which we call the SASA ARC. By working on each of these areas, we are revitalizing ancient studies as a vibrant, inclusive, accessible, and widespread area of knowledge, study, and engagement. So now for the SASA ARC. One, know what you know. It's about educational sociology and marketing research, these projects to understand better how ancient studies is functioning in our education and in our society. Two, raising awareness, generating interest in the ancient world and highlighting the value of ancient studies as our source of knowledge about the ancient world. Three, supporting education, supporting formal and informal ancient studies learning at all educational levels. Four, increasing accessibility to increase access to ancient studies for everyone. Forming an alliance is five, encouraging ancient studies fields, this 
large conglomeration of different fields that have to do with the ancient pre-modern world to come together and to make public outreach integral to our work in addition to teaching and scholarship. Six is re-envisioning post-education scholarship to create a wider inclusive community of ancient, scholar, ancient studies scholars and students, integrating people of all backgrounds who work in all professions, but who have passions in, about ancient studies. Seven is advocacy, helping advocate on behalf of departments and institutions that are experiencing difficulties. So over the next two days, interspersed between all our wonderful academic presentations, you will learn about the many projects that SASA is working on to attack the problem on each of these fronts. I'll give you a few examples. Our archaeogaming education program was supported this past year by the New Jersey Council for the Humanities and an initiative called Humanities for the Public Good of the University of North Carolina. We've completed six archaeogaming education modules, which have been used in middle school classrooms across, across the United States and have just received more funding from NJCH to work on two more modules. This project helps teachers reach students with ancient studies content in a format students are happy to engage with. Our free online reading groups were supported this past summer, well, this current summer, by a grant from the Gladys Griebel Delmas Foundation and featured topics ranging from the Mesopotamians to the Vikings to the Aztecs. Participants come from around the world. Our Ancient Studies Resources Database covers websites with excellent content about ancient cultures on all continents across the world throughout the pre-modern past. It has over 1,400 vetted websites and counting on it. You should go check it out as at saveancientstudies.org slash resources. Our free online live events have attracted thousands of participants. We have them running weekly. They're a great place to get some insights into the ancient world. We're also working on new projects, the foremost of which is our new mentorship program for high school seniors and college freshmen and sophomores this, problem, this program is set to begin this fall. I really encourage you to read our third annual report on our website, saveancientstudies.org slash library, and you can see all of the wonderful things we've been working on. Now I'm gonna move on to explain a little bit about the SASA virtual conference. This conference that we're at right now is intended for all ancient studies scholars and anyone interested in the ancient world. In presenting an academic conference in an open access online format, advertised as widely as SASA is able, we have four goals in mind, to hold an academic conference freely available to the public, to foster discussion and action regarding public outreach and scholarly inclusiveness, to present and support scholarship by scholars around the world who work outside academia and researchers who have not followed the tradi traditional pathway into academia, and to continue building a joint community of scholars, including both those whose occupations are inside and outside academia. As I mentioned before, the topic of this year's conference is discovery, science and technology in the ancient world, traditions and innovations. With the increased attention focused on rapid developments in technology in the world today, including the recent introduction of AI advances, such as chat GPT and self-driving cars, this conference seeks to take a wide lens view of how societies have developed and handled science and technology innovation throughout history. We look at to ancient pre-modern times and examine tradition and innovation in cultures around the world. Over the next two days, in addition to our three keynote speakers, we are excited to have 17 presenters who will give academic presentations about technology and innovation in different areas of the ancient world. Our presenters come from numerous spheres, independent researchers, PhD students and candidates, university and community college lecturers, high school teachers, chaplains, archeologists, art historians, pupils from a diverse wide backgrounds and diverse professions. Now, before we start the conference, I wanna go over the schedule. To do that, I'm going to first share my screen. Give me a second, please, if I can find the right place on my screen to share. No, it doesn't want to show me the right place to strip. I think we'll just share the whole screen. Wonderful. There we go. Okay, so this is the schedule for our conference. Um, 
there are three types of sessions that the conference works on. One is a special session where a lot of people will come on and have discussions in the Zoom, and there will be that'll be live streamed, but they'll all be together in one group on the Zoom together, um, and everybody will be able to participate in those. Those are there's one special session today, and one again tomorrow, and those focus really on specific topics within uh, the whole sphere of our ancient study scholarship and how we can work towards improving things. Now, in terms of the academic presentations, there are two session, types of sessions. One are the regular sessions in which our wonderful presenters will present their um, topics and discussions. Um, each slot is 30 minutes long, 20 minutes for the presentation, 10 minutes for Q&A afterwards, which our wonderful moderators will take from the chat that's aggregated for wherever you are watching this right now. And then we have three keynotes. So today's schedule, we'll start with the SASA Independent Scholar Working Group presentation after I'm done. Um, and then we'll go on to the first session of today, have a special session from 11.30 to 1 Eastern time, a keynote session, session from 1 to 2, another session from regular presentations from 2 to 3, a th second keynote at 3, and then a final fourth session, regular session at from four to six, followed by a few presentations from SAS's teams. We'd love for all of you, everybody watching this, to participate actively, as actively as you can. In every place where you are, there's a chat box. Please feel free to put in your comments and discussion there and pose questions to the presenters that the moderators would select from and ask post to the presenters themselves. Also, um, to discuss the conference on Twitter, use the hashtag OAW conference, OAW being open, opening the ancient world. Um, and we have an aggregated Twitter feed on the page. The main place to watch the conference is at saveancientstudies.org slash virtual hyphen conference. Um, we're happy to see you there and in any of the other places where it's streaming. It's also streaming on SAS's Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, but on our wonderful partner social media pages. Um, this includes Digital Hammurabi, World History Encyclopedia, Voices of Ancient Egypt, World of Antiquity, Perhe Studio, New Classicists, and History with Kaylee. We really thank our live streaming partners and applaud their role in bringing quality ancient studies content to their viewerships. Last year's conference attracted 10,000 attendees due in large part to the help of our live streaming partners. And we're really excited about how many people are, will be able to participate in this year's conference. So welcome to the conference. We're so happy to have you all here. Please pop in and out of the conference all day today and tomorrow and join us wherever you're currently watching or again at saveancientstudies.org slash virtual conference. Now I'm going to turn over the conference presentations to Heather Rosenerin um, from our Independent Studies Working Group. Heather, please turn on your video and unmute yourself. Thank you, David. And good morning to all. My name is Heather Rosemarin, and I'm a founding member of SASA's Independent Scholars Working Group. Today, I am pleased to share with you an overview of the working group's activities and to extend an invitation to join us if you are interested in pursuing independent research in ancient studies. David, do you have the presentation up? Okay, here we go. Great, thank you. Um, next slide, please. First, a bit of history. SASA formed the Independent Scholars Working Group in 2021 with the goal of supporting independent scholars in ancient studies. We have three objectives. First, we work to foster a supportive and collegial community among ancient studies independent scholars. Second, we identify and share resources that address the research needs of ancient studies independent scholars. And third, we aim to connect ancient studies scholars who have roles both inside and outside the academy. Next, please. 
A question that often comes up is, what is an independent scholar? And there are multiple definitions of this term. Let's review a few. The National Coalition of Independent Scholars defines independent scholars as scholars who are pursuing knowledge in or across any field who are not affiliated with an institution of higher learning in a tenure track position. The Canadian Academy of Independent Scholars defines independent scholars as lifelong learners, avid readers and researchers, curious travelers and thoughtful practitioners who are not affiliated with a university or college. Humanities Commons defines an independent scholar as someone who produces research, which can be published or presented at conferences outside of a tenure track teaching position in a university. And our own David Danzig of SASA has said that an ancient studies scholar is anyone who has achieved sufficient mastery over a set of materials so that they are able to engage in current scholarly discourse on that matter. Within SASA's Independent Scholars Working Group, we strive to be inclusive and we welcome anyone who sees themselves in any of these definitions. To illustrate this point, here is a quick overview of our community. Participants include ancient studies scholars who have roles both inside and outside of academia. Inside the academy, it, participants include adjunct professors as well as PhD and MA candidates. We are particularly interested in engaging with recent PhDs who, for whatever reason, have decided not to pursue tenure track research positions, but do want to stay involved in ancient studies research. So for example, they may be pursuing a teaching career that does not include support for research or perhaps they are transitioning to a career in a completely different profession, but they wanna to continue to stay engaged. We also welcome current PhD and MA candidates, particularly those in remote programs who may find that participating in our working group helps create a sense of community and collegiality. Outside of academia, participants in the working group include active and retired professionals from a diverse array of fields. For example, I am an attorney with an AB in classics from Princeton and a passion for researching ancient Roman history. I'm in the midst of several research projects and I'm working my way at a tortoise-like pace towards publication. I appreciate the valuable encouragement and support I receive from the SASA Independent Scholars Working Group. Other participants have backgrounds in agriculture, banking, computer science, library science, local history, mathematics and medicine. I have found it particularly interesting to hear perspectives on ancient agriculture from a working farmer and perspectives on ancient medicine from a medical professional. Next, please. David, thank you. Here are several examples of research topics that working group participants are focusing on. As you can see, they cluster geographically around the Mediterranean Near East. However, we want to emphasize that independent scholars who focus on other geographic regions are also most welcome. Next, please. Now let's talk about the specific activities of the working group. We are volunteer led and our activities are designed to address the needs and priorities of our members. In the last year, we sponsored monthly Zoom calls to discuss the needs of independent scholars and how to address them. Calls are followed by an informal round robin style discussion of participants' current research projects. We hosted online work in progress fora where scholars present their work in a more formal manner and receive thoughtful feedback. We survey and collect resources available to independent scholars, and I'll talk more about this in a minute. We identify and address gaps in resources and other barriers to independent scholarship. And we collaborate with other organizations to strengthen the infrastructure for independent scholarship. Next, please. One of the main projects of the working group is collecting resources for independent scholars. Some scholars have the perception that independent scholarship, quote unquote, means laboring in isolation without support or access to resources. But this perception fortunately does not match reality. There is actually an increasingly robust infrastructure to support scholarship outside of academic research positions. Next, please. For example, if independent scholars want the benefits of institutional affiliation, for example, letterhead, or the ability to apply for organizational grants, they can explore membership in the National Coalition of Independent Scholars or the Institute for Historical Study, both of which have nonprofit 501c3 status and are open to US and international scholars. If they want access to research databases such as JSTOR, there are multiple free pathways to achieve that access in addition to paid subscriptions that are open to all. 
100% of the learned societies that we have researched to date welcome independent scholars to join as members and to participate in conferences and events. Multiple publishers also welcome submissions from independent scholars. Platforms such as Humanities Commons and academia.edu offer independent scholars ways to present and share their work online in a professional manner, including the creation of online profiles. I specifically want to highlight Humanities Commons, or HC, which is operated by a coalition of universities. HC is a welcoming and currently totally free platform accessible to independent scholars, where you can create websites for your projects, share your research, and archive your publications. HC will even provide DOIs, digital object identifiers. Indeed, there is a cornucopia of resources, and we are continually identifying and compiling these resources into a Google Sheet and with help from SASA interns publishing guides on the SASA blog. Next, please. If any of this sounds interesting to you or someone you know, here's how to get involved. You can send us an email or RSVP for upcoming events on our webpage on the SASA site, which you can reach by going to the Get Involved menu. Next, please. Thank you very much to SASA and particularly to David Danzig for initiating and supporting the Independent Scholars Working Group. We hope to see you on Zoom again soon. Thank you so much, Heather. It was really a pleasure hearing from you. And we really ask everybody who's interested in seeing what the Independent Scholars Working Group is up to and joining it um, should send us an email to independent scholars at saveancientstudies.org. We're happy to go back and forth with you and see how things could work out. Um, now we're gonna move on to our first um, presentation session of the day. And I'm going to ask Cassandra May to come on as the session's moderator. Thank you. Yes, I am here just sharing my screen. Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us for our conference. I'm introducing session one, uh, Traditions, Connections Between the Divine and Science and Technology. As a bit of an introduction to this session, our presenters will discuss the ways in which belief in divinity has aided in technological advancement, how do form and function connect to create a bond between humankind and the divine? How have technological advancements changed the ways in which humans worship a higher power? Our presenters will examine the ways in which technology and religion have developed side by side. In this session, the presenters will examine built altars during the Hellenistic period, the relationship between, between weaving, battle magic, and feminine power to the Vikings and the use of Vedic sacrificial pillars to convey knowledge of the workings of the cosmos. Our first presenter is Christy Draheim. Christy is a classical Greek art historian. She received a BA with distinction from the University of Virginia in 1997 and an MA from Emory University in 2002. She is an ABD. Over the past 20 years, Christy has taught a variety of art history classes at Georgia State University, Tidewater Community College, and Eastern Connecticut State University. Currently, she is a stay-at-home mom, homeschooling her five-year-old son, and a part-time art history content writer for study.com. A Virginia native, she now lives in New Hampshire with her husband and two children. Uh, the title of her presentation is Monumental Built Altars in Western Asia Minor during the Hellenistic period. And there we go. Sorry about that. And now I will stop sharing my screen and turn everything over to Christy. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Excellent. Um, There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I am so honored to be here and to share my research with you. First, I would like to thank Sasa, Cassandra, 
David Danzig, and everyone involved in organizing this conference. I first became interested in monumental built altars while researching my dissertation. Today, I will be discussing a particularly large collection of built altars and how they can be interpreted as a collaborative phenomenon. For those who are not classicists, I will begin with a brief introduction to the altar and its role in Greek religious ritual. Out of the myriad of forms Greek rituals could take, I will be discussing communal religious rituals performed in a public civic space for Olympian deities. These communal rituals revolved around the sacrifice of a domestic animal to a god on an altar in the god's sanctuary. The performance of the sacrifice consisted of four distinct yet connected rites. The commencing event of the ceremony was a procession which entered the sanctuary and made its way to the altar. The procession included the sacrificial animal, priest, and cult attendants, followed by spectators not involved in the ritual. Once the procession reached the altar, the consecration of the altar, sacrificial animal, and participants was performed. The consecration acts, including the pouring, pouring of water on all involved as an act of purification, the preparation of the animal, and the sanctification of the altar with barley groats. The slaughtering of the animal followed upon these dedications. In the case of a large animal, a bull or ram, for example, the animal was rendered unconscious with a blow to the back of the head with an ax. Its throat was then cut and blood was collected in a basin and poured on the altar. A small animal, such as a pig or chicken in contrast, could be picked up and held over the altar. When its throat was cut, the blood would flow directly onto the altar and into the fire. The final rite was the preparation of the meal. The animal was skinned, butchered, and cooked on the altar. The inedible portions, in particular the tail and the thigh bone wrapped in fat, were cremated on the altar for the god. And the inner organs were roasted on skewers and shared among the cult attendants. Once the ceremony had concluded, the meat of the animal was either roasted or boiled and divided among the spectators. The performance of the sacrificial ritual was the vehicle through which both the community as an entity and each person as an individual fix their relationship with the divine. Because of its pivotal role in all four phases of the ceremony, the altar was designated the most important cultic structure in the sanctuary. Whereas the temple was the house of the God and could only be entered by priests of the cult, the altar was the locus of the community's role in religious ritual and therefore symbolized the close relationship between the community and the God. The forms which the Greek altar could take were flexible since the only requirement was a flat surface upon which to perform the sacrifice. The term built altar designates a structure of architectonic design, in essence, an unroofed building. The altar could not be roofed for the logistics of a burnt sacrifice. However, the space within which the rituals were performed could be demarcated or even enclosed. By its very definition, a built altar is large in scale since it must contain an area spacious enough for the priest to perform the sacrificial rituals. However, the forms of this space and its enclosure could and did vary widely throughout the Greek world. The altar types I'm showing you on the top row mark sacred space with a stone fence or wall on three or four sides, whereas those on the bottom row employ a large podium and staircase to delineate the performative area. As no two built altars are alike, one can surmise that Greek cults had a high degree of autonomy when designing their sacrificial apparatus. The configuration of the built altar thus became a vehicle through which a cult could express its religious, civic, and or ethnic identity. At least 23 monumental built altars were constructed in Western Asia Minor during the Hellenistic period. These altars can be identified as a cohesive phenomenon because of their colossal proportions, architectonic form, use of ionic elements, and prolific, lavish, figural, often narrative sculptural decoration. With their magnified scale and luxurious design, these altars begin to rival temples as the architectural and sculptural focal points in sanctuaries. The emergence of such a large corpus of buildings sharing formal and decorative similarities located within a narrow geographical area and erected during a time span of almost three centuries 
invites a multi-pronged investigation in order to understand the phenomenon. Here I am showing you the great altar at Pergamon, undoubtedly the most well-known of the corpus and arguably one of the most ambitious and ostentatious in design. The emergence of these 23 monumental built altars spans almost 300 years, from the mid fourth century through the mid first century BCE. With the exception of the two earliest altars, and those would be the altar of Artemis at Ephesus and the altar of Poseidon at the Panionion, the chronology of construction falls within the Hellenistic period, traditionally defined as beginning at the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BCE and ending with the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. The dates of manufacture appear to be dispersed throughout the period with no detectable stretches of prolific activity or inactivity. The corpus of altars are located in Western Asia Minor, which comprises the Western coast of modern day Turkey and several Greek islands in the Aegean Sea. The distribution area of the 17 mainland altars spans approximately 600 kilometers north to south from Ilion in the north to Knidos in the south and less than 100 kilometers east to west from the coast to Sardis, Alabanda, and Lagina, the innermost sites. Additionally, there are two altars on the island of Kos and therefore altars on the island of Rhodes. More specifically, these altars reside in the regions of, I'm going from north to south, the Troad, Mysia, Aeolia, Lydia, Ionia, Caria, and the Dorian Hexopolis. By the Hellenistic period, these regions were both political territories delineated by shared ethnic and linguistic heritages as well as distinct topographical zones. The three in color here, Aeolia, Ionia, and the Dorian Hexopolis, each exemplify the autonomous Greek ethnic group that colonized that region, while Caria and Lydia were indigenous populations. The two Northern regions, the Troad and Mysia, are geographical regions which were under Greek political and military control by the Hellenistic, by the Hellenistic period, and for this reason, the Troad and Mysia are included here as Greek regions. So we have altars in five Greek regions and two indigenous regions. The distribution pattern of monumental built altars throughout these regions is as follows. 19 altars were erected in quote, Greek regions, one in the Troad, four in Mysia, including three in the city of Pergamon, one in Aeolia, six in Ionia, and seven in the Dorian Hexopolis. Four altars were erected in indigenous regions, one in Lydia and three in Caria. Sanctuary locations in predominantly Greek regions clearly suggest a Greek phenomenon. To play devil's advocate, I will provide the caveat that one, interactions between Greeks and indigenous Anatolians had been occurring for approximately 700 years by this time. And that two, cross-cultural exchange often blurred the categories of quote, Greek versus quote, Carian or Lydian. However, once we realized that these altars were located in established sanctuaries or newly founded sanctuaries following a conservative model, the preservation of traditional Greek religion is confirmed. The deities to whom the built altars were dedicated further indicate a Greek phenomenon and the preservation of traditional Greek cults. 18 altars were dedicated to ancestral Olympian deities to whom sacrificial rituals had been performed for centuries. Four altars were dedicated to Athena, three each to Apollo, Artemis, and Dionysus, two to Zeus, and one each to Demeter, Poseidon, and Asclepius. Helios and Hecate, also minor Olympian deities, were seldom the recipients of conventional rituals. However, their worship in traditional form here at the altars at Camiros and Lagina respectively can be understood as the appropriation of established rites to gain legitimacy for their cults. The altar of the Pantheon at Rhodes and the great altar at Pergamon, while atypical for not specifying the deity or deities worshiped, were nevertheless dedicated to Greek deities as confirmed by inscriptions in both sanctuaries. The goddess Meter, 
who was honored at Mamert Kale, was an indigenous Anatolian goddess and the only non-Greek deity to receive a built altar. However, the Greek colonists of Western Asia Minor had adopted the cult of Meter into their pantheon by the seventh century BCE. And her worship at a built altar in a Greek sanctuary during the Hellenistic period can be recognized as a preservation of traditional Greek ritual. All 23 altars are monumental in length, width, and height. This chart presents the external length and width measurements of the altars descending from the largest to smallest. There's clearly a wide range in size among the corpus. With the two largest altars, the altar of Artemis at Ephesus and the great altar at Pergamon being over five times the size of the smaller, smallest altar, which is that of Zeus at Eurymus. Keeping in mind that a built altar by definition must delineate or enclose a large enough space within which to perform the sacrifice, the altar at Eurymus at over six meters long and six meters wide provides ample room to fulfill these acts. It is then logical to reflect on the construction of the more expansive structures whose dimensions far exceed their functional requirements, structures that may reach gigantic proportions rivaling temples. Exploring the impetus behind this strive for magnified scale recurs as a common theme throughout my investigation of these altars. The built altars of Hellenistic Western Asia Minor share a common architectural design. I'm showing you four of them here. This is the altar of Dionysus at Kos, the altar of Apollo at Knidos, the altar of Athena at Ilion, and the altar of Artemis at Sardis. The common architectural design is an altar table and a prothesis, which is the step upon which the priest stood to conduct the sacrifice. These are raised on a tall podium, accessed by a flight of stairs or ramp, and surrounded by an architectural enclosure. Due to the functional requirements of the sacrificial ritual, the central court and altar table are never roofed, and the upper surface of the altar table is devoid of sculptural decoration. Even though no two built altars are completely alike, compositional similarities between altars are still discernible and a competitive spirit between certain altars presupposed as they each strove for more grandiose and opulent structures. The configuration of the enclosure wall varied widely among the corpus and allowed for individuality, emulation, or rivalry. The enclosure could be either pie-shaped, meaning on three sides, or rectangular, in form. And here we've got three altars that have the pie shape of the enclosure wall. And then notice here at Sardis how the side walls turn the corners onto the facade to kind of make a rectangle. The height of the enclosure could also range from a waist high fence to an over life size wall. All four examples here employ that shorter fence-like structure about to the waist of the priest. At least five altars and possibly as many as seven, although the remains are not preserved well enough to confirm, employed an elaborate over life-size enclosure wall organized into upper and lower tiers with a colonnade above a small sockle or a large base. The inclusion of the colonnade within the, the enclosure wall was the most insignificant modification made to the configuration of these built altars. The column was a structural necessity of a temple, which is here employed as a superfluous decorative addition. I'm showing you the altar of Asclepius at Kos, the altar of Artemis at Magnesia, and the altar of Athena at Priene. These colonnades all employ the Ionic order with one exception. The altar of Hecate at Logina appears to have a, a Corinthian colonnade. Complementing the intricate infrastructure, the exterior walls of the enclosure are often decorated with sculptural decoration. And in some instances, the interior walls are embellished as well. The decoration may be organized into several types. So here we have individual statues, either freestanding or in relief between the columns. You can also have 
relief individual figures on a frieze, as you see here on the base at Magnesia. And just to quickly return to these, both at Kos and at Kanidos, we have a relief narrative frieze that runs along the entire perimeter of the enclosure wall. And here I'm showing you examples of these different varieties of sculptural options. Part of the relief frieze from Dionysus at Kos, individual relief figures that were on the base at Magnesia, and a relief figure from between the columns at Priene. Earlier, we highlighted the continuity of traditional polis religion at the sanctuaries under investigation. However, it is important to add that the transformation that occurred at these sites was not just a recovery of past rituals. It was an architectural revival and a rejuvenation of the innovative spirit which permeated this region beginning in the archaic period. At least eight built altars of monumental proportions had been erected throughout this region in the sixth century BCE, two centuries before. I use the altar eight of Hera at Samos as an example of this archaic corpus. It is the largest in size with dimensions rivaling the great altar at Pergamon over 38 meters in length and 19 meters in width. It is one of the best preserved and it is representative of the archaic type. The altar table and prothesis were elevated on a large podium. They were fronted by a monumental staircase of 17 steps and enclosed on three sides by a massive enclosure wall. The drawing on the right reconstructs the priest standing on the prothesis while performing the burnt sacrifice on the altar table and this emphasizes the enormity of the structure. With this archaic architectural precedent in mind, the emergence and dissemination of a distinctive type of monumental built altar in the Hellenistic period is not surprising. These altars are not simply a restoration of archaic structures, but a fusion of archaic forms and bold creative strategies for glorifying the deity and enhancing the sacrificial ritual. They embrace the innovations of archaic Ionian architecture while further transforming them for a new era. On the left is the sanctuary of Asclepius at Kos, and on the right is the sanctuary of Athena at Priene. And through the layouts of these two sanctuaries, as well as others, we can construct the performance of the newly aggrandized sacrificial ritual and trace the movements of the priest, animal, attendants, and spectators throughout the ceremony. The first two preparatory stages of the sacrificial ritual, if you will recall, the procession and the consecration of all parties occurred in the interstitial space between the propylon, the entrance gate of the sanctuary and the altar. So here it goes, here's the propylon and then here's our built altar. Priene, here's our propylon and altar. The physical positioning of the propylon and altar in relation to each other allows us to reconstruct how the community processed through the sanctuary. While the presence of designated viewing areas dictated where participants and or spectators were to assemble. These viewing areas could be pavements, such as at Priene where a pavement is marked out. And at Kos, we have what could be called a theatra, a stepped seating area, which is actually the staircase up to the next terrace, but could also be used for people to sit and watch the ceremony. The massive enclosure walls of the altars formed a lavish backdrop for the rites that were performed in front, heightening their effect by means of scale, ornamentation, and perhaps acoustics. The slaughtering of the animal and its presentation to the god occurred inside of the altar in the central court, in front of the altar table upon which the fire was lit. The elevated position of the altar table surrounded by the imposing wall and colonnade, restricted the spectators outside from viewing the activities occurring inside. The dimensions of the central courts of these altars further indicate that this innermost area was not large enough to accommodate the numerous cult attendants and sacrificial animals. It is probable that only the priest, one victim, and possibly an assistant 
were privileged enough to enter this most sacred space and witness the most holy rites. These altars demarcated sacred ritual space through a series of restrictive barriers, beginning with the high podium and enclosure wall. Sensory manipulations established hierarchies between various members of the community, participants versus spectators, elite versus common citizens, it may be a preference for certain cult attendants, patrons, or religious or civic organizations. The hierarchies were achieved by increasingly restricting the number of participants, their physical movements and lines of, lines of visibility throughout the ritual. While also, while also manipulating spatial perception, directional focus, and acoustics, and teasing the senses of smell and taste. These built altars concretized this temporal ritual and reflected in spatial terms the underlying social cosmography of the sanctuary. These human relationships were eventually subjugated to the presence of the divinity through these very same devices. The aggrandized form and monumental scale of these altars physically manifested the God's omnipotence and constantly reinforced the relative inferior physical and metaphysical position of the spectator. In a ritual where the power of the God was made manifest, the position, design, and ornamenta ornamentation of the built altar con conveyed that power in tangible forms to the spectator. In closing, I return to comp contemplate the pinnacle of the built altar phenomenon, the great altar at Pergamon. The built altars of Hellenistic Western Asia Minor are intricately rooted in the region's past. Formally, the corpus of Hellenistic altars are hearkening back to the tradition of monumental built altars that were erected in the region in the archaic period by referencing their large scale and their solutions for enclosing the sacrificial space. However, the Hellenistic altars revolutionized both the form and the function of the cult apparatus to the extent that these altars begin to replace temples as the architectural as well as cultic focus of the sanctuary. And the ultimate question is why? What objectives were anticipated or achieved as a result of constructing a built altar? Each built altar is an autonomous case study. The cultural and societal forces that created each altar are intricately interwoven and unique to that specific place and time. However, in the chaos and uncertainty of the Hellenistic world, one dominant ubiquitous motivation behind the built altar phenomenon becomes manifest, the creation of identity. Whether fashioning a new or reviving a long forgotten persona, these sanctuaries chose to cultivate stability and permanence by grounding themselves in the traditions and rituals of a much glorified past. The dichotomies of tradition and innovation inform not only the corpus of altars themselves, but also the methodologies I have employed to investigate them. A typological analysis, while a conservative approach, still contributes to the field of architectural history, while a newer experiential inquiry adds sensory and performative details that reconstruct the sacrificial ritual for the viewer in four dimensions. In a manner analogous to these altars, my investigation straddles the line between the old and the new and discovers the bounty therein. For within that liminal space can be found not only the preservation of ritual memory, but also the threshold between the mortal and the divine. Thank you. And I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Hey, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, did actually get a bunch of questions <laughs> in the chat, so this is great. Let me. Let me well, I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. Okay. We have a private chat going, so I'm going to drop them in there just so you can see them as well, Christy, and then I'll read okay. them Okay, I well. am. Okay, there I am. <laughs> okay, so the first one that I have that came in is uh, from Brandon. Norman VS on YouTube, uh, could the appearance and size of monumental altars, which rivaled the size of temples, be a sign of the decline of the importance of the role of the temple within Hellenistic society itself? That's a great question. And the decline of everything is something that is um, 
is often considered for the Hellenistic period. It's considered a period of excess, of extravagance, and oftentimes it is considered a period of decline of the traditional moral values. And so you might think, as Brandon suggests, that maybe it's a decline of the importance of the temple itself. What I think we see at these built altars is that it's not so much a decline of traditional ritual, it's actually a conservation of traditional ritual and an aggrandizement, a, a proliferation of that ritual. Um, and that is why the built altar gets all the attention. Temples are still being built in the Hellenistic period and some of them are still very grand. Um, and we have um, certain architects within the Hellenistic period, especially in Western Asia Minor, for example, Hermogenes who are doing new and innovative things in temples. So I, I don't want to suggest that temples aren't being rebuilt and innovative. Um, they are. It is just the appearance of a new cultic structure, not a new one, but new attention given to an old cultic structure, um, which seems to grab um, a lot of the attention and resources. Great. And I think we have time for a few more questions. Sure. We've got until 1030 for our next presenter. So we'll sure. see how far we get on these. <laughs> uh, JT Lewis on YouTube asked, is there similarities between the spatial organization of the plazas viewing the altars? This is a great question. And this is um, one of my favorite things. Each sanctuary is very different. Um, some sanctuaries are very uh, linear, as we saw at Priene, where you process from the pro propylon to the altar to the temp to the temple, and then some have different axes, as you saw at Kos. You would go up uh, steps from the propylon up to the altar, and then actually the temple was on the next terrace. Um, so no, there. There can be some similarities, but basically, again, each sanctuary is laid out to take into account the particular individual um, interests of that cult and its sanctuary. So it is fun to see a sanctuary um, and see where it placed its altar, where it placed its propylon, its temple, any other buildings that might be around. Um, you can also, again, look for the uh, pavements or the stepped viewing areas. In some of the sanctuaries, we actually have places in the pavement where we can see the iron rings where they kept the sacrificial animals before the sacrifice. Some of these sacrifices would be up to 100 animals, 100 bulls. So they needed to actually keep them somewhere contained before the sacrifice. And you can actually see where the ring, the iron rings, where they kept the bulls were located. And so there are, besides the altar, there are many different indications in each of these sanctuaries um, that you can look to, to try to recreate. And it, it's a fun game for me to try to, to, to recreate and to imagine um, what these performances were like. Great. And let's see. We'll do one last question sure. uh, before we bring Irina on. Uh, Lakshmi Praveen on YouTube mm -hmm. asks, did the altars have different kinds of religious beliefs, traditions, and rituals with the different gods of Hellenistic, whether they have system like Vedic mantras? Um, each god did have specific beliefs. And, and to get even more in the weeds, each God had its own um, specific cult at a place. So, for example, um, an altar of Dionysus on Kos would not necessarily have the same uh, traditions or beliefs or performances as the altar of Dionysus at Teos. They're still both um, obviously worshiping the same God, but they are worshiping a specific version of that God who was favorable to their area. And so their sacrifices may not look anything at all alike. Um, I hope that helps. 
No, I think it did. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you again for the wonderful presentation. Of course. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. (laughs) Of course. And I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience learned a lot. Thank you. So again, thank you. And we're going to bring Irina on in just a moment to go over her presentation. First, I'm going to share my screen and do a bit of an intro for that. Okay, so War and Weaving, the Mythical Viking Loom with Dr. Irina Menea. Now, a bit about Irina. She was born and raised in a small town in Romania, moved to Bucharest to study at the university. At the University of Bucharest, she studied humanities, history and languages, and managed to have some stays abroad as well. She has been teaching several subjects throughout the past 10 years, including German, Swedish, Norwegian, history, and social studies. Uh, Irina emigrated to Germany almost two years ago, first to Saxony, then to Hesse. She is a big fan of metal music, especially black metal, myself as well, cycling, European detective series, old medieval towns with lots of half-timbered houses, and currently trying to improve her knowledge of Icelandic and taking a course on Indo-European linguistics. The title of her presentation is War and Weaving, the Mythical Viking Loom. And I am going to stop sharing now and turn everything over to Irina. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes. All right. Um, So first of all, congratulations to the team for their work and dedication in this project. I'm very pleased to be here and uh, many thanks for the opportunity to share my scholarly interest. Let's try to share this. Um, Okay. Hope you're able to see it. Yes, we can see it just now. Okay, good. All right, so today I am going to delve a little bit into the connection between um, women weaving and particularly war. And um, I am going to start by saying that a lot has been done in archaeology lately to retrieve the social world of women and highlight the major importance of their activities, um, either regarded as not that interesting so far in research or influenced by prevailing attitudes in uh, popular reception. So there was um, for a very long time an underrepresentation problem with regard to women's activities. So in this presentation, I am going to reflect on the potential cultural and magical interplay between an essential, essentially female and domestic activities such as textile work and um, some aspects of mythology, particularly a battle which comes into being through weaving interpreted as a as a prophecy. From the start, I should say that textiles um, have been critical to the development of um, Viking society and of society in general, um, and uh, uh, they pose this problem of the issue of the value of women's work in general. Um, As demonstrated by archaeologist Michelle Heyer-Smith, who has been doing a lot of research into this topic, the style of Viking weaving meant a wood horizontal bar on two vertical ones holding the separate vertical threads weighted down by volcanic stones, with regard to Iceland, uh, separating the warp threads by holding a heddle rod, one draws the horizontal weft thread in and out of one or more warp threads, and the process took place in a very special place called a dungia, which was a weaving hut with turf or wood walls and a hearth in one corner for warmth, um, generally speaking, a tight space where women could form bonds with each other, uh, share knowledge and craftsmanship, a space of feminine energy, usually avoided by men, as we can also see when we read the sagas, there was um, this taboo going on um, with regard to men entering uh, this um, uh, this type of room. Even after the um, coming of Christianization, when looms were brought into the area of the longhouse, weaving would still be performed in a confined space. 
Um, and um, taboos were not only linked to gender, but also to the economic significance of this act. Before changes in technology in the 18th century brought about an, a reorganization of textile production and integration into centralized production overlooked by certain patrons, women had monopoly over an intensive, essential and very time consuming activity uh, in the same time. Um, so we are dealing with the transformation of the role of women in society, but for about 800 years, um, they were pretty much in charge of this very important uh, activity going on, like I said before, in specific uh, rooms, as you can see here in this example from Hedebu or Haithabu in Schleswig in northern Germany. Um, this is also linked to a more um, general task of women in this time, which was estate management. Um, with regard to the activities, to the concrete activities going on, um, basically we have spinning and um, weaving um, and the objects that were produced ranged from uh, clothing such as long sleeved shirts, under tunics, embroidered necklines and cuffs, trousers, jackets of heavy wool, caftans if you look further to the east, cloaks, wooden, woolen caps, mittens, leggings, puff trousers, um, Ragnar Lothbrok himself, the famous one, um, has his nickname from uh, this specific type of, um, of trousers. Um, you could also have clothing with uh, the so-called Rockvar technique, which meant attaching fleece to the warp uh, teased out from the surface, which basically created a fake fur effect. But besides clothing, um, also curtains were produced, bed sheets, pillows, tablecloths, uh, tents, and of course, sails, which were essential in this age, because without sails, we wouldn't have the Viking Age at all. Um, at the higher end of all this uh, spectrum of activities, we have visual narratives in the form of wall hangings, um, tapestries, complex ones, um, which um, adorned the halls of the great chieftains, um, pointing out um, control of the social memory and political uh, history at the time. And um, uh, researcher Neil Price um, designates this with the term collective cultural um, statement, such as this example here from the Osseberg uh, tapestry retrieved from the ninth century. Unfortunately, retrieving such object objects is very tricky. Um, most of them are in pretty bad shape. Um, nevertheless, we do have some tools. On the other hand, uh, we also have references in uh, in the sagas and um, uh, more recent, we also have experimental um, archaeology. <clears throat> Um, the many daily uses in the Viking Age included products with many variations in patterns and uh, and color, as you can see here, um, warp face strap or tabby, uh, and so on and so forth. But with um, um, from the beginning of the tenth, um, going yeah, going further to the eleventh century, we can also notice a standardization of the patterns, which suggests the fact that, um, particularly in Iceland, um, this um, uh, type of several type of cloths, uh, the so-called vadmol had become um, um, a, a tool for trade, so replacing silver, for example, uh, which um, uh, was in small quantities. So we have this uh, twill pattern, um, and um, this was used as a replacement for, uh, for silver. The power of women by performing this act, which eventually also turns lucrative, so they actually earned money by doing it, is also suggested by the mythological aura of spinning and weaving in poetic and saga uh, sources. And um, before I delve a little bit into the um, into the figures known as the Norns, the Fates and Norse mythology, I would also like to add something with regard to uh, the tools, not only used for weaving, but also for, uh, for spinning. Um, the fact that we are dealing with um, highly ritualized um, activities indicates a potential magical uh, dimension, a potential connection to the uh, Norse magic known as Seder, um, meaning not well, not magic as you would normally think of it, but uh, with links to shamanism, um, alteration of consciousness, um, uh, access to the secret knowledge, initiation processes, and so on. So um, it has very much to do with this idea that you are making something from a raw material and you are turning it, to, uh, turning it into something very organized and structured um, with a very high cultural and social um, relevance. 
Um, there is also a reference in Ib Fadlan's um, account of the um, Volga Scandinavians, um, where he uh, points out that there is this kind of door they are raising um, during a sacrificial act, which may or may not be a connection to the warp weighted um, loom as well. Uh, researcher Gardella, for example, linked it to um, the meaning of the loom as a door to another dimension. This uh, has also to do with the fact that usually in these um, weaving huts, you can find the loom on the on the op opposite side of the physical door. Um, and on the other hand, you have all kinds of objects, uh, distaffs um, used in spinning, resembling um, wands, and um, these staffs um, were also found in um, um, what seemed to be the burial, um, burial graves of, um, of Ceruses, of the so-called um, Volva. Perhaps the most famous case in um, Norse mythology uh, with relation in relationship to uh, weaving is that of the Norns, the Fates. Um, um, there is um, a lot in popular culture about the strong association between um, between these characters and um, weaving. Although I I must say that the um, connection is not always that uh, that clear, but we do have. We do seem to have from the few sources on this um, on this account a strong association between fate and the uh, and the feminine. Fate fits well into the act of weaving because fate, as an inescapable act, exists as a pattern, just like the warp um, before the weaving begins. And in all old Norse tradition, fate is represented as a process of coming into being at the confluence between that which is set for you and what you can do to navigate around your uh, given pattern, rather than simply an intervention, a divine intervention directly you towards the expected uh, outcome. So we have these three characters, the Nornir, Ur, Verdandi and Skuld, um, with a little bit of controversy um, surrounding them. Um, the three names themselves seem to be um, a little hard to uh, to retrieve. The notion of a triple division of the collective group of Nornin is supported by poems such as Fofnismol in the uh, collection of um, uh, Nordic mythology known as the Poetic Edda, um, and uh, it resembles um, all kinds of trinities from the Greek and um, Roman uh, world, so we should not exclude an influence from, from this area. Um, the temporal interpretation is also a little bit problematic because um, they're usually regarded as the past, present, and future. Um, however, Urd and, um, uh, and Skuld, uh, they don't really seem to be representatives of specific chronological periods, but rather of um, aspects of of death and uh, and fate. Urd is also linked to the um, well at the um, uh, roots of the world tree. Uh, Uktrasil and Skuld is also found in the lists of Valkyrie or so of um, um, yeah, battle deities, the deities choosing the um, uh, the dead the dead from uh, from the battle um, from the battlefield. So there are no clear cut representations of the Nornir engaged in spin spinning and weaving. Um, the Edic poem Volundar Kvida, on the other hand, has such a reference, and it is very important to us. Uh, it contains maybe the only reference to uh, supernatural female figures who spin, um, and um, in the poem we can find the term Urlok uh, Drygia, which means to fulfill uh, fate. The term Nornir, however, is nowhere mentioned um, in the entire poem, um, and neither is it in the prose passages accompanying it. Um, the prose introduction labels these women as these women as Valkyrie, in fact but the poem simply calls them maidens, um, meyar. Um, in scholarship, the women are also referred to as the swan maidens, a term which uh, doesn't really occur that often in uh, Old Norse tradition. And the set of names applied to them, uh, Hervor, Hladguder, and Olrun, um, hint at the fact that they have the, uh, this battle connotation as well. Hervor, for example, is compounded from the noun uh, her, which means uh, army, and vor, who is listed as uh, the goddess of oaths in one of the Thulur, the lists of um, gods. And um, with regard to the other names as well, we have reference to uh, either um, a killing a battle goddess in the case of Hladgordar and Olrun, probably um, some kind of reference to um, ale runes also mentioned in poems, um, such as the one where uh, the Valkyria Brynhildr from the cycle of the Volsungs um, gives knowledge to the hero uh, Sigurdr. Um, 
Well, in this poem, um, these female figures are liminal. They are between water and uh, land, between night and day, between human and animal. They don't easily fit into a particular category. And fate in this poem seems not to be something imposed on the three brothers marrying these um, these women, but rather to be um, uh, to, to be a fate to which the women themselves are subject, namely that they must, must act like migrating uh, birds. In consequence. And um, then we have the poem Helga Kvida Hundingspana, um, also from the collection Poetic Edda, uh, an evidence for the not near this time uh, by name involved in some, some kind of textile related um, activity. They are acting as creators of fate at the birth of a hero. And here you can find the term Erlok uh, Thato, which means um, fate threads. So this clearly conveys a close link between fate and um, threads. On the other hand, we have terms such as Snua, which is to twist greater which is to come out um, implying the fact that we might uh, have to do with um, we might, might be dealing with something else than spinning um, applying for example uh, was something proposed by um, the um, uh, researcher Beck Peterson um, because on a spindle plying can be done by fastening the ends of the strands onto the spindle and while carefully keeping the individual strands separate uh, you can twist them together by turning the spindle in the opposite uh, direction so basically you have three strands coming together in one thread uh, representing one um, fate or something like that so they are twisted into one one uh, end of each thread fastened into the sky and um, um, where the threads are split apart they're fast and in in um, uh, in three um and very interesting is the fact that the reference is um, to a geographical binding uh, in the sense that the prince should have the land between these um, uh, these threads. So it's not only related to fate, but also to a geographical demarcation. So with this in mind, I am going to now describe a little bit the poem I've been focusing on this compelling source. Uh, it's a piece from the saga of uh, from the saga of Njol, um, and it is a description of a supernatural um, weaving. You have a very frightening imagery where you catch a glimpse of um, uh, the strong relationship between women, war, and weaving, and its um, its magical connotations. Um, so, in addition to uh, choosing warriors for for Valhall in this particular poem, the Valkyries play an active part in the outcome of the. Um, Battle of Clontarf in 1014, where uh, the king, the Irish king, Brian Boru, um, won the battle, but he died. So we're basically ha dealing with um, a soldier noticing early in the morning um, some women, 12 um, uh, or six in the poem, riding and entering a hut follows them and then he peers through the window and realizes that uh, the women are engaged in a weaving process with a warp weighted loom, but using um, human organs as pieces of um, of the loom and um, this is can be considered as um, being an enhancement of the narrative but also a uh, disruption uh, there is also a bit of controversy regarding the actual battle taking place with some researchers considering uh, that um, the battle depicted here was not actually the battle of Clontarf because of some incongruencies in the um, um, in the subject matter um, for example the fact that um, the battle was not actually not won by the Norse, and uh, the poem, on the other hand, um, deals with um, this Norse prince actually winning the battle. So, because of this, it might have been a later addition to uh, to the text. Um, so, what are we dealing with here? Well, uh, from the first two stanzas, you can see um, that um, um, these women. Um, associated with uh, battle, they are setting up a um, a loom. And um, yeah, the threads are open for the dead. Uh, it's raining blood from the cross beam, and the gray weave is forming, um, which uh, the friends of Randver Skiller, this is a common metaphor or kenning for Valkyrie, um, uh, fills with the red uh, weft. And then the warp is woven with men's entrails, heavily weighted with men's heads, blood covered spears, and the heddle rods. The shed is iron clad, shaken by arrows. And um, at the end of the stanza, they say that they will strike with swords this weave of victory. Um, the terminology here is very important because um, it is perhaps the, more, the most complex list of terms um, used for um, different objects. Um, 
linked to uh, weaving um, so you have the term the terms for example for weft and warp for pin beta sword beta um, and so on and so forth um, these women they are singing while working and prophesize doom on the battlefield they're turning the poem into an example of fate actualization the material practice can be found very well into these two standards, but they are um, they're also continuing um, in the in the next one. They are basically beating um, the Sigurvev, the so-called battle web with um, uh, with swords. There have been several theories about this poem. Um, there. There are people who consider that this um, this is just a poetic image, but not fate is involved. Um, and um, on the other hand, um, the very strong links between these activities and what is actually happen uh, what is actually happening on the battlefield and in the description um, after this poem suggests that we are more likely dealing with a case of sympathetic um, sympathetic magic uh, which means that Valkyrie both uh, weaving and on the battlefield uh, they actually influence the fate of the warriors um, and the supernatural cannot really be dissociated from uh, from the activity the correspondence of archetypal activities so weaving in the household on the one hand and uh, choosing the slain on the other hand for the supernatural women um, we can consider it as an allusion to women as guardians of life and uh, death and uh, to my mind as well we are dealing with the vision and happening noticed um, by someone who is um, um, required to play an active role um, at, the, at the end we have this uh, this person actually looking at what is happening and then we have an in, um, involvement of the audience at the end of the uh, poem so since weaving is such a highly skilled and meticulous activity requiring a great deal of organizational skills, uh, among other things, uh, foresight, um, creation, and so on, um, this um, can be linked to the idea of manipulating the outcome of a battle. Um, and um, as a common thread, uh, we again have this idea of, um, um, of fate. And this is, um, um, as a piece of evidence for this, um, we have um, several places in the poem, for example, Lotum uh, Egilif, Hans Farask, let us not allow his life to be lost. So this clearly shows a direct involvement into what is going on. Um, or Nu erfirir odum jar mother hnigin, now the earl has fallen be before the spears. Again, th th there is, a, a direct connection to uh, to what is going on on the uh, battlefield. Um, a clear cut reference to mythical weavers, but Valkyrie um, names and um, nowhere in skaldic poetry do Valkyrie appear with reference um, in relationship to to weaving. But then again, in Norse mythology, uh, we should refrain from drawing um, uh, drawing boundaries between these mythological uh, categories. And um, yeah, and um, uh, besides, we also have um, a very clear order of how these activities are um, are performed, um, and this also suggests um, uh, the fact that um, these women are actually engaged in structuring life and um, and death. And on the other hand, we have a potential symbiotic relationship between the um, weapons used in these um, activities. For example, the door, uh, the spear used at the head rod, um, the arrow, the or as pin beater, um, and so on and so forth. Um, what I wanted to point out are some connections with other um, references, both in Old English literature and in Old Norse literature, uh, which might help us see this um, relationship a little bit better. For example, we have in the um, Exeter riddle book, we have a riddle, riddle 50, uh, 56, um, saying something about somebody being inside when he saw a piece of wood moving uh, to and fro, wounding a struggling creature. It received battle wounds, deep caches, darts caused, um, caused it woe, as did the wood skillfully bound fast and uh, the riddle goes on uh, into the direction of uh, the weave again the um, warp weighted loom being uh, being represented and again this connection with a uh, violent imagery um, Beowulf also has some references to um, the web of, uh, of fate, uh, Wix Peda Yevjof, for example, or um, it also has a reference to, uh, to the peace weaver in connection to um, a queen who uh, does not live up to her uh, role in society. Um, and in the poem, the rhyming poem, 
um, you also have uh, a reference to a fate being given uh, given to you. And from Old Norse literature to come uh, to come a bit back to that, um, I mentioned before the Helga Kvida Hundingspana, where we have an example of Nornir spinning, probably or plying. Um, but um, at any case, we have uh, this idea of fate threads, the Orlok Thoto. And um, you also have some references in the sagas. Um, I also, um, I found, for example, um, perhaps the most compelling one in Lakstöla saga, where you have um, a woman called Gudrun, who is um, spinning, and at the same time, her husband uh, kills Kjartan, who is um, actually the one who she loves, but because she cannot have him, she decides to, uh, to have him killed. And you also have two more examples in um, uh, the Fosspreda saga and in the Erbidja saga with two elder women this time, um, Grima and Katla, performing acts of disappearance by, um, by matching while weaving or, uh, or spinning. However, this doesn't really um, seem to be the case of relationship with fate. This rather has to do with some yeah, some some spell, some uh, some trick. Um, the case in Lux de la Saga, I would uh, say, it is more is more compelling uh, in this case. Um, and then you have Yom's uh, Viking Saga, where you have Ingibjorg, who has a dream uh, similar to the poem I mentioned before, um, a premonition regarding the death of King uh, of King Harald. So um, you can see in a quote from the um, Blackstola saga, for example, Misi of Nverda Morgin Verkin, ek heavy spuni tolv ol nagarn, and to heavier vegit kjartan. So she uh, basically says that she spun um, 12 elves, um, elves of wool, and in the meantime, in the morning, you had nothing better to do than uh, to kill kjartan. Um, curiously, this would be um, also the price somebody would have to have uh, paid as a ransom for killing someone according to uh, law courts such as the Grogos in Iceland. So there is definitely a connection here to this uh, fatalistic function. So in conclusion, I would say that um, from what I have um, read so far, I don't think that textiles um, only have the significance of uh, domestic activity. Um, on the contrary, in Daradariot, for example, you have this unique preservation of technical vocabulary, uh, metonymic association between weaving and weapons, accurate representations of the physical and material process of weaving, combined with the idea that fate can be constructed using material processes, suggesting that the poem is a significant moment in, um, in the saga as, uh, as a whole. And afterwards, um, after this poem, the hero Kori actually manages to avenge uh, the killing of the family of, um, of Njol. So it, it does have some, some implications beyond the simple uh, metaphoric relationship between, um, uh, between the text and the uh, textile. And this is a connection that um, I think it, it is worth exploring uh, a little further, the link between, um, between text and textile, between um, weaving and writing. You have in um, Latin a word for this, the text that for both activities. Um, and uh, while this may sound like a modern approach to intertextuality, the cultural connection between poetry and material objects is not necessarily uh, anach anachronistic because textile work can be thought of as a performative act mirroring text and contributing to cultural uh, meanings assigned in a story. It is basically a speech act translated materially with um, a, a witness to carry on um, the message and with a clear intention from, uh, from the part of the uh, of the spear women of the um, of Valkyries. Um, so, in this poem, as well as in the other sources I mentioned, we can regard weaving as an act of ordering and shaping um, reality um, by means of arguments such as, first of all, the the vital importance of this economic activity and um, then the use of specific terminology in particularly this poem, the Dara Daryod, but also in other poems as well. Um, the link between weaving and uh, Batley suggested by um, the symbiotic relationship between uh, tools in weaving and tools in battle. Um, and uh, then the idea of materializing um, fate through this process of either spinning, weaving, either way, a uh, textile process. All right, I hope I did not talk too much. 
And uh, thank you very much for listening to um, what I had to say. I'm looking forward to presenting this into uh, in a, the form of an article as well in the future. Microphone. Helps yeah. if I unmute. Yes, thank you for the presentation. It did not talk too long. Do not worry about that at all. Oh, good. What yes. a <laughs> great presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, though, I think we will go right into the next one instead of taking questions right now. Um, let's see. First, however, I do want to let people know that we uh, have a fundraiser going on right now. Uh, you're welcome to donate by joining our raffle, entering the raffle, uh, savingshipstudies.org slash virtual conference. Uh, if you donate $25 for one ticket or $100 for five, you can win, drum roll, an amazing Sasa swag bag. So you can get all kinds of cool Sasa swag. Just enter the raffle. Again, that's savingshipstudies.org slash virtual conference to enter there. And... Irina, I think if you could stop sharing your screen, please. Thank you. And I'm going to share mine and be, introduce our next presenter. Okay, so our next presenter is Anne Aggie, who will be presenting on the Vedic Sacrificial Pillar. Anne was educated in the public school system in Virginia, and upon graduation, gained admission to an Asian studies program in the history department at the University of Virginia, where she took a Master of the Arts degree. She came to Penn to study history of art of India and found, however, that the subjects that she was interested in researching did not offer up enough documentation. The art, yes but textual underpinning and more specifically a theoretical tradition, not so much. She is confident that today, however, she actually is positioned to undertake such a topic and many related ones since her breadth of study has expanded greatly. It extended for South Asia back into the proto-historic proto period and undeciphered script. She ultimately, reached the same conclusion, so sought clarity by undertaking through its art and translated literature, study of the Sumerian civilization, and to some degree, its successors and antecedents. And now I will stop my sharing and send this over to Anne. Are you ready, Anne? And just one moment. I don't see the screen share on my bottom line. Here I am. I don't see the screen share. No, one moment. Let's see. It was one there moment before the troubleshoot. <laughs> it was there before. It was there before, yeah. It should still be there for you. It's not. Do you want to try leaving and rejoining the meeting? See if that works. I think I'll have to, yes. Okay. All right. We'll be right here. And While we were waiting, I know we had some questions in the chat about will this conference be available afterwards for people who can't watch us the whole entirety while it's live streaming, just letting people know it absolutely will be available. Uh, you can go to our YouTube page after the conference and everything will be up there. And I believe eventually we will be separating out each lecture into individual presentations on there for people. Uh, let's see. 
We also had questions about the conference schedule. Uh, if you go to savingshipstudies.org forward slash virtual conference, you can absolutely pull up the schedule there and keep track of everything that we have going on this weekend over the next two days. And I thank everyone for their patience. I'm going to just put up a little slide while we're waiting for Anne to rejoin. Hi, everyone. Sorry about this um, little technical difficulties. I thought I'd just jump in and give you a preview of what's coming up this fall for SASA. Um, we're really pleased that we've been working on for a full year um, our mentorship program, uh, which is going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing in which we're seeking to pair up um, high school students and early undergraduates with ancient studies. Um, early career scholars and other professionals to help support paths into ancient studies, but um, particularly towards undergraduate degrees, but really to at the same time to help people understand the value of an ancient studies degree and what they can actually take away with from it, what they can use it for. Um, at SASO, we strongly believe in ancient studies as a passion and a scholarly passion, but we recognize that not everybody is cut out for becoming a long-term scholar and for, and not everybody will, who wants to um, achieve some type of uh, role within an academic institution will be able to. So the idea is that really anybody who has achieved a degree of competency in a specific field within ancient studies, should be supported and should be able to continue to do their scholarship, to continue the work they've done, worked on in their master's degree, in their PhD program, even in undergraduate programs, and use the skills that they've developed to start other areas of research. Now, for some high school students and undergrads, they really don't know where things will go. And having mentors as supports to help them navigate working their way into undergraduate programs that will be fruitful for them and set them on good career paths is extremely valuable. We really hope that this mentorship program, which is going to be starting in the fall, um, will open up new avenues for young students who are interested in the ancient world to be able to pursue their passions effectively and practically. Now let's see if we can get Anne back um, up and going. Yeah. And welcome back. Yeah, you did a, a great job filling in, I'm sure, thanks. You cannot share screen while other participant is sharing. Are you still sharing? Oh, no. let's make sure our sharings are off. It's How about giving me a message saying I can't screen share while other participant is sharing? I'm going to make you the co-host and maybe that'll help. 
Okay. Okay, you should have been made the co-host now. You might have to accept it. Thing is, I here, here it is. You got the green button for share, sharing your screen? No. And my presentation popped up for a moment, but disappeared. It's not. Well, why don't you just deliver the presentation without the PowerPoint? Uh, I need the, it's it's in the PowerPoint. It's it's a Google Slides. Can you put the link to it in our Zoom chat, and I can screen share it if I get it. Right. Sounds like a great idea. Perhaps that might work. Join from your browser. Okay. Here it is. Where my notes are. This is just unbelievable. The wonders of technology. <laughs> We've all been there. Oh, <clears throat> my uh, speaker notes have disappeared suddenly. They're gone. No, oh, no. They can't be gone. It's all no, on, on the cloud. They must be hidden somewhere there. And it's, ah, here they are. Okay, folks, sorry about that. I... The Rig Veda is a recondite body of material as is that of other th the other three subsequent Vedas and even the explanatory texts based on all of these. For me, the only safe approach, which includes nevertheless some speculative observation, is to take one small piece of this vast material and try to fit it into known geographical, historical, and intellectual context. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. The ancient milieu is perhaps not remarkable. Uh, in the ancient milieu, it's perhaps not remarkable that people in three different areas of the known world developed the same concept of the division of time into a 360 day year because it's a number that is divisible by several whole numbers. Egypt, Mesopotamia, and India all did so. Keeping track of the passage of time, solar, lunar, and stellar time had both political and religious importance. It was political because it was religious. It was religious because it was political. One hand washed the other. For the Vedic Indian people of about mid second millennium BCE onward, there is indication of a 360 day year expressed metaphorically as a wheel having three hubs, 12 rims and 360 spokes. Rig Veda 1, 164, 48. I propose to show how an early version of this was figured and how the scientific instrument for its implementation was created, inspired by Professor Jones' paper topic to follow on scientific instrumentation used by Ptolemy in the second century CE. There's some 1500 years difference between the Vedic instrument and that of Ptolemy, but the Vedic Yupa 
will be found to be surprisingly sophisticated nonetheless. The sacrificial pillar <clears throat> is so-called because it was used as a pole for tying up an animal to be sacrificed to the gods ritually. But operationally, it had another function that's apparent in its form. This instrument is a tree felled and stripped of its limbs. And while lying prostrate, having part of its midsection stripped of bark and carved in a particular way, <clears throat> while being also ritually addressed and treated with unctions of melted butter. But before carving or segmenting, <clears throat> the circumference would have had to be measured because the mid portion was to be given an octagonal form. How was this measuring done? It was done in the customary way, ancient way, with a rope or cord. This would have been done in consonance with the deity's presumed function of measuring out the world. <clears throat> the goddess Inanna in Mesopotamia was said to have a lapis lazuli measuring cord. Libetish Star B, 18 through 24. Since there would be eight segments, it was important to make them precise in the eight repetitions of the octagonal segments. Therefore, a cord would have to be placed around the circumference of the log and then dividing that length in half and placing that half at a starting point, starting and ending point, which would divide the log in half. To get further divisions into quarters, the shortened cord would itself be divided into half and using as its starting point one of the main, uh, one of the already established points, marking the quarter points. For convenience, and because it will be seen as relevant later, I'll refer to these four points as cardinal points. Now for the establishment of the intercardinal points, the last four of the eight facets of the pole that are to be created, they will be created in the same way by dividing the same cord into a yet smaller segment by having it and marking the center of the intercardinal points of, on the log. Each of the quarters consists of what we would call, for convenience of description, 90 degrees, while the half the divisions would be 45 degrees. I was going to show, let's see if that works. Uh, are you seeing a slide? No, nothing's showing yet. Okay, I'm not sure I can get my notes back now. <laughs> I have to unclick it. Click to add. Oh, folks, uh, shouldn't have tried that. These divisions have all been achieved geometrically by having as further divisions of each segment, which we know to be 45 degrees, degrees, was to be used as a calendaric device and was not amenable to expression in ge geometrical terms as fractions, uh, because fractions ultimately would arise and these were to be avoided in favor of whole numbers. And I'm using the term degrees, uh, perhaps we have no knowledge about whether they knew degrees or what they call them, these divisions, these 360 divisions of the uh, circle, which is supplied to the cosmos. Uh, and it's even more unlikely that, that they used an angular measurement of degrees. In any case, going on, um, <clears throat> It was important to establish where the first cut would be made, and it was made at the intercardinal facet with an axe, 
first by an angular cut upwards, then downwards at the point determined to be the limits of the midsection of the pole. Its width would be established by dividing the midsection, <clears throat> the number 90 by six, yielding 15 partite segments, or as we would call them degrees. Four of these would be carved first, the four inner cardinals, followed by the sawing of the double wide cardinal facets. Thus, a numerical approach was required involving 12 30 partite segments of the whole 360 partite circumference. I have a slide for that, making it easier to visualize. The cardinal, the intercardinal facet would consist of 30 parts only, while the cardinal facets or faces would receive two 15 part tight segments from one 90 degree quarter added to equal to, to an equal two 50, 15 part tight segments from a contiguous quarter, giving it 60 parts. So it, the intercardinals were 30, the cardinals were 60, all adding up to 360. While combining numbers below eight, such as three times five times three times eight, equals 360 in a base eight system may have been used to tally the number of days, <clears throat> perhaps in a prior system. <clears throat> and whether there was such a system in the earliest Vedic period is unknown, but uh, likely it would not have utilized a device such as the Yupa for tracking, tracking its accumulated numbers. The ritual use of the Yupa itself shows that it would have used a different system of numbers based on base nine. The Yupa itself, I am suggesting, utilize the three numbers, five, eight, and nine, so as to use the eight facets of the pole <clears throat> to facilitate the counting process required by a nine month year. Whatever would have actuated a shift to a nine month year, if it occurred, is unclear. So five, five days times eight times around the pole times nine months equals 360. <clears throat> Five times eight equals 40, as the length of a solar month is not unknown. Biblical references mention 40 days and 40 nights as a regular secular measure of time, Exodus 24, 18. <clears throat> the division of 45 one eighth of one eighth of 360, not being feasible by geometrical, further geometrical dividing because it yields a fraction, a strictly numerical means that would allow a breakdown of 45 into manageable manipulable parts based on a base nine system was required. Thus, the articulated pole would be a mnemonic device for preserving the count of the religiously important and also civilly important passage of time, as it meant that the Vedic people were not only committed to serving the gods, but were knowledgeable servants, as they repeatedly make clear in their hymns. Is there any Rig Vedic evidence for a nine month year? The Rig Veda does not hand us any information gratuitously. But there is mention of a previous group of sage families termed the Navaguas or nine goers. That is, those who go for nine, what, months? There are about a dozen mentions, mentions of them in the Rig Veda as primordial sages who instituted the fire sacrifice. And in a particularly per pertinent case, they're mentioned together with the goddess of dawn the significance of which will be noted later. Signif significant too, I think, is the mention of a similar group, Dashogas, those who go for 10 months, mentioned about eight times in the Rig Veda. These will figure momentarily in considering a 10 month year. <clears throat> the Rig Veda makes many mentions of the Yupa, which it calls Vanaspati, Lord of the Forest. And it describes its cutting, but it does not state that the yupa, the yupa is octagonal. This information is given in the later texts, such as the Taitariya Samhita 6333, 
but parts of the mid portion of the post, which are evidently stripped off in order to form the eight facets, are, in my view, referenced as swarus. <clears throat> the term is swaru, a term that Theodore Proferis in Journal of the American Oriental Society, one, two, three, uh, second, uh, second part, considers to refer to whole, multiple sacrificial posts themselves implanted into the earth. I will return to this concept momentarily. But back to the concept of a 10 month year development, how would the Yupa <clears throat> accommodate this accounting? A 10 month year. It would perhaps be by a four times nine times 10 factor, keeping to the same eight facets of the Yupa, but adding two additional markers that are not connected with a face, but are ideational, denoting probably the two celestial poles. Taitariya Sanita 6358 states that the Yupa is set up in order to discern the world of heaven. There is a post Rigvedic passage in the Shadvansha Brahona 444 that addresses this. The Shadvansha Brahona is a Samaveda text that addresses this, stating that the Yupa. Uh, the sacrificer, that with the Yupa, the sacrificer, quote, obtains the 10 quarters. Regarding the Yupa, still quoting, he makes two groups of five on either side, unquote. What? But we know that there are only four on either side, that is, the cardinal and the intercardinal points. What does the composer of the passage mean? He doesn't say, but the commentator on his passage adds above, below, and the eight quarters. This means four plus four plus two, a clever sly way of saying that the latter two designate the both celestial poles. The discernment of the South celestial pole may have been a stimulus for the shift to a 10 month year, or it may have been suggested by some possible contact with the ancient Near East, assuming a coeval development of the Mesopotamian 36 stars. In any case, it appears likely that we should back project one of these extra ideational points onto the nine month year usage of the Yupa. This combination of actual and ideational points brings up the subject of the relation of the terrestrial ritual object to the celestial. This applies in fact to the various ritual objects, such as the mortar and pestle used at sometimes to crush the intoxicating plant. Contrary to what we might immediately assume, the Yupa in the Rig Veda 128.3 and further in Taitariya Samhita 7.2.1.3 is not identified or compared with the pestle but rather with the mortar, which is wide, thus suggesting its celestial hypostasization. Furthermore, we get a glimpse of the interactive identifications of objects and symbols. That is a constant feature of the Rig Veda. In its celestial visualization, the Yupa's eight or numerically enhanced ideational 360 facets are equated to the respective segments of the ecliptic path, the constantly repeating path that the sun and moon travel in one complete revolution. Well, we know the sun doesn't revolve, but they thought so, around the earth. So these divisions of the celestial yupa would reasonably be coincident with stars or star groups. The celestial yupa is usually referenced by the term swaru, which the Taitariya Sanhita 6341 explicitly states is the equivalent of the Yupa in the following compound. Nishkrayanam apasyant swarum plus yupasya, referring to the, the Yupa. In this passage, it's a replacement. The term indicates replacement. I would emphasize replacement, placement, into the sky, into, into the cosmos. 
Thus, I would argue the Yupa is not only a terrestrial ritual in instrument and calendaric support, but it even may have been used to observe and correct for celestial, actual celestial periodicities in combination with observed celestial phenomena. I've not mentioned the fact that, of course, they knew that the year had more than 360 solar days, but chose to ignore the five and a quarter days, just as we do ignore the quarter day now and let the deficit run on until an even numbered intercalation days was possible, which will not, I'll not attempt to get into. Uh, also in the Rig Vedic period, the year clearly had uh, been developed to consist of 12 30 day months. Uh, for instance, the Rig Veda Brahmana, Aitareya Brahmana 341, which needs no further explication here. The terms Nimitaso and Kshami appear in the Rig Vedic 387, re referencing plural objects that have been cut off, Ruknaso, which Proferis reads as cut down, referring to multiple trees that have been cut down to make yupas and planted the root me in the earth kshum, seems to support his, his contention that there, uh, of there being multiple yupas. But I read the root ruk as cut off and referring to the eight swaros that were removed from the yupa to make it octagonal. As to the word kshami, a term for earth, but not the more usual one, <clears throat> purutabi, I take to mean a celestial entity, but discussion of this concept lies far outside the scope of this presentation. For the moment, just let it be said that Rig Veda 387 does not mention the Swarus specifically, only they who have been cut off, yea, Rukhnaso. So neither Proferis nor I have a strong position regarding that verse. <clears throat> It's disappeared again. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the rest of my. Okay, I think it's come back. Yes, but in other verses, such as Rig Veda 389 AB. The Swarus behave in a most celestial way, where they are compared to geese in patterned flight. In Rig Veda 463 CD, the term Swaru appears in the singular, but it is said to have risen up. The verb partially elided present as the prefix ud, as a quote, newborn, and this is Proferis word, newborn akra. Uh, that's his translation. The meaning of Akra, however, he does not give us, but refers to Meyerhofer in a footnote. Grassmann, in any case, gives us the meaning for the form of Akra accented on the final as Hirzeichen, banner. Also in Rig Veda 1, 143, 7 as Bitzeichnu, as Agni. Agni is the god of fire in all of its forms. In Rig Veda 4.51.2, the dawns are said to have stood up in the east like Swarus. Finally, I must acknowledge the yupas of stone. Therefore, they have survived of the last two millennia in India. <clears throat> this yupa had legs. It doesn't surprise that the yupa form was appropriated in the early Buddhist institutions in India for creating their astounding memorial constructions. Initially in North and Central India, then in the South, the tumulus form was given a circular stone railing, which bore sculptured posts of a modified octagonal form. Two slides were taken up by the three horizontal, two sides were taken up. Um, Yes, were taken up by the three horizontal joining pieces so that the visible faces had to be somewhat flattened. So it's not clear whether <clears throat> uh, in the Sanchi stupas, for instance, that I was going to show you, the, whether the pillars are uh, meant to be octagonal or whether they are actually 12-sided. 
but that's an issue for another time. Uh, but I must emphasize that in addition to Vedic descriptions, to some degree, this Buddhist version of the stupa, in addition to uh, some of its 20th century stone survivals, <clears throat> is primarily responsible for our ability to visualize, visualize the Yupa's form. And I, in fact, have been working methodologically backwards and more hazardously attributing speculative function to it. But if it was only a pole for tying up sacrificed animals? <clears throat> I'm so sorry that. to uh, interrupt, Dan. I just want to let you know we have another presentation. It's supposed to start now, so I can give you a few minutes to wrap up. Um, I'm wrapping up in about two minutes or less. Okay. All right. okay. I just wanted to make sure. So, we, yep. Thank Great. you. Thank you. But so if it was only a poll for sacrificing animals, why was it given eight sides? If we still deny further significance to it, because mention of eight sides doesn't occur in the earliest text, it leaves unaddressed nonetheless the question of why were the Swarus called gods, which does receive mention in the Rig Veda, in the aforementioned 389, where the Swarus are compared to geese in flight. Their geese and their gods. I personally take the view that both the terrestrial yupa and its parts, the trimmed off swarus, and a celestial yupa with swarus representing stars or segments of the sky, are referenced simultaneously. And the ritual of dripping melted butter representing fire or light on the post and raising it up invokes the aspect of the pole being projected onto the sky. Clearly, this is a subject that requires much more and much broader study. And I'm advocating for a broadening of perspective within our given texts to permit access to the multi-layered, three-dimensional, pervasively allusive character of the Vedic system of thought. And that concludes my weird presentation. Thank you. And I apologize both to Anne and people watching for the technical issues uh, with the presentation. Uh, Anne, if you can get that to us, we'll do our best to get that out to people so they can see and perhaps maybe rewatch the presentation with that alongside it if they're interested. Good idea. Many thanks and my apologies as well. Um, no, no worries at all. It happens to the best of us. And now I'm going to turn everything over to uh, my partner, Julie, here uh, for the next por portion of our conference. Hi there and welcome. Um, we are about to start our first special session. Um, <clears throat> If you would all please just give me a moment to put up the slideshow. Now, I wanted to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors. Um, we do have a very gracious community here at SASA. Um, and the work that we do would not be possible without all of these sponsors and without viewers, donors, and participants like you. Um, so please, uh, let's give a special thanks to uh, Humanities for the Public Goods, New Jersey Council for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, the Society for Biblical Literature, World History Encyclopedia, the Gladys Kriebel Foundation, uh, University of North Carolina, the Society for Classical Studies and Safe Space Alliance. Um, if you are interested in donating to SASA, please feel free. We are accepting donations. And if you donate $25 or more during this conference, we do have a raffle going. You will get a free ticket with donations of $25 or more to enter our raffle for a goodie bag of SASA merchandise. Thank you so much, and we're very happy to have you. 
So without further ado, let's get into our special session, the Publishing and Public Outreach Workshop. So um, <clears throat> this session is the goal is to generate discussion on creative ways of using digi digital uh, assets for self-publishing, public outreach, and engagement to bring more awareness to the various ways that scholars and people interested in ancient studies can promote their knowledge and passion to others. We have uh, panelists from several different platforms, including YouTube, podcasting, Archeo Gaming live streaming, and more, um, and they're going to discuss their work, the pros and cons of self-publishing, and we'll open it up to discussion after that. Our panelists today are Brianna Jackson of Perhe Studio. Uh, Brianna Jackson holds a PhD in Egyptian art and archeology span from New York University. She's currently a postdoctoral fellow at the American Research Center in Egypt, working on her first book, Atenism from Sinai to Sudan, and is also on the Theban Mapping Project website, team where she is helping to build online databases on monuments on the west bank of Luxor. She also runs a YouTube channel, which is absolutely fabulous, with videos about ancient Egypt and archaeo gaming. Um, our next panelist is Adam Bierstedt, uh, known as Ludo History on YouTube. Uh, Adam, he, him, uh, received his MA in Viking and Medieval Norse Studies and an MLA is in cultural heritage he's the creator of the historical communication and media criticism project ludo history the project which began in 2019 uses live stream edited video and text posts to connect expert perspectives and collaborations and historical media particularly in video games and we have jenny and jen from ancient history fangirl podcast jenny williamson is a writer novelist and co-creator of the ancient History Fangirl podcast, which explores true stories and tall tales from the ancient world. She has always been obsessed with ancient history and mythology and blends her love of both with her passion for writing and storytelling, making the stories she tells accessible for modern readers. She lives in Brooklyn and is co-author of the book Women of Myth, published with Adams Media. Jen Mc McMenemy, uh, has used her nerdy knowledge of mythology and ancient history to co-create the Ancient History Fangirl podcast. She is a full-time freelance marketer, writer, researcher, and copywriter. She spends her time, her free time traveling, visiting historical sites, and researching her next writing projects. Women of Myth is her first book. And then we have Derek Latall of the Hellenistic Age podcast. Derek is the co-creator and host of the Hellenistic Age podcast, a history show dedicated to the period from Alexander the Great to Cleopatra VII. Starting in 2018 while in university, he has uh, produced over 100 episodes, still has another 170 years of history to go before completion. Outside of work and the podcast, he spends his time reading, hiking, and planning his next ancient destination to travel to. And last but not least, we have Megan Lewis of Digital Hammurabi, which is a multimedia, uh, wonderful set of um, ancient cuneiform-based publications, YouTube, blog, Twitter, website, and book. Um, Megan Lewis has a bachelor's from Birmingham University in the UK in ancient history and a master's in philosophy in the same in seriology and an MA in Near Eastern Studies from the Johns Hopkins University. She attained ABD status in the PhD programs at Johns Hopkins before deciding that she couldn't be both a good parent and a good student. She serves on the board of directors for the nonprofit Humans Against Poor Scholarship and takes care of the day-to-day -day running of the Digital Hammurabi YouTube channel. Through the Digital Hammurabi Press, she and her husband, Joshua Bowen, have self-published several books in the ancient world. She also hosts two podcasts, The Reading Party Podcast, a media review source that, uh, that focuses on the historically inspired books, films, TV, and video games, and Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, a podcast dedicated to sharing little-known facts about the New Testament and the rise of Christianity. And so without further ado, I would love for our presenters to make themselves known. Please turn on your videos. So to start us off, um, why don't we run through on the subject of 
how you turned to non-traditional publishing. Does anybody want to start with that? Uh, uh, oh, sorry, Jenny, you go for it. No, please go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say for us, it was um, really the only avenue open to us. We couldn't pursue traditional academic careers for a variety of reasons, children being the primary one. Um, we can't really move our family across the world for postdocs and tenure track things and that kind of stuff. And we knew we really wanted to focus on open access and affordable options for people who were interested in the ancient world, but didn't want to rely on like ancient aliens for their information. And for us, YouTube was a great way to kind of have a, an outlet, an academic outlet that didn't require uh, relocating and self-publishing specifically we use uh, Amazon because it's for us the easiest option and, and also has the greatest uh, return in terms of royalties was both financially more prudent than going through an academic press. Uh, academic publishing doesn't generally pay an awful lot and if you don't have a tenure track um, salary behind you it, it makes writing not really very sustainable um, as a career path. And we also wanted, or I wanted at least, to maintain creative control over what we were doing. Um, Josh and I, we had a couple of offers for um, a Sumerian grammar book that we co-wrote for academic presses. And we were concerned that if we went that route, it would be very difficult to maintain the entry level, non-specialist, like don't really have a full grasp even of, of how English grammar works, which was where I was when I started grad school. I knew how to speak. I knew how to write. I didn't know what a participle was. Um, and that was kind of the audience we wanted to address. And we were worried that if we went through an academic press, we wouldn't be able to really fill that need. Um, and doing it ourselves and, and me editing everything meant that we could just really focus on the area that we felt was was most important for us. Jenny, I believe you were next. Um, yeah, so I produce uh, Ancient History Fangirl with my partner, Jen. <laughs> Jen, you want to maybe join me on this one? <laughs> She's yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, we're kind of a double act. <laughs> yeah, we are. Um, what I guess like we decided to, uh, we publish a podcast. Um, we're currently on um megaphone uh i guess like we're on airwave like in terms of just our platform we started out on soundcloud i think because you know um similarly we also don't have phds or even master's degrees in our topic and um it was it was just a thing that we could do i mean it, it rose from conversations that we were already having you know like yeah and we we chose the the platform of podcasting um because neither of us are particularly thrilled to be on camera. We're mm -hmm. really telling stories. We don't have real designs and backgrounds in graphic designs or videography. So we just were, were very conscious of what we were good at, which was being able to tell a story. Uh, podcasting when we launched back in 2018 was sort of just starting to crest that wave. And um, much like our co-, our co um, panelists said we were here about accessibility we mm -hmm. don't have degrees in history I have ADHD and dyslexia and you know I wanted to make a podcast that anyone including me could come into and engage with and be excited about and not feel like they needed to know all this background and you know that's really where we came from but we're super nerdy so sometimes we don't actually manage that <laughs> <laughs> I'd say most of the time we don't manage that yeah we try though <laughs> I, I guess I can hop in on that one because I have um, a lot of the same experience, uh, though I do work primarily on camera instead of uh, via podcast. But on the nerding out and not kind of finishing thoughts um, and getting distracted on the way, uh, that's what I do most of the time. Uh, so, you know, Julie, when you say calling it self-publishing, that to me, it feels almost like a misnomer because what I do is so improvisational um, and so much. I hit a button and then I'm going to talk and words are going to come out of my mouth. And what those words are, are a mystery even to me. Uh, so, but 
Uh, what I do primarily is live streams on Twitch. Uh, I see a couple of my people, uh, a couple of uh, my emotes lurking in various chats there, which is lovely to see. Um, but it's trying to do mostly historical criticism uh, and reception studies, kind of live and in person. Um, so instead of focusing on, you know, oh, here's a source that I've read a bunch of times, I'm very familiar with, I'm retelling this, or I'm analyzing it, or I'm producing knowledge. Uh, the way I've kind of drifted towards it is thinking about demonstrating the skill set live, uh, right? I see something, I see a claim made, and then live and in person, like, let's do some research on that. Let's take this very collaborative co-learning approach to doing historical criticism and with interaction from chat uh, and from all the very thoughtful people in my community, right? Let's work together to figure out where this is coming from, figure out what the real history behind this is and figure out what any media is doing. Uh, I've done a little bit of the more traditional, you know, I've prepared super rigorously for like 20 hours in advance of going live or in advance of writing a Twitter thread or a blog post. But I found a lot more success in that very improvisational style. And it's a place where it feels like there's relatively a gap in the online creation, certainly compared to things are recorded in advance or written and edited. And just that sort of improvisational uh, and very like aggressively collaborative approach uh, is something I found a lot of success in. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go next. Uh, for me, a lot of the appeal in podcasting was, I mean, I've always wanted to be, I wanted to write a book like this, one of my bucket list items, but specifically, I, I'll kind of address this maybe a little bit later, but I know very little about the Hellenistic period. So this was a way for me to learn. But if you try to say, you know, okay, I'm going to tackle the entire period of 300 years, whatever it might be. Podcasting gives me the chance to make it a more um, digestible process in terms of, okay, I progressed so far. I can actually see, a, I can publish something right there and then. And it's a nice, uh, it's always, you're seeing some sort of progress and you're feeling an accomplishment because if you try to, you know, it's you're breaking up a huge project into little bits. It does make it a lot easier to complete. And part of the appeal of podcasting in particular is that I like being i like that lecture format i like being you know listening to people's story like explain things in a reasonably digestible format in about 30 40 minutes whatever it might be uh and it's always a good it's a good way to kind of cap myself and what i'm thinking a discussion wants to be um and whereas you know publishing a book it's a, a very intensive process whereas uh you know if i'm producing you know 30 minutes in a show i mean i can reasonably do that in a couple of weeks time or if not less but that's kind of one of the main appeals i mean i big fan of history podcasting for years and years and history podcasts as well and uh, i do have my models i follow or i'm directly inspired by as you know examples of success but i like to adapt that to my own little take and see where i can take it and try to adapt and change it as based on my needs but it's something that i found myself very much adapting well to in my case Hey, maybe it's my turn now. Um, just to apologize in advance if crazy things are happening with my technology. I already had a power outage two hours ago, so I hope we don't have another one. Um, so to end, I, my, uh, my outreach program that I do on my YouTube channel actually started as a result of anxiety during my dissertation process. Um, I was writing my dissertation during the COVID quarantine, and uh, yeah, I was just I was packed with anxiety of writing that, of um, of um, what's going to happen to me after I graduate. Um, <laughs> so I had this idea of you know just channeling that that energy into um, something creative. And I thought, hey, how cool would it be if I started a YouTube channel where I play video games set in ancient Egypt and talk about how accurate they are or not accurate they are. Um, then I also had an idea to have something more Egyptological. So I created videos of, um, or I started to create videos 
One is a series called Ancient Egyptian Object Stories, which is a, a collection of short videos about a specific object or group of objects. And then I wanted to create a, a TV show um, that it could actually, you know, be something more of a, a, a proper documentary than what you normally see on TV. So that's that's um, that's how everything got started for me. So yeah, it was more of a, an outlet um, that created that that moved into something bigger, um, and I think more exciting because I started to really engage with the idea that I could be using this as a platform to to teach. So it sounds like we have a really good mix here of scholars who came to independent, um, perhaps a better word is uh, knowledge sharing than publication in this case, uh, and people who were just interested in the subject and found through a public interest project a way into scholarship. And I think that's really important um, for for some context. Um, I myself, uh, much like Megan, got to ABD and then found it just uh, unsustainable for myself and turned to YouTube, where I have a channel um, that's called Zilla's Athenaeum. And so I also have this experience of coming from the the academic background and coming into a space that is more directed at the public a little bit less of the traditional peer-reviewed publishing and a little bit more of public communication so i'm interested um perhaps we'll we'll start with the folks who are on the academic side of that and coming into public communication and then move towards the folks who are coming into it from public education into a more scholarly space. I'm interested to hear what, what y'all have to say about, um, about that, like choosing your targets, about choosing the, the platform that you did. I mean, Jen and Jenny already spoke about this a little bit um and and building an audience there that is perhaps not what you started out with if you were in, in academia yeah i i can get started on that uh i actually got my start uh by appearing on other people's uh streams so my first like public facing thing would have been in 2018 shortly after god of war 4 came out uh so uh, my friends who run the youtube channel overly sarcastic productions invited me on as someone who knows a little bit more uh about norse mythology specifically um to be a co-commenter for that and then about a year and a half later right after i finished my ma and had a lot of anxiety brianna i totally sympathize with you on that front um uh, I was looking at like trying to start that up as my own project, trying to do more of that. And so a lot of what I wound up doing is shaped by the platform that I chose, uh, which was primarily a financial decision, actually. Um, looking at, you know, edited videos and more kind of what YouTube in 2019 was really known for versus live streams on Twitch primarily. Twitch lets you earn money a lot faster, right? Like with Amazon Publishing, uh, the return on investment has a much lower threshold. And I think financially it ends up being a lot more sustainable for small creators. Um, and so, you know, I was doing research into what is known on Twitch, right? What, what styles of content work well? Uh, what is it mostly like people just talking about stuff, doing blog posts, reading articles, um, doing like editing stuff. And there's a little bit of everything, but for the most part, Twitch is a video game streaming platform. And so I wound up, you know, let's start there. And then I've slowly built up into trying to do other stuff, experimenting with other platforms and kind of the limitations of each of those has been really impactful in shaping kind of what the content I'm doing ends up looking like and 
since Twitch encourages you to be live all day, every day, um, in turn, the improvisational sort of co-learning and lack of the embracing the lack of preparedness um, is itself a consequence, I think, of that platform. We had a, a similar experience actually getting started with YouTube. Josh was invited onto a pre-existing channel to talk about uh, Mesopotamian flood myths in comparison with what you find in Genesis. And I was sitting in the live stream, like the chat, and just kind of talking with the audience members. And a couple of people asked, does this guy have his own YouTube channel? Um, and I said, uh, not yet. And I think by the end of the stream, I'd created both a channel and a list of video ideas. Um, <laughs> so we were very much reliant on kind of the, the enthusiasm of the community that we kind of found ourselves in, which is um, an online, generally atheist community looking at the Old Testament as historical literature rather than um, a religious text. And they have been amazing in helping us find an audience who are interested in not just the um, like the atheist religious side of things, but also the broader historical context and Mesopotamia in general. And I think that um, early collaborations we did with various different YouTube channels and um, like interviews that we've done subsequently have really, really helped definitely in the beginning to kind of kick off the channel's growth and then to sustain it um, for as long as it's been going. And we started similarly to Adam in 2018 and COVID kind of put a bit of a dampener on things because suddenly I had at that point, three children at home, um, which is not super great for producing video content. Um, and we're kind of getting back into that now, but just, I've, I've honestly been genuinely surprised by the level of interest we've had because for, for Mesopotamia, at least, and I suspect for other niche or niche, more niche fields of history, there's this internal narrative of no one's really interested in this. It's too niche. It's too specialist. It's not like, it's not, um, it's not Hercules. Like, no one's going to make a Disney movie about the stuff that I present, but that's entirely incorrect and it's been really gratifying to see how many people like actually really are interested in the minutia that we all study and kind of come into contact with as either academics or just really enthusiastic history nerds and the level of support is just it, it's really really nice and again very surprising um so I don't know if I'll be answering the the question that you asked, but um, I just I just remember something. Uh, the first public announcement that I gave about my YouTube channel was actually for the HAP scholarship interview. <laughs> Megan, do you remember this? Um, so I do remember. I, it's amazing. I actually <laughs> I actually interviewed for the the and and actually um, received the HAP scholarship back in 2020, and that was when I. Um, announced for the first time that I started a YouTube channel. Um, and so for me, my my first, um, the first thing I did was the video games one, um, because I like to watch Let's Plays on YouTube. So I watch other years, just, you know, game, um, especially if I did something like that and targeted um, my channel toward other gamers, uh, not you know like historians or or, um, or whatever, but you know just casual gamers or hardcore gamers who might be playing these ancient games. And I thought, why don't I have that as my target audience, and then have the the whole um, identity be Egyptologist plays this video game. And that's actually um, been a successful. Well, I, mean, I don't want to say that I'm wildly successful on YouTube, but um, it, I have received feedback that a lot of people actually came upon my YouTube channel because they were curious about what archaeologists were saying about the, the games that they liked playing. Um, so that's that's why I chose YouTube. I do have a Twitch channel, but I, I don't live stream, especially now that I'm in Egypt. I don't live stream because that would be impossible with this internet. Um, but that's basically why I chose the YouTube platform. Mm, um, you 
Yeah. <laughs> so I think we chose to podcast because um, being lay people, uh, not academics to start, we bored our family and our friends and random people at the bar with the minutia and detail of stuff that we were talking about. Like nobody is that interested in Julius Caesar's coming and going. I'm, t- I'm just telling you that right now. But you'd be surprised though with, with our podcast audience, how many people are interested in that. <laughs> and that's a good, our dynamic. Like I always think we're too like niche and, and, focused on the minutia of who was living in the green Sahara and Jenny's like actually um (laughs) that's our dynamic this is why this is universal (laughs) exactly and you know I think part of it was we you know being out of school um both of us did degrees in writing so we really had a strong basis in how to craft narratives how to put things together um we didn't have that same community so when we went on to podcasting we knew we wanted to do long form narrative history storytelling um we're very scripted although we are also conversational you wouldn't believe it sometimes listening to us you would think that we're not scripted but we are um and as a result like We were just having so much fun texting each other at 2 a.m. about like, can't remember the last thing, something, something. Dionysus. Dionysus. Five minutes before this, I was like, Jen, the plague of Justinian. And she texted back, hot. Hot. (laughs) I mean, literally, I might have objectified numerous volcano gods across different pantheons because hot. Um, (laughs) So, you know. We're nerdy. um, We have fun and we think our audience is there for that, too. Um, And podcasting, as I said, seemed natural to us because we are long form storytellers. We're both writers. And, um, you know, as soon as we started going into the weeds of different things, we realized like we couldn't be brief for anything. Like our first few seasons, most of our episodes were like four parters each, like an hour and 15 minutes each. It was it was intense. We've gotten better. We're, we're figuring it out. And I think that um, there was an aspect of your question about um, figuring like coming from a non academic place into an academic space and what that experience was like for us. And I think at least for me, that was never my intention. Like I never saw myself as coming into an academic space or being an academic or trying to be a historian like I always thought. I describe myself as a rando who watches a lot of documentaries, you know, like that's what I do. And um, I think that we've both been surprised at the number of people who tweet at us or, you know, comment on our content who say that they are PhDs or archaeologists or, you know, real experts in this topic who like the podcast, because I think I would have been really intimidated if I had known that that would be a large part of our audience when we started. Um, It has been really fun. I mean, the community has been very welcoming to us, which is exciting because we don't have degrees in in these topics and we never, you know, try to present ourselves like we are experts. We're like people who are enthusiasts who just love this stuff. Um, And I also think um, there was another point I wanted to make and I forget what it is. (laughs) Well, piggybacking on that, I also think one of the things that we've been so welcomed into the community, both on the academic side and just people who enjoy history enthusiasts. And yeah. I think it was last season or the season before we did um, a season on ancient mysteries. And um, I felt really strongly that there's so many documentaries being made at the moment, a la ancient aliens and things that are not real discoveries, that there is a need for, you know, if you're going to have a popular history podcast, you actually tell the history because it's always more interesting than in there were aliens um and a lot of times uh, i'm not gonna bash a certain netflix series but you all know which one i'm talking about um that's being put out there that content is being told that that's real and the reality is it's not but this this history of those sites is so much more fascinating and yeah. being able to talk about that and tell our audience like this is what you should be looking at and not that has meant a lot in the sort of rise of that misinformation i want to just quickly circle back to something Jenny said, which was the the response you guys got from an academic community. And I have to say, as an academic going the other direction, I've been similarly surprised by the level of enthusiasm I've had from academic um, people, like people in the academic career path. And it was, I think, even more unexpected than um, our response from non-academics, because this kind of work is it, it's changing slowly, but it's almost universally discredited in terms of um, tenure track, um, like the packages you have to put together to get a tenure track job. It's not relevant. It's not academic enough. It's not peer reviewed enough. Mm-hmm. And I, like I've heard stories of people being told by um, 
career like people higher up in like mentors that's the word being told by mentors you have to stop this podcast because it will count against you in your tenure tenure review because that's time you could be using to work on academic publications on journal articles on uh, service to your university community and that kind of prepared me for not being a, an academic outcast but for being like looked down on really um and especially among younger scholars older scholars also but very especially among younger scholars there's been this real support and enthusiasm for the kind of open access public outreach work and I think a lot of it is to do with Jen what you were saying there being finally something to combat this misinformation that is being continually spewed out by various uh, networks and producers and, and presenters. And it's stuff that I think a lot of academic, tenured academics, not necessarily discount, but don't see as prevalent as it is. And I remember one of my professors telling me, oh, no one believes this ancient aliens stuff. Absolutely no one. It's just, it's just fiction. Everyone knows it's fiction. And he was genuinely shocked when I told him, no, I have had arguments with people actual honest to God arguments. Yeah. With people who believe it and who think that I, as a student of Assyriology, am actively hiding the truth from them. I'm like, oh dear, no. Um, I will absolutely teach you Sumerian so you can read it yourself. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's, it's really, it's been really, really nice to see, um, that level of, of support from kind of both sides of the community. Yeah, I, I want to chime in and like second and third that, uh, right, I've been incredibly fortunate that like there are people who are now postdocs who like regularly come in and hang out, like either join me on stream and get to talk about their stuff or are uh, just watching and enjoying it. And so seeing both, you know, undergraduate students, graduates, postgraduates, um, and then lay people who are interested in history. Overall, like from all angles, there's been incredible warmth and incredible enthusiasm uh, for these sorts of projects. And it's just incredibly hardening to see uh, that even though, you know, like orders of magnitude different from like an ultra polished Netflix documentary, regardless of factual accuracy, um, regardless, it's, you know, a very impactful and real and hardening starting point. And see, seeing that response and seeing that enthusiasm is kind of like the thing that gets us go, like keeps me going. And I think, I think it's fair to speak for all of us. I think when we say that that's been something that genuinely like keeps us going, keeps us trying to make this stuff and trying to like iterate on it. Well, I, I just want to step in and say that I think this is one of the ways that we assess us, see things that academia going forward in ancient studies and all the fields that are involved in it really need to add a third component of teaching and scholarship and outreach because we have to stop pretending that you know we're an entity by ourselves we right that scholarship can just exist by itself in this nice little space and it's it's not tenable in the long term and there's so many ways of connecting to the broader public. And there's clearly so much interest. So it's time for academics to be not just open to people doing public scholarship, but embrace it as part of what we do. That was Our yeah, director, absolutely. David Danzig, everybody. <laughs> I don't think we've introduced you. Um, so at this point, uh, I would just like to uh, reflect on what we've got so far, which has been absolutely wonderful. All of you have been great. Um, and I'm really excited to, to hear what kind of reception you're getting from the academic community. I'm not at all surprised that everybody's interested in this. Um, so as, as we build this, um, to use a grad school world, liminal space, so we build it out to be its own space that connects academia and the public. Like David was saying, this is kind of our, our mission. So I would like at this point to open up two questions um, from, uh, first of all, our folks in the session. 
So if any of you do have questions, please put them in chat. And if anything comes up in the public stream chat, I will also uh, chime that in. Our first question comes from Heather Rosemarin, if you'd like to go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, this is just such an exciting discussion, and I am so impressed and grateful for all of your creativity and ingenuity. It's really exciting. So I am involved with SAS's Independent Scholars Working Group, and I have some questions for you. I'm just going to throw them out there. If any of them are interesting, just address whatever you think is relevant. Um, so thinking about textual publication, because I know a lot of you are doing um, all this exciting new media, but I'm still in the mode of writing. Um, and the pre-publication phase, um, how are you uh, working with editors, if at all? Um, are you circulating your, your drafts to colleagues? Um, are you paying for professional editing services? I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on the editing process um, and also on workshopping. Are there any good fora you've found for workshopping some of your ideas and early um, drafts? So that's some questions related to the pre-publication phase. For the post-publication phase, um, thinking like a historian, I am very concerned about the ephemerality of digital media. So, I mean, they're, you know, I'm of the age where, you know, I still remember floppy disks from the 90s. I would have to go to a museum right now to get something like that read. So, you know, aside from carving things in stone, like the ancients did, um, what are some thoughts you have about archiving your work? Um, I have found some resources that I think are really great, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, are you trying to get things into university archives? Are you trying to get your work into libraries? Um, do you care? Maybe it's not important um, to all of you. I don't know. It's important to me because I kind of want my work to be, to have a life beyond, you know, maybe the next five years. Um, and then finally, just a comment on the um, conversation you were just having about academia and how academics are essentially penalized for um, engaging in public outreach. And um, I just wanted to share a model from my profession, which is law, um, that many large law firms, which have a tenure-like partner process, right, which prioritize things like billable hours and client work and bringing in new clients and so forth, like there are some established criteria in most firms. They actually have kind of a budget for pro bono work. And so if any of us are ever in an opportunity, have an opportunity to influence the conversation within academia, I would be proposing, you know, a 100 hour a year budget for um, junior academics to do public outreach. They could be consulting to your podcast. They could be doing all kinds of things like that, but it would be, it would have a reasonable limit. So it wouldn't like take over their lives, but it would demonstrate that they were engaged in public outreach, which is, as we know, is really essential to the survival and growth of the field. Thank you. So I have things to say about all of that. So I'm just going to like <laughs> rush ahead. And if people need to interrupt me, please feel free. Uh, first up, editing process with pre-publications. I do the majority of our editing ourselves, uh, myself. Um, I have some very small experience um, with editing in public, uh, like publishing. Um, and it is something I am increasingly interested in outsourcing because uh, I frankly, I just can't keep up with my husband. He writes too much. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't like it doesn't leave me enough time for my own my own writing projects either. Um, we also have very uh, excited and willing volunteers who offer to read through manuscripts as they get done, which is really helpful for like the very um, boring copy editing process, but also to kind of get a handle on, is this book interesting to someone except me? Like, is there a wider audience for it? Um, so yeah, that's, that's question one. With regards to archiving, it's not something I have thought about an awful lot for our digital work. Most of what 
we do is well the publication side of things everything is available in in paperback or hardback and i get those um i send them to the the library of congress and they have library of congress control numbers and and do it all that way it has crossed my mind before that a lot of our output we have nearly i think over now 600 videos on youtube they're not archived anywhere i don't have that level of digital storage in my house to to support all of that stuff so if the internet just disappears tomorrow, I guess, oh, well, <laughs> there goes five years of my life. Um, and it's it's one of those things on the list that I should consider at some point, but I don't, honestly, I don't quite know where to start. Um, and I don't currently have the, the time or the mental bandwidth to seriously consider it. But I think for people starting up new projects, before you get five years in, if I had to give some advice, definitely give thought to how you're going to store all this stuff. Um, because obviously you can, you can store it on YouTube. You can pay for podcasting storage services, but you're very reliant, especially with YouTube on the, the goodwill of, of the people who run YouTube. And if it's not profitable anymore and they feel like closing it, they, they could conceivably do that. Um, and my final, uh, answer to your, your thoughts on, um, funding public outreach. I would love to see some kind of um, stipend fund available at universities for humanities students to do and uh, like early career scholars to do public outreach. Given the situation of funding the humanities in general, I don't honestly see that happening anytime soon. And that's one of the reasons to put on, take off my digital Hammurabi hat and put on my my HAPS, which is Humans Against Poor Scholarship hat. That's one of the reasons we started the nonprofit was to try and give grad students a forum for starting to develop that skill of talking to non-academics about their work, give them a platform to start that kind of public outreach and also give them funding. One of the one of the scholarship programs we run gives grad students that actually Brianna received gives them two thousand dollars to complete summer funding on the like it's a requirement that you you do a, an online interview live online interview as part of the application process to kind of give people access to your work and to start talking to non-specialists but then after your summer you have to come back and kind of do a debrief and go through that experience again in a, a bit of a longer form so it's we're trying to foster those skills and and come up with some form of payment for it, but it's not something that unfortunately I see universities jumping on in the near future. I feel like I can speak to um, maybe two out of three of of the questions that you asked. Um, I we have a, a um, editing process, and um, it, mainly we work together. Um, the two of us, if one of us writes one thing um like we'll take the one of us will take the lead on a research project and um the other one will be the editor-in-chief of that and then um and then uh we will record the um the podcast episode and then after that we will um like i will edit it down and usually we'll have like two hours of uncut sound and i'll edit it down to one and it you know with an eye towards pacing it's kind of like if i was editing a writing project um and, and um I was Go going ahead. to say the reason one of us will take the lead in the research and the other one kind of goes in cold is so that again we want this to be accessible so sometimes I know for me uh maybe not as much for Jenny I get so in the weeds with things that sometimes I lose the actual narrative thread um and when Jenny looks at a, at a script I've written and she's just like okay but what is the story or if I didn't know these six other things I couldn't follow it um that tells me that an average listener can't follow what the research I haven't got the, the most interesting thread that's going to carry someone through the whole episode Go yeah ahead, so we kind of we kind of like you know, kind of play different roles for each other and and edit each other's work during the editing process. And then um, after somebody, after I've cut down, you know, the sound and created like a, a, a sound file, I'll send it to Jen and she'll do an extra quality check and then we'll put it out. Um, so we have kind of a really exhaustive and time consuming editing process, I would say, like mm -hmm. we could do it faster, but then we think that the quality wouldn't be as good. So we're kind of, you know, we like doing it this way. Um, I would say that like for in terms of just storage and longevity of work, um, 
I used to keep all of our sound files on an external hard drive, and then that died at one point at the same time that my computer died. Um, so it was a problem. <laughs> and luckily, um, I didn't know this, but it turned out that the podcast platform that we were using also saved an MP3 file that you could download. So I could go on there and find files that I was missing. And that was very lucky. Um, now I, I just have it all on my computer. I've backed up my computer, but I haven't done that in a while. You know, it's all a bit hinky. Um, <laughs> We are scripted. So there is a script yeah. for every single episode. And, you know, we don't publish our scripts because it is our IP. And maybe one day we might want to do something with them. You know, they're really nice long form, you know, writing exercises um, and storytelling. So, you know, that's ours and we've never published it for that reason. So we've thought about that potentially in the future, um, maybe putting it out there in some format so people can have it in, a, in another way. Yeah, um, but we have we have various backups, but I think getting our podcast into an academic library has absolutely never been a thing that was on the table for either. We're not academics like no one's going to do that. Like, I, I remember I someone funny. telling us that our podcast was on their syllabus and I was like, why? <laughs> really? <laughs> have they listened to what I said about Brutus's wife? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and anyway. then. As far as like academic outreach, oh my goodness, there are so many small, um, you know, independent creators like us who could do with just a little bit of an academic time to, you know, uh, help us through the weeds of some stuff, give us access to papers we can't access because we don't have the credentials, you That's know. That's like a huge thing, yeah. Like just academic research isn't accessible to us in a lot of ways because we don't have credentials. Like I can generally find the stuff that I need, but they like I, I think it's a really important point to make that academics in general don't seem to make their research accessible to a lay audience just in general unless you are someone who is like a Carl Sagan type person who is you know dedicating your career to um writing for a lay audience um and and you know as as people have said that doesn't seem to be rewarded um and I didn't realize that, but it actually kind of makes a lot of sense now that I'm hearing it. Yeah. And to double in on that, uh, right, even though I have two graduate degrees, I don't currently have a university affiliation. That means I also don't have access to um, a lot of paywall material. And unfortunately, um, currently open access fees for all of the big humanities journals are multiple thousands of dollars frequently. So unless if universities are providing funding for open access publishing, like no no one on the humanities salary can afford to just shell out those costs absolutely i would also say one of the things that um is 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 stressful um too about why we don't publish a lot of our stuff or leave things up in google drive or our google scholar is because Google and other AI programs do pull from those open common things. And that, that is our IP. And there's a strike on right now as a result of the fact that that is happening. It's a, it's a concern for all of us because they don't just pull writing. I mean, they pull like voice, you know, like yeah. our stuff that's up now in our podcast. Theoretically, that's being scraped. I don't know. Um, we can go up and have them write an entire episode of our podcast. It wouldn't be a good episode. Probably not. We all have deadlines. Yeah. No, we would not do that. But I'm just <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know there's a ton more to say on this, but I do want to give other folks a chance to ask some questions. I know Patrick Clancy, you had said you had a question. Yes, can you hear me? Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you uh, so much to the panelists. This has been um, phenomenal to hear everyone. Um, also, want to say just an awesome job with um, introducing the ancient world to a, a wider audience. I know myself first getting into it, I was parked in front of the History Channel back before Ancient Aliens and would watch documentaries and, and different things on like Thucydides, the Peloponnesian War. I um, was just so interested in it. And even uh, Zack Snyder's 300, um, you know, it's 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 a lot where a lot of people get the introduction is is maybe from uh, less scholarly things. Um, so I wanted to kind of know a little bit more, and you've you've did a little bit of uh, 
answering this with the the previous question of like combating against um, poor scholarship um, and and misinformation while you're making these things accessible. Um, how how you all have been finding that and and processing with that because I know there are some people who will just spout nonsense and then you know when you have good <laughs> good products and you go no you want to listen to you know these things because they're more accurate. Um, speaking to me, I mean, I'm not involved with Mesopotamian or Egyptian history, which is unfortunately the biggest casualties along with uh, South American studies, Mesoamerican studies. But one thing I did notice is, you know, some of my favorite responses from people are when I talk about a subject that maybe isn't as um, well, talked about, let's say, uh, maybe, a, maybe a certain region in the world that is not as familiar to maybe a Eurocentric audience or anyone focusing on the ancient Mediterranean. Um, a lot of times I get a really positive response where they say, you know, thank you, I didn't know where to start. Uh, like many of the areas I cover, many of the subjects I cover are the most famous, their most famous works or stuff they, they openly cite on Wikipedia are, are over 70 years old. Uh, how do you, how do you, I mean, obviously there have been like with archaeological developments and changes in maybe how they analyze things, there's a lot more up-to-date research, but a lot of people are intimidated and kind of what my, my other panelists were speaking of earlier is they can't just go to these academic publishers and just get copies of books. It's just way too expensive. I mean, I shoulder some of those costs by virtue of me running the podcast. Um, and thank goodness for all the uh, open access people for academia.edu, as mentioned in the chat or uh, on other social sharing platforms. But that's one of the big things I always like to take away is when I present something on these topics that are very under misunderstood or not as understood, but they really sound appealing. Like, for example, um, the Greek kingdoms of Afghanistan and modern Pakistan, that is something that people find or like inherently like really curious about. But when they try to look online, they're getting very spotty information or it's stuff that's almost difficult or impossible to find. So our my kind of show, my show is one of those ways where I can give people a launching point to find more rigorous scholarship where I'm taking stuff that's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to digest multiple specialized books. People who are much smarter than me, much know more about me and try to compile into a 30 minute format that say, okay, here's what, here's a good idea, a taste of what's to come. If you're interested, here's a full list of materials I've relied on. And these are all solid research, solid books. If you want to go further, there's your opportunity. And that's where, as someone who's not from an academic background like that, that's where my point of the show is to provide people that launching point to look further into a period, which I think is super interesting. But I'm sure other people with, uh, as I mentioned earlier, probably are more uh, aware of the kind of bad history takes that are given and are therefore have to combat it a lot harder than I do. I'd like to jump on that and say that, yeah, you know, one of the, the greatest compliments for me is when I get comments on my videos saying, I didn't know about the object before and they get excited to to learn something new because yeah, when they watch tv what are they what are they seeing pyramids again lost tombs again right and so being able to um present stories that nobody even knows exists um and to have your audience say thank you for for giving us uh, the, this really interesting um, a story about an object or about some facet of, for in, in my case, ancient Egypt uh, that we didn't know about. And I just, I just love when that happens because I mean, I'm, I'm not reaching millions of people, but you know, I'm reaching one person. And for me, that that's the most rewarding part of it. Yeah, I think, I think we can speak on this too, because we did a, um, like, like Jen said earlier, a whole episode or a whole a sort of series on mysteries of the ancient world. And, um, we started that series off with an exploration of the Sphinx water erosion theory and um, really delved into it in depth and talked about um, why it's pseudoscience and how easy it is to get sucked in and think that this is real because there's so much about it that seems to a layperson like it's legit, you know, and um, I think that one of the things that we really found fun and exciting in that series was figuring out like how to present what the real mystery is, because there's so many fascinating historical mysteries that are actually real. Like you don't have to go to the aliens and the, the Atlantis. The Atlantis of it all. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to. Like there's so to make much more interesting touch. stuff out there. You know, sorry, Jen, what were you saying? I just said, stop trying to make Atlantis fetch. Um, our yeah. good friend Liv from Mitz Baby did a whole season on, you know, 
debunking Atlantis for that reason. And I think, you know, you know, somebody just said in the chat, yeah, ancient people were super spicy. There's so many fascinating things. And one of the things we did in ancient mysteries that we hadn't done before was we really left the Greco-Roman world and dug into uh, South America, Japan. And, you know, um, like we we tried to find a mystery or a place that is now today mysterious, like Akikahara, the Japanese suicide forest. And we traced its roots all the way back to how the forest was made, you know, where it sits in the path of pilgrimage is, where the mythology is. Um, and that's kind of when we started really looking into the into a different way of telling the story and figuring out what the story is and how it relates and what's interesting as opposed to just like a place where, you know, maybe ancient aliens were. And the bad scholarship, like the amount of times we would read something and be like, well, that's not true. And that's not true. And this is coming like from five years ago in a reputable source, that's not true anymore. Mm -hmm. Like it hasn't been taken down. There's no corrections. Like one of the things we did in that first episode was literally track how you can start researching by doing something completely normal and all of a sudden wind up in ancient aliens. Yeah. Yep. I want to jump in on that too, because that's something I've been able to see extremely like live and recently. Um, So uh, I recently implemented a thing uh, on my channel where someone watching can say, hey, I just saw something in the game you're playing. Uh, we're going to stop and we're going to take like 10 minutes here and we're just going to research that together. It turns out trying to keep that to within 10 minutes is uh, incredibly challenging because uh, you got kind of a couple of options. You can either just, you know, Google is our friend. Let's just do a good Google search, um, see what comes up. Uh, in which case, mostly what you're seeing is very visually appealing, very well put together, absolute nonsense. Or you can go onto Google Scholar, in which case you may end up with just citations, but otherwise you, an open access publication that's 30 pages out of a 150 page book that was written for an academic audience and published by Taylor and Francis, and therefore is um, not good content to just read. And so something I've been actually seeing uh, to speak to your question, uh, Patrick, uh, is actually that there's value in let's do that live and do the skill set, not only of being a starting point of information, but a starting point of, hey, you found a source that's an article published XYZ thing. How do we actually read that quickly to decide if the information in it is any good? So for me, right, that's abstract, first page, last page, keyword search in that order. Um, and that usually gives me a sense within about three minutes, uh, whether this is going to be a source that has helpful information and that we can follow up on in more depth. Uh, and so I found a lot of value on that front, uh, and actually I've received feedback that like gushing to colleagues and friends, uh, about how cool it is that something like that exists online now. Um, so being the starting point, not only for historical knowledge and historical narratives, but historical toolkits, uh, I think really impactful to dealing with the, uh, how do you empower people to go off into the world and deal with ancient aliens in their own lives without doing everything right and somehow still ending up at ancient aliens? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, that's a, a skill that you kind of pick up through academia and stop thinking about. Right? You're never explicitly taught it in most cases, but you have to. You have to learn that. And if you're not in academia, you don't have to learn that. So that makes total sense that that kind of approach to scholarship would be really interesting for a, a lay audience, as it were. Um, one thing that I'm hearing over and over again here is that there is this hunger on both the academic side and the general audience side for this kind of content. And I'm really interested to see where this is going. Um, but lest I spin off on my own commentary here, let's go to our next question, which was from Charlotte. Uh, hi, y'all. Um... I, my questions are more like nuts and bolts type of things as someone who's coming from an academic background, uh, but 
I don't know anything about how to set up a YouTube channel or any of that sort of thing. I mean, how do you even go about doing that sort of thing without being completely and utterly overwhelmed? And also for things like images, how do you go about getting images or so for something like that as opposed to a more academic uh, traditional route? So the setup... I can speak to YouTube absolutely is actually super easy. If you have a Gmail account, you can just sign into YouTube using that. And um, there are various really well-written tutorials that can walk you through it. Um, and then you just, you can upload literally whatever it is that you've filmed. Um, the, the tricky part is finding an audience. And for that, for me, at least having, other pre-existing channels help publicize your work has been really, really helpful. Um, YouTube, like uh, Twitch, really supports regular uploads. If you can film even just five minutes, like five minute video segments and upload them every day for several months, it will help people uh, find your stuff. You'll get like higher search rankings. You'll be suggested to people for like what to watch next videos. Um, I will say that uh, YouTube is uh, great for burnout. Uh, I suspect it's similar with uh, with a lot of the other platforms that are being talked about here because what they want is for you to upload something every single day because that's how they make the most money. So if um, if that's something you're planning on doing, keep it manageable. Um, it sounds like Jenny and Jen have a fantastic system going on where they kind of complement each other um, in terms of their strengths. So if you have a partner that you can do it with, Maybe one of you records uh, for two hours and someone else can sit down and clip those two hours into five, 10 minute segments and you can upload them as individual videos. That kind of thing would work really, really well. Uh, in terms of images, we try really hard to keep ours uh, in Creative Commons licensing just to make sure that we don't get hit with some kind of copyright issue. Wikimedia Commons is a really, really good resource for that. Everything there uh, is Creative Commons. Some of it is maybe limited. So you might have to do things like cite the photographer or say where you found the image. Um, you can just put that in your YouTube video description. It's really, really easy. There's also a lot of website, uh, well, a lot of, uh, not university, museum websites are now moving more towards Creative Commons, Open Commons um, images. Um, the Met, absolutely everything, I believe, all the images on their website, you can reuse for free for essentially whatever you want to do with it. I think you can even use them for commercial purposes. Um, the British Museum, on the other hand, stay well away of, uh, or well away from, because that is copyright hell. Um, but each each un each museum will have their own copyright page. If you want to reuse the images, that information is usually available on the museum website. So you can go and kind of, of work out what it is you're looking at. If you have any images that you took yourself, you can essentially do whatever you want with those. That's not a problem. And I've had good success also with emailing. And this goes also for people looking to get access to specific articles, books, chapters. If you email specific um, researchers, a lot of the time they are happy to share what they have with you. If they've written it, they will usually send you a PDF. If they have a good image collection, if like maybe they were on excavation and you know that they have some photos that would be really helpful, a lot of them will send you what they have. There might be some like um, caveats, but it's always worth asking. Um, People generally want to share what it is they've written. And I think there's a decent understanding among academics that academic publishing is not terribly wide. They're not going to lose money by sending you an article chapter or an article or a chapter that they've written. Uh, typically, they're, they're quite happy to, to share that kind of work with you. Yeah, um, I guess I want to take the... Uh the live stream side of things because there is a bigger layer but for live streaming than there is for youtube uploads um uh, though you know i hate video editing with a passion uh and so i'm very bad at that consistent uploads because um i have all the tools to do good video editing but it takes me about three months to get my act together to edit any given video because i just don't like it uh so, you know, if you are able to afford to pay someone else to edit things for you, hey, it turns out that's actually a pretty good uh, deal. Uh, but 
uh, for live streaming, right, you do need a couple of interface layers, but um, you just kind of learn as you go. Uh, there's, I agree with you totally, Megan, that audience building is far more difficult than the uh, actual technical side of it. Uh, but uh, to some extent, right, um, learn by doing, uh, and as you uh, learn by appearing on other people's stuff and then asking them questions about how they set stuff up, uh, but then learn by just trying it yourself. And like, God, it was, I think, only three weeks ago I figured out how to put a noise gate on my microphone so my air conditioning isn't in the background of everything I'm doing. Uh, like, I've been doing this for four years, and I found that button uh, a few weeks ago. So, you know, you'll never stop learning. You'll never stop feeling overwhelmed by what the technology can do. Uh, it's just as you need something, figure out, look up some tutorials, some advice on how to do it, uh, mess around until it works, and then stick with that. Yeah, I would also say that um, I have a fly, sorry. <laughs> um, the thing you should worry about first is the quality of your work. The audience will come when the audience comes. They'll find it eventually. Um, and then, yeah, and it is about consistency in acquiring more people. I'm very bad with consistency because I'm actually still in academia and I'm, that's, you know, <laughs> what I'm getting paid for. So I focus on that first, um, and which means I don't have a lot of time to do videos. Um, so being consistent, if you do want to build an audience, if that's something that you are really um, concerned about, um, it, it's, it's a very good thing. Um, two videos a week maybe uh, would be normal, I would say. Every day, I think that would, um, I don't think that would actually benefit you because it doesn't give people time to find your videos and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, definitely the quality is what you need to focus on and your first videos are going to be really bad and it's okay if you have janky videos and janky equipment because it is a learning process and you know as long as you're doing something really interesting people are rather most people i would say um are rather forgiving and i, I know i would also say that um when you finally get to the the people who are just you know harassing you and being really nasty to you and insulting you that's when you know that you've uh become successful i would say i did just want to chime in here as as somebody who also is on the youtube and twitch platforms um the the sort of technical overhead for doing video, like it's a, it's a steeper learning curve, but it's also perhaps monetarily less so. Um, you need to be able to edit your video, you need to be able to use the platforms, you need to, but all you need is this equipment to put out a video if you really want. On the other hand, putting out a, a podcast is a more straightforward technical experience. Not that audio editing is not intense and I don't understand it, but you can very much focus on just getting that audio good and clipping it together in the way that you want it to sound, but you will need a podcast host. So um, very much think about what what you have interest in like adam was saying if you don't like video editing don't make that a big part of what you need to do to keep your uh your channel or podcast going um one thing about my youtube channel is i'm actually more on the video essayist side than the upload every week side so i put out like a proper video maybe once every month to every two months um and you know, there's a there's a difference in what kind of audience you're going to get. So that's something to think about when you're starting up is what kind of thing you want to do and why. I'm I sorry. Like, I feel like Jenny was about to say something. When oh, I sorry. Oh, no, it's OK. <laughs> I'm just going to super quick jump in. If uh, if you're looking after you've done this for a little bit and you're looking at equipment upgrades, um, very personal experience, I would recommend getting a good microphone before you change your camera setup. People generally are much more forgiving of 
not having a very clear picture if you're doing like a video um, of you talking. But if you have a bad mic and it's kind of buzzing and hissing and they can't hear you properly, they will just switch off. Um, and there are some very good uh, kind of entry level podcasting mics that will give you a decent sound without also breaking your budget. Cameras get more expensive much faster. A second, dude, especially with how good phone cameras are these days. Uh, right, I've used my, I'm using my phone right now, actually, but it's able to record up to 4K video footage and it doesn't look amazing compared to a true like video camera. But it looks good enough. Uh, but a $50, $60 microphone going to carry you a huge way over using like a headset mic. Although I will say that having your recording space set up so that it isn't echoey improves your audio way faster than having a better mic. So you can look up tips on like you know making the walls softer, making sure you have a carpet down. Some people record audio in their closets um to get this effect. So so you know there's lots of advice out there. Um on YouTube in particular there's lots of advice about how the technical side is done. Um but don't feel like you have to have everything done all at once. Yeah, I can probably speak to um, some of the technical stuff with recording in terms of podcasts because I do the sound editing and um, I, Jen and I, I would say it's probably safe to say both of us fall into this category, are not particularly technically advanced people. Like my idea of fun is not sitting down and learning new software. Like I really do not want to do that at all. So I was always very fast and dirty with everything. Um we started with GarageBand, which is already on our computers, um, and we would record with that. I took the lead on the sound because I had been a voiceover artist in another life, and I was I already generally knew how to record something in GarageBand from that. And I started editing in Reaper just because it was a little bit more usable. Um, there's other software most podcasters seem to use Audacity a lot, or at least this was true a few years ago. Um, it's probably easier I've been warned off the newest iteration of that. I don't know how current that advice is, but um, the sound editing is very time consuming and it's not just, and it, it might be different. Everybody's got a different process, but it isn't just, you know, making sure it sounds good. Like I have some very basic like techniques I use to just remove, you know, background noise and make sure that the sound quality, like the volume is even and everything like that. But like, just in terms of editing out, like, editing out side convos and crafting it to be the thing I need, I want it to be and getting the pacing right, because we're both a sort of my favorite murdery conversational podcast and a sort of Dan Carlin-y super intense narrative storytelling podcast at the same time. So we, we have to blend that together to make sure that our pacing is right for our audience. And that's, that's a lot of work. That is hours of work. And I've just recently learned a few things to make my process easier. It's still not super fast. Um, and I would also say that, like, just in terms of um, the microphone that you buy, like, we both use the same microphone. It's a snowball microphone. You can get it for 50 bucks. I have found that that microphone is better than the Blue Yeti, which is the next step up in terms of um, in terms of sound quality, possibly because I just don't know how to turn that little sort of gain dial. I always screwed up. I don't know. But our sound was more consistent when we were using the same microphone. Um, super easy setup. You get that with a pop shield. Um, both of us have started using like a soft box about this big with some um, acoustic foam inside it that we put our mics in and that will cut down on our um, echo. And I live in a very echoey apartment in Brooklyn without having to um, sit in a closet or put blankets over my head, which was another thing I used to do. Which is what I have to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a little uneven on the implementation. So. Very, very hot closet with no ventilation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because <laughs> you can't have the air con, you can't have the noise from the street. Nope, yeah. can't, can't have a dehumidifier on these summers in New England. Uh, solidly not a good time. Nope, you, you, you know, I sit on a hardwood floor and record for three hours because I have to have my face in that box. Yep. <laughs> North Carolina with no air con in a walk-in closet is not my favorite place to be, but it's okay. We're doing, we're doing great. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hate to cut off this part of the conversation, but we do have several more people wanting to act, ask questions. And I think at this point, we might only have time for one more. So, Anne, if you want to go ahead and ask your question, please. 
Okay. Um, yes, I, I had a comment uh, associated with the question. Uh, in order to increase the number of people who are coming to your offerings, uh, I think we have to have people coming from the other side, that is to say from interested, well-educated families and so forth, people who are who have uh, who are college educated and so forth as well as not. And if universities are going to uh, institute change, and I think Heather's suggestion was just excellent, uh, that universities have have an interest in doing this in, in promoting um, outreach as part of graduate education. Grad students have to teach. They have to learn how to teach. And so that could be another part of their uh, process. Um, and my question is, uh, many societies for in the ancient Near East, for instance, have YouTube channels. Uh, does anyone know how many people from the general public are accessing those videos. And if we don't know, it might be a good idea, a small project, a large project, to try to find out something about that uh, group of people if they, if, they're, if they exist. I think that also that impetus is not going to come from graduate students themselves because I found in one university that a, a, a stu grad student actually wanted to start a, uh, a conference around that subject, outreach, but it was canceled because the grad students themselves did not participate. So it'll have to come from the institution, from the universities themselves. So I'm going to say that um, in my experience, grad students not participating in this kind of thing is because they've either been told not to by their academic advisors or because they feel that there will be some kind of retribution if they do. Um, may, maybe not retribution, but because it, it is not, it, it's not an appropriate academic platform and it's not an appropriate use of your time as a grad student. As a grad student, in my experience, the understanding is that you are working on your own research, you are attending lectures at universities, at conferences, and um, this kind of open access work, while I obviously feel is very, very important, is not something that is promoted as okay for, for grad students to participate in. Um, one of the reasons that I ended up leaving was because I had that kind of response while I was still a student and I found this work much more fulfilling um, than I found my, uh, my dissertation work. And I thought it was more important for me personally to try and make this kind of a difference and to share the information that I've been very privileged to learn with people who don't have those same um, opportunities that I've had. And I think you're entirely right. This is something that needs to be implemented by universities. And I think once there is a cultural shift among university administration, among uh, very senior, senior academics, then you'll see a corresponding shift, at least in the outspokenness or the willingness to participate in grad students. And um, I've, I've worked with, I've spoken to a lot of grad students who are really, really excited about the kind of work that we're doing. They just they don't feel able to participate and in some cases are counseled directly against it because if if you apart from what i mentioned earlier if you share new research publicly there's the concern that someone else will kind of scoop it up from under you and publish it first uh which is obviously a problem if you're a grad student working on a dissertation topic and people also get concerned understandably about speaking publicly before they have a PhD, before they've started on their career path, because once you start applying for jobs, it, it's the same anyway, you get Googled. And if it's a video that turns up and maybe you weren't on your best behavior that day, maybe you said some things about your research that you've later changed your mind about, it's always like it's there to be found and, and to be reviewed and it can have a real lasting impact. And for someone right at the beginning of their career, it, I can see that being quite worrying. 
That's the status quo now, but let's change all that. Um, speaking as someone, I mean, that's kind of interesting. That's actually interesting insights. So speaking as someone looking from outside, looking in, uh, you know, I've, I've hosted, I've had 30 odd interviews on my show and I think maybe one person specifically told me no, not to I, most of the responses I've, when I, when I've requested it, or I've had people reach out to me, they've been pretty positive and be like, yeah, absolutely. We'd love to be able to take part as, you know, become a guest, talk about the research. Uh, a small number of those had been grad students in comparison, I will fully admit, but that's, that's, that's pretty disheartening to hear because uh, from, from what I understand is a lot of people have been, like, I see random references pop up on like, uh, from people putting on resumes or CVs. Uh, so that's pretty disheartening to hear. I'm, as far as I'm, t- can, from what I'm seeing, there is that change where podcasting or video editing or appearances like that are becoming more and more commonly accepted on as part of your credentials. Like this is, you know, hey, I can talk about this as a public speaker. I've engaged with public access. Uh, so I I think there is that shift going on, especially with the generation now. It's, you know, like stuff like this is this alternative media or as like a media as a platform for public outreach is becoming very much normalized day to day amongst you know academics, amongst you know lay people, and I mean if that's what the situation was like, however many years ago, even five or last few years, I and mean, that's that's pretty shocking. But as far as I'm seeing, that's that's a trend that's definitely changing for the better. Um, at least there's a ray of light at that. But I'm not in it, so if it's maybe in the deep dark crevices of academia, it could be a lot worse. But uh, that's just for my own personal two cents on that. I was going to say we just had someone who was on last uh, autumn who asked for their downloads. Um, they were an academic. They were in early, early stage. They were getting a PhD as they can use it on their credentials. So I yeah. think that is changing. I also think one thing to think about, like, you know, my mother has said to me many times, why don't you go back to school and get your PhD and, and become a history academic, which would be a dream of mine. But it, the cost is so prohibitive. So mm-hmm. you're seeing a lot of people who are lay like scholars because that's what they can afford. You know, yeah, they have access to. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, shining light on that scholarship and not, you know, putting it down is also really important because that's how you keep lifelong learners. That's how you bring this through to like teachers of history in non-college settings like K through 12. That's how you create resources and, you know, um, how you create lifelong learning. Yeah, I I want to chime in on that front too, because both on the, you know, um, getting people on to participate in, uh, have interviews enjoy, right? There has been some shift. Um, there's some people, uh, some tenured academics that are really leading the way. For classics, uh, the one name that comes to mind immediately is Rilke Neinendijk, uh, who is delightful, uh, and I'm very proud and happy to be able to call him a colleague through other platforms. Um, but... It is a very real concern. Uh, I had request asked for someone um, to come on, and they were like, "I don't feel like I know enough as a lay stage PhD in a subject." It's like, okay, uh, who also runs a podcast? Uh, and I was like, "I I respect that. I don't agree with you. I have much more confidence in your abilities than you do right now." But I think that speaks to something. Being a grad student is really damn stressful. Uh, and expecting right, grad students to be doing the labor of organizing societies, of uh, right, progressive outreach societies, being on podcasts, setting up their own podcasts, being on other people's stuff, and doing their own research to the quality of their committee expects is not a sustainable ask. And yet grad students are the people who are a- aware of podcasting, of who have any idea what Twitch is, right? There's the number of tenured academics I know who know what Twitch is, I can count on one hand. Um, so, right, but there's a kind of catch-22 here of that the people who are least able to afford to do this work and who often have the, the most interesting ideals that would really have that impact are the people who can least sustainably afford to do it. All right. Thank you all so, so much for coming to our special session on self-publishing and uh, and putting out public knowledge on ancient studies into the world. Everybody here has so much more interesting stuff to say, and I would love to stick with y'all all day, but we do have other presentations going forward. Um, 
<laughs> I absolutely adore all of your projects um, and I hope everybody who is watching will go and check them out. If you do have an interest in public scholarship in the ancient world, go check out SASA's website. This is absolutely core to what we do. We do have an independent scholars working group that Heather was so kind to, uh, to plug for us a little bit earlier. And um, we also just have lots of resources if you want to study on your own or start up your own uh, podcast or YouTube channel. In You can partner with us through our Port Ancient if you'd like. So thank you everybody on the panel so much. This has been an absolutely fantastic discussion and uh, everyone have a good day. We are now going to move on to our next speaker. So. Oops, wrong screen. My apologies. All right. If everyone would please welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Alexander Jones. Um, Alexander Jones has studied classics at the University of British Columbia and the history of the ancient mathematical sciences in the Department of History and Mathematics at Brown University. Before coming to NYU, where he currently is, he was for 16 years on the faculty of the Department of Classics and the Institute for History and Philosophy of Science and Technology at University of Toronto. His work centers on the history and transmission of the mathematical sciences, especially astronomy. Today, he's going to be speaking for us on Ptolemy and his instruments of science. Uh, Dr. Jones, if you would, please go right ahead. Hi. Yes. Uh, am I able to share my screen? Am I audible? Yes, we can hear okay. you and please go ahead and share your screen. Sure. Okay. This. And hopefully that is now showing a slideshow. Are we okay? okay. How are we? We're good. Good. All right. Okay, so uh, so this talk, uh, it's to some extent, you know, what what I want to do is to um, you know sort of do a sort of a rebalance on what people think of as uh, the interesting uh, period for uh, science in in Greco-Roman antiquity. I mean, pe people tend to when they talk about science and antiquity, they tend to conflate it with ancient philosophy. And uh, often a lot of the attention goes to very early periods, uh, you know, essentially classical or even pre-classical, uh, pre-Socratic philosophy, uh, Hippocratic medicine, uh, Greek mathematics and its formative period. Um, I, I want to make a case that things get really interesting in the time of the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be particularly focusing on the uh, one aspect, the sort of observational aspect and uh, sort of instrumental aspect of the work of one particular figure from this period, uh, Claudius Ptolemy, uh, who was the, the most important um, scientific writer of the time of the Roman Empire, active in the mid to into the late second century CE, so Antonine Rome, uh, but not active in Rome, but in Alexandria and Egypt. So uh, let me see if I can get my slides to move. Yeah, so I'm just starting off with this, this interesting object, which is uh, on display, at least usually it's on display, I don't know if it is currently, in the Getty Villa uh, in California. Uh, it's a silver plate, uh, somewhat damaged around the edges, but we've got sort of the, the middle of what was once uh, a full circular plate, um, probably dating from 6th century CE, uh, Byzantine in origin. Uh, and what you see here in the, the center of the figure is two uh, bearded men, uh, evidently from the way they're portrayed philosophers or intellectuals, who are in some kind of an, a conversation or debate 
with an object between them, a uh, sort of circular or spherical object uh, being held in a kind of tripod stand. And uh, so what's going on here, I, I think part of the key to this is in earlier Greco-Roman art, uh, a, a, an image of which we have a number of versions surviving. This is the, the best preserved one uh, dating from the probably the you know, first or second century CE from Pompeii, uh, now in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. And it's a, it's a big Roman mosaic uh, that portrays seven philosophers who are sitting around uh, a ball-shaped object, a spherical object in a little wooden case that is on the ground. And one of them has uh, a sort of stick or pointer and is must be doing some kind of a lecture, uh, talking about something to do with this object. The, the sphere is presumably intended to represent the spherical heaven surrounding us, and the topic must be something related to cosmology or astronomy. And beyond that, there's not an awful lot we can get out of this image without making guesses. It's often, uh, People often speak of this as being representing uh, Plato's Academy or the seven legendary sages of earlier Greek thought. We really don't know exactly who the seven people are. But it was a popular image. Uh, it goes back to at least as early as the, the fourth century BCE, because there is a Macedonian tomb that has a sort of uh, exploded representation of these seven uh, seven wise men, one of the central one having a pointer and a sphere that he is making some kind of disquisition about. Uh, so um, going back to the Byzantine plate, we, we're down to two figures in conversation, the third one seated behind. It looks rather Christ-like and one would rather like to have the head. Uh, we really don't know uh, who he is supposed to be. But the two figures who are complete in the figure are identified, their names are written above their heads. Um, so one of them, the one on the right, is Hermes. Uh, he doesn't look at all like the typical iconography of Hermes, the, the Greek god, um, and presumably he represents rather Hermes Trismegistos, the uh, sort of syncretistic uh, figure of the Egyptian Thoth with Hermes as a kind of source of revealed wisdom. Um, and the other figure has his name above him and he is Ptolemaeus, that is Ptolemy. Uh, this would be Ptolemy, the scientific writer. And he is, uh, he has a little pointer thing, but he's pointing at some passage in a codex or a pair of, of wooden boards that he's holding um, and is presumably addressing, you know, in some bookish way, something to do with this, you know, as we can now recognize, sphere, probably celestial sphere in the tripod stand between the two of them. So there's some kind of a conversation they're having about cosmology or astronomy. Um, and there are female figures behind both of them. Uh, the, the label for the one behind Hermes is lost, but the one behind Ptolemy is labeled Skepsis as a rational inquiry. So she's an allegorical figure who is characterizing the kind of thinking that Ptolemy is associated with, according to the artist who produced this plate. Uh, so in contrast, Hermes perhaps has a figure, may have been labeled as something meaning something like revealed wisdom. So the difference between, uh, between reason as a route to knowledge and a kind of innate or uh, transferred knowledge. So I'd, I'd like to come back. I mean, this is actually the earliest uh, representation of Ptolemy that we have. It's centuries later than Ptolemy himself, but also centuries earlier than the next attempt of someone to imagine what he looked like. Uh, from a roughly the same time, we have the earliest representation of his somewhat younger contemporary Galen, who shares with Ptolemy the sort of dominating position in, uh, in, in science of the Roman uh, Empire. Uh, Ptolemy is the, the main figure on the sort of mathematical, physical side, Galen on the life sciences and medicine, and also both of them having some overlap with broader philosophical issues. Uh, they conceivably met each other. Uh, Ptolemy must have been born sometime in the early uh, second century. Galen, we know the birth years, 129 CE, so he's a generation younger. 
Um, Ptolemy was already active as a, as a researcher, we could say. He's making astronomical observations as early as 127. That's the earliest date we have for him. And then about 20 years later, uh, he erected an inscription summarizing some of the main results of his astronomical work. So by now, he must be, say, around 40-ish. Um, and this inscription, well, it's lost as an inscription in stone. It, it was apparently erected somewhere in some publicly accessible place in Canopus near Alexandria in Egypt. Um, uh, but luckily in late antiquity, somebody made a transcription of it. And we have medieval manuscript copies of it. Um, and uh, from this inscription's date, uh, which clearly was, it was actually written at the bottom of the text, um, we get a kind of uh, key date for relative dating of many of Ptolemy's surviving books that have come through the medieval manuscript tradition. Most of them seem to be later than this date. Uh, a couple of them seem to be earlier, which is not really surprising. By 40, you would expect that he would have produced something already. Uh, so uh, that, that's pretty nearly the whole biography we can make for him. He doesn't write much about himself at all. In fact, essentially nothing except the reports of astronomical observations he made, many of which have dates attached to them. Uh, and some of them say that he made observations in Alexandria. For Galen, the situation is very different. He's hugely prolific. We have, you know, we have a reasonably big bookshelf of writings transmitted by Ptolemy, but for Galen, it's massive. It's something on the order of a tenth of the surviving ancient Greek literature. Uh, and he likes writing about himself. We can, we can sort of reconstruct a biography of him from his self-reporting. Uh, we know that uh, you know, he, he was born in Pergamon, son of, a, of an architect or builder named Nikon. Uh, we know that he initially had a philosophical education and then moves into medicine because his father had a, a dream in which he believed that a divine voice told him that his son should become a doctor. So he then begins a, a medical education going to want from uh, one teacher to another in various cities in the um, in, in Asia Minor in Greece and then in Alexandria for a couple of years and there he might have met Ptolemy around the late 140s early 150s when Ptolemy sort of got the peak of his activity but we don't know that um, and then Galen moves to Rome and spends most of the rest of his life there uh, writing massive quantities of texts on medicine and other topics um, and uh, eventually dying in some in the early decades of the third century. So here with these two figures, in some sense com uh, complementary, in some sense very contrasting. Uh, and between them, they represent uh, really the great bulk of what we know of ancient science simply because uh, they are a large fraction of the surviving material on topics in Galen's side, like medicine and physiology and anatomy, on Ptolemy's side, astronomy, uh, harmonic theory in, music, in, in ancient music, uh, optics, and other topics as well. I'll come back to that in a second, what, what he wrote about. Um, so we have this, uh, we, we have you know, quite a few works, and some of them are fairly short, but some are really rather large. Um, that have, have survived either complete and mostly in their original Greek, but not quite all. Uh, we also have some for which we depend on Arabic translation or Latin translation or Latin translation of an Arabic translation. But the, the majority of this material is surviving in manuscripts from the Byzantine world in Greek. Um, and uh, here I'm giving you a list that is essentially sorted by that sort of key, uh, sort of pivotal date given us by the inscription that he put up uh, in 146, 147, and his major treatise on astronomy, which must have been completed and made somehow publicly available pretty soon after that, say around 150. So there are, as you can see from this list, there are just two works that we can say with confidence are earlier than that, and about eight or so works which seem to be after that. Some of them clearly are because they make back references to the astronomical treatise, um, some of which uh, we we just guess are, are probably among his later works. If you sort them by topic, 
Um, astronomy is the big thing. Clearly, this is central to Ptolemy. Uh, about half a dozen of his transmitted works are on astronomy, ranging from this big treatise in 13 books in the ancient sense, so like 13 rolls of papyrus. It makes a, a fat sort of 800-page uh, modern book for a complete translation, uh, which is known by its medieval nickname Almagest, which is part Arabic, part Greek, and means the, the greatest uh, because of the, the sort of dominant position that it acquired uh, in the centuries after he wrote it in the areas of, uh, of astronomy that it deals with, which are about the, the apparent and true motions of the heavenly bodies in the heavens, the, the sun, the moon, the five planets that are known before telescopes, and the, and the fixed stars. The others are all shorter than that and are in, are in some way more specialized. So sets of tables for the use of astrologers, uh, you know, a study of the conditions in which stars become visible and cease to be visible through the year in various places on the earth, uh, and works that have to do with certain kinds of visual representation of astronomical configurations for the purposes of calculation and, and, and illustration. Um, so this half dozen are all in various ways to do with what we would consider to be straight astronomy, studying things going on in the sky in their own right and for their own sake. Uh, there is also one biggish book uh, known by a nickname, the Tetrabiblos, because it's in four ancient books, four chapters, uh, which is astrology. It's, it's a sort of an attempt to, to reform the tradition of astrology, both the kind of astrology that deals with whole regions and peoples and the kind that dealt with individual lives from the state of the heavens at their birth dates, uh, in a way that reconciles the tradition with Ptolemy's understanding of the way the world works physically, which is basically a kind of post-Aristotelian uh, cosmology and physics. Um, in music theory, this is one of the early works, um, and it, it was an attempt to uh, find a kind of mathematical theory behind the tuning systems of Greek music. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in this talk. Uh, then there is a, there's a work, and this is this is the one which we have only in a medieval Latin translation of a lost Arabic translation of an incomplete Greek original. It's missing the beginning and it's missing the end, uh, and it's about visual perception, about the the relationship between objects as they are out there in the world and the way we perceive them through our vision and the how we sort of construct uh, sort of three dimensional impression of shapes and distances and motions and so on from the essentially the information that the the uh, way vision works connecting our souls and our eyes to objects out there uh, reduces the whole truth about an object to some subset of that information that we get. Um, it, there, there's a, some controversy about whether this is an authentic work. It's harder to authenticate than the works we have in Greek because it's a double translation and somewhat messed up in the tradition. I think it is authentic. I'm not going to talk about it in this talk because time is limited, although it does have some interesting material about instruments that I could have brought in if I had more uh, time to, to get into it. There's a book on map making, which is large, though most of what makes it big is that it has a huge list of places uh, in the world known to Ptolemy and the people of his time which extends from the, you know, from, from Northern and Western Europe, the British Isles, a bit of Scandinavia, uh, to Africa in some places beyond the Sahara, um, and to Asia as far as Southeast Asia and inland China. So it's, it's uh, sort of the, the, the greatest extent of uh, knowledge with some inaccuracy, of course, that the, the, the Greco-Roman world ever apparently had of the Afro-Euro-Asian landmass. And the, the book's purpose is to provide a kind of kit for constructing maps. So this huge data list is part of that, but also a discussion of how you, how you evaluate the available data, how you, uh, how you make the drawing um, so that it's a very, uh, it, it's, it's a specialized topic, but at the same time, a pretty big one. And then there's this very, probably very early work, which is 
pretty pretty much a purely philosophical treatment of aspects of the human soul, the part of the human soul that decides what things are and what is the truth about them, and the part that, or the parts that govern our various kinds of activities and actions. Um, so it's a pretty wide ranging. And as I say, you know, astronomy seems to form a kind of unifying core to it all, um, but it, it covers everything. All, you know, not quite, there's no pure mathematics in this, but, but it's the, all the big areas that are active in Greek science around this time uh, that are not primarily medicine life science. Um, running through all of Ptolemy's thinking about the, the physical world that he's so interested in is a, a general sense of its structure and composition, uh, which is a sort of variation on Aristotle's. It's spherical. You, you essentially have a, an immense uh, spherical hole. Beyond what's beyond that is simply not discussed. And the great part of this, the outer shell of it, is composed of an element called ether or ether, uh, which is uh, it's almost propertyless. Or the the property is sort of negative. It is eternal. It's unchangeable. It can move without friction so long as it's in shapes that have surfaces that can glide against other surfaces. And it, Ptolemy speaks of it as being divine. Um, so it, it, it's as close to talking about theology as Ptolemy ever gets when he talks about things made of ether. And these are what we would call the heavens. This is where the planets are, where the sun and the moon are, where the stars are, which are visible bodies made of ether embedded in invisible bodies made of ether. And then much smaller inside this right at the center is a spherical sort of pocket where the dominant elements are earth, water, air, and fire. Uh, we are made of these and all our environment is made of these. There's a solid earth below our feet, which is spherical. And then, you know, wet stuff on parts of that surface and then airy stuff beyond that, getting more and more fire as we go out. And in Ptolemy's way of thinking about it, there's also a little bit of, of ether, sorry, I spelled it with an AI on this slide, um, which mostly manifests itself in living things and particularly human souls and gives the intellectual faculty, the reasoning faculty to people. So, I mean, this is a kind of schematic drawing of it to give you an idea of the, of, of the, the general sort of geocentric structure of it all. Um, if you wanted to do a kind of scale drawing of a cross section of it, um, then the, the sublunary part, the part below where the moon is, the innermost part of the heavens, becomes so tiny that you can't show it as more than a spot at the very middle of the picture. And around that, you have shells that are really quite thick and getting thicker as they go out um, that are, that are the, the realms in which the, the moon, the five planets and the sun, and finally the fixed stars are. Um, so when you think, when people talk about the geocentric cosmology as something that sort of privileges the human position, well, yes, we are sort of central, though we're not quite at the center. We're on the surface of the, the solid earth. But at the same time, we're a very puny component of this huge cosmos. And we're in the part that is most messy, irregular, and unintellectual, frankly, because the, the ethereal parts are thought of as, as Ptolemy says, as divine. They have souls, and those souls are doing things, namely the celestial motions, that are the most rational activities that anything can have. This is a very Aristotelian way of thinking, but reflecting a much more complex understanding of what actually goes on in the heavens in terms of what the motions are than Aristotle could have had in his time. So um, again, I've sort of gone through this already about what the, the topics of interest are of Ptolemy's, uh, uh, Ptolemy's scientific writings. Um, but here I'm sort of summing up that essentially what he's always interested in is properties and behaviors of bodies, bodies made of elements that may be the four elements, maybe the five elements, it may just be the ether. Um, but in all cases, he's interested in where they exhibit regularity and where they exhibit structure that can be treated in some kind of a rational and especially a mathematical way. And his mathematics is either geometry 
or it's to do with whole numbers and things like you know ratios of whole numbers. Uh, so I talk that I talk about that as number theoretical. The, the Greek word is arith arithmetikos, but you don't want to think of arithmetic like calculating sums. Um, it, it, it's about the the way that whole numbers are related to each other in ratios like three to two or five to four or that kind of thing. Uh, and all of these in some way bring that in in its purest form in astronomy because it's dealing with the mathematics of these eternal ethereal bodies that have the quality of being divine. Um, and most messily in astrology, where it's about the, the physical world that we're immediately a part of, uh, which is, is not very regular in much of what it's doing, but is always being driven in various ways and influenced by sort of causal uh, actions that are, are originating from the heavenly bodies. So some kind of predictability comes into our lives and can be uh, can be harnessed in astrology because of that relationship. So um, when he's doing science, uh, his approach is to it's very empirical, really, but it's, it's emp empiricism that is in a an elaborate interplay with reason and mathematical deduction. Um, the two Ptolemy thinks of it as being complementary. Sense perception, our eyes, our ears, especially, are giving us inherently inexact knowledge of the of qualities that are things like hardness and color and so on and bodies out there um, and changes that are happening in them uh, and through this can yield certain at an initial stage rather crude insights about patterns of behavior that are, are more like the, the beginnings of mathematical thinking uh, while reason uh, which needs something to work on. So it needs to have something coming from sense perception to even to make a start, um, gives exact conclusions because it's working through logic and mathematics. Um, and these two faculties contribute to each other so that your initial sense perceptions give you something for reason to work on. Reason arrives at certain conclusions and among those conclusions are ways of refining sense perception. And this is where instruments come in. I mean, my talk is going to be about Ptolemy's instruments and instruments are for Ptolemy objects that we make as human beings that are designed through our reason to take the very basic things that we know and that anybody would recognize from their senses as soon as you point it out to them um, and turn them into more precise things. We now talk about like measurements and, um, and, and like, you know, scientific observations. Um, so it's an iterative process and the instruments are crucial uh, to doing this kind of thing. They let us measure angles, they let us measure time, things that we, we can only very, very crudely do with our unaided eyes and ears. So I'll start off with a bit about his music theory, just to give something of a sense of how, how this is, works in a, a fairly simple way. Um, his harmonics, it's not, about all aspects of, of music, but about the specific part of music that is the tuning system, the pitch systems, uh, which are the, the notes, you might say, that singers or that musicians working, uh, playing on musical instruments uh, produced when they were singing melodies or playing melodies. So, you know, the music of Ptolemy's world was largely melodic. Um, there, there, could be sounds that were simultaneous at different pitches, but nothing like harmony in, in contemporary modern music. Uh, so essentially there, there is a, a flow of pitches, one following another that constitute a melody. Well, what is the space within which those pitches happen? That's what harmonics is about for Ptolemy. Uh, and Ptolemy thinks that it is something that can be treated mathematically, that there is actually a, a, a set of principles that you can deduce and lay out that determine what are acceptable or you could say possible tuning systems and what are not. Um, and it, it, it's a very Hellenocentric or Greco-Roman centric perception because even though he's working in Egypt, he doesn't, where there must have been contact with all sorts of musical traditions that were not Greco-Roman. It's very much the version of ancient Greek music that existed in the second century CE that he's talking about. 
And it's an important source actually for musical practice when it comes to tuning, because what Ptolemy says about it is very precise and it's, it can be, we can translate into sort of reconstructed uh, sounds. Uh, so we, we can't really, you know, we, we, can, we can only very incompletely recreate the sound of actual music, but at least we can get the pitches in certain tuning systems pretty well. Uh, so there, there's, there's a nice contrast that Ptolemy himself draws between astronomy and harmonics. Astronomy is very geometrical. It's quantitatively geometrical because we're always trying to measure uh, things like circles that planets are supposed to move on up in the heavens. Um, but it, it still is essentially about circles and circular motions and uh, th that type of spatial thing. Uh, and it's uh, perceived, you know, you observe through your eyes in astronomy um, and you're looking from the human being, an animated and intellectual observer and reasoner at the visible aspects of the movements driven by these eternal celestial divine bodies up in the sky. With harmonics, um, we're looking for arithmetical structures, it's sort of number theory ratio structures about whole numbers that are generated by an animated body out there, but it's a musician, a human being, but separate from ourselves. Um, so a musician singing, a musician tuning a, a, a lyre, something like that. Um, and the perception here is through hearing. So there is, a, there is a, an analogy uh, that applies, but also this difference between geometry and numbers um, you know, interestingly, music theory, because it operates with ratios of whole numbers, limits possibilities in a way that geometry doesn't. I mean, uh, circles in the heavens can be essentially any dimension you like. They don't have to be rational numbers, let alone whole numbers. Whereas in music theory, you have this limitation to whole numbers. So in some ways, the kind of security of knowledge in Ptolemy's way of thinking about Greek music is higher than it is in astronomy. Though he doesn't, he doesn't really admit this. And when he when he talks about astronomy, he sees this as the highest type of science, the highest type of philosophy. He says that anybody can do because it has the right combination of perceptibility of object and security of the knowledge that arise out of the kind of perfection of those objects. So in music theory, you know, we're not dealing with all sound. We're dealing with sound made by singers or by instruments, which. It stays on one pitch for some finite time. Um, so, it, you know, the, Ptolemy says, for example, that the, the howling of wolves or the, the, the lowing of cattle is not musical sound and it's not scientifically treatable in his mind. Uh, so we're, we're dealing with these sequences of discrete fixed pitches. Um, and there are, and, you know, Ptolemy active in second century CE, of course, there's a background that he has to deal with. He's not a historian. And he doesn't write like a historian, but he does use the past as a way of sort of setting out the problem for him in the present. So there's a, there's a kind of two-party simplification that he gives of earlier Greek harmonic theory, where you have one school of thought that he calls the Pythagoreans, um, who he, he says are too reliant on reason and mathematical thinking, and sometimes allow that to override what their senses are telling them, or as he's, in one place he speaks of the senses screaming at one about the truth about things and the Pythagoreans sometimes let theory contradict that. Or, and then there are the Aristoxenians, the followers of Aristoxenos, uh, a peripatetic philosopher in the time soon after Aristotle, who have in Ptolemy's characterization uh, too much reliance on sense perception uh, without bringing reason enough into play. So there's a kind of a Goldilocks and the Three Bears attitude that Ptolemy takes. You know, this is this is too rational, this is too empirical. The just right approach, of course, will be Ptolemy's, which isn't straight in the middle, but is actually closer to the Pythagoreans because Ptolemy accepts from the Pythagoreans the idea that, uh, that pitches are numbers in some way, and intervals between pitches in any tuning system must be ratios of whole numbers, and especially nice simple looking ratios like three to one, five to one, or ratios of a number to the next number down like four to three. No, not all the ratios in Ptolemy's music theory are of these kinds, but most of them are. Uh, and he has a sort of a taxonomy of niceness of musical intervals uh, going from octaves and multiple octaves, which are, he, he considers the most 
same sounding, homophonous sounds, which in some way are the most aesthetically satisfying uh, pitch intervals that you can get through the, the intervals called the fifth and the fourth, because there's a fifth note on the scale or fourth note on the scale up from a starting note, uh, which he calls concord, and they sound well together, but not quite the same. And then the intervals between adjacent pitches in a scale, which are melodic, they're sounds that sound good as steps in a melody, uh, but not quite as, as uh, not quite as inherently sort of thrilling to the soul as the other ones. And so the mathematical theory is about figuring out what are the ratios that correspond to these different types of things. Um, and one approach that Ptolemy takes is very a prioristic and essentially you know, arguing from the idea that since we're talking about sameness, we're looking at ratios that have some kind of a sameness in them. I'm not going to go into the details of, of, of how all these steps work, but essentially he's got a kind of a priori, a priori way of getting results that the Pythagoreans already had by the way, way before Ptolemy, uh, that for example, two to one ratio is the octave. Four to one ratio is the double octave. So going up two octaves. Uh, three to two is the ratio of the fifth. So like C to G in a modern scale. Four to three is the fourth, like C to F in a modern scale. Um, and these, these are all in some way, somewhat declining ratios of sameness. Uh, so they're, they essentially he's mapping one system of sameness on another like that, but he also has an empirical verification of this, and it uses an instrument. This is an instrument of a type that there are earlier versions of. It's a monochord, so a single string instrument. You wouldn't play music on this. You're using this for um, scientific demonstration. Ptolemy's particular design for it is that you have essentially a ruler on a board and there must be some kind of a, a, a sounding chamber to make, make the, the thing audible below that. But Ptolemy doesn't talk about that. You get a musical instrument maker to make this for you. Um, and then you have a tenth string, very carefully chosen so that it's of uniform thickness uh, through its full length. And it's mounted in a way where you can modify the tenseness of the entire string. Uh, but essentially through the full ruler length, uh, it, 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 that, that, is, that is delimited by two fixed bridges that are like spherical he hemispheres uh, mounted on the board and a movable bridge, which you can move along the ruler to, so that you can divide this tense string into any ratio you please by the numbers on the ruler. Uh, so this is not an instrument that you need a musician to operate. Uh, any anybody can operate it because you're using the numbers to do the tuning, and then you listen with your ear, and anybody uh, should be able to sense whether what you're hearing when you pluck the two parts of the divided string are um, are, are in a, some kind of a concordant or aesthetically pleasing interval or not. Uh, so it's, it's for very simple demonstrations. I, I call these demonstrations rather than experiments because Ptolemy knows the result that he's expecting you to get from this. This is, this is not new research, but he's trying to find a way of giving as secure and convincing a way of establishing that these ratios really are the theory underlying the sounds that make music. So, he, you know, the, 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 he describes the design of this monochord in a surprising level of detail, like the shapes of the bridges being hemispherical. Why hemispherical? Because then the fact that you're raising parts of the string so they're not straight horizontal lines anymore, so this is actually distorting the string in some way, doesn't affect the ratios of the, the free parts that can vibrate. Um, so, you know, Ptolemy develops from this much more elaborate ways of building up the scales. And I'm, I'm not going to go through any of this. It would take the whole talk to do that. Uh, but I'm skipping right to the, where he's done this. And he declares rather, rather proudly that if you take the tuning systems that he has deduced through his rational approach and you get a musician, a really good musician to listen to this tuning system that you're setting by numbers on a, on a kind of artificial mathematical musical instrument, the musician will say, oh, yes, that's perfect. I wouldn't retune it at all by my ear to make it sound any better. Now, we, we have no way of verifying whether Ptolemy really achieved this, but this is his claim. But he also has a very elaborate alternate demonstration 
that all of this deduction works. And uh, I just want to mention this because of its complexity. Uh, he says that essentially what we can do is get our musician to do tunings for us in various ways. And we can then use our, the things we hear about pairs of pitches on different strings uh, to build up a complicated deductive argument that proves that Ptolemy's system is right. Uh, and it uses, well, a musician uh, needs to be available who will do the tunings. It needs eight strings now, not just one, uh, so that you can make sets of four that make parts of scales that are going to be compared in various ways with each other. And you have certain assumptions that you need to make before you can even start the reasoning pattern that's going to arise from the various operations you do. The types of operations are like this. You get the musician to tune one set of four strings to a particular uh, part of a tuning system that the musician knows from musical practice. And then the musician is supposed to do the other set of four according to some, may, it might be the same or it might be a different set of four pitches in common musical practice, but so that two of these strings, one on the left side and one on the right side are tuned to exactly the same pitch. And then the musician or you pluck one of the other strings on each side and compare them, which is heard as higher or are they heard as the same? And it's, it's simple observations of this kind that are the elementary parts of this complicated argument that according to Ptolemy, proves that his whole deduction up to that point has been right. So, so the instruments are guided by reason, as he would say, and they are guiding the sense perception to do comparisons that you really couldn't do without having some kind of a, a construction to help you. So I'm now going to move to astronomy uh, and to his major treatise, the Almagest, uh, and uh, here we have essentially working out an entire system of what Ptolemy calls hypotheses. We sometimes translate these as models, but what they are is essentially systems of circular motions that each of the heavenly bodies is supposed to have up in the heavens. And these circular motions have dimensions. There are sizes of circles and there are speeds, rates of rotation around a circle, uh, which when all combined together in the correct way will give you the direction to the visible heavenly body from our eye that corresponds to what we observe or more complicated things like what do eclipses look like? How long do eclipses happen? When do planets become visible uh, in the morning sky after an interval when you haven't been able to see them? That kind of thing. Uh, so here, uh, there's a whole background of observations that Ptolemy uses, which are not just things that he says he's done himself, but go back to ancient Babylonian records, somehow translated and adapted into Greek, that go back as far as the mid eighth century BCE. Uh, there are also earlier Greek, Hellenistic and Roman period uh, observations, some, you know, many of them from, from Hellenistic Egypt or Roman Egypt, but also from other places like Asia Minor, uh, and then Ptolemy's own observations. And these are what give us part of the chronology of his career. Uh, most of, for most of the, well, all of the older ones, the ones that are before Ptolemy's time, Ptolemy says nothing about any equipment used to make these observations. Um, and that is uh, you know, frustrating for us because for most of them, Ptolemy is our only source. Uh, the exception of the, the Babylonian records, we have thousands of uh, Babylonian records on cuneiform tablets of astronomical observations. And we know, from them that there's not very much in the way of instrumental uh, assistance for the observers there. They're using water clocks to do certain uh, timings, like how long does an eclipse happen? Uh, and perhaps some kind of simple instrumentation for uh, angles between stars and planets, that sort of thing. But much of it is just un unassisted eyes. Uh, and uh, on, with Ptolemy's own observations, on the other hand, he does talk about equipment that he describes in sort of a modest level of detail, not really enough to make your own without, uh, without having to do a lot of experimentation and trial and error to reproduce the results, uh, but at least enough to give something of the character of what he's doing. Uh, so here are uh, modern drawings from his textual descriptions of two instruments that used to do some very basic kinds of measurement 
uh, which are measuring how many degrees above the horizon the sun is when it crosses the meridian at noon, wherever you are observing. This is a very important basic observation because it gives you, uh, among other things, what is your latitude on the spherical globe? Uh, it also, you can use observations day to day to get the dates and times, at least to about a quarter day precision of equinoxes and solstices, which are the basis of Ptolemy's solar theory, his theory of how the sun moves in the heavens around the earth. Um, so, um, you know, the instruments themselves are really just ways of measuring off an angle through the sun casting a shadow of some kind of a pin-like or peg-like object on uh, a circular arc that is graduated in degrees and fractions of a degree. Uh, he doesn't even say how big to make them. He just says make them of a convenient size. So presumably the bigger, the better within reason, um, but but no specifics about that kind of thing. So uh, so the, the, the instrument descriptions, they all just are generally like that. They, they, they give you an idea in a qualitative way of how something is put together, but not really enough to make your own, unless you have something like an instrument maker who has experience who can advise you on that. Uh, here's another, which is designed, again, for a very specific kind of measurement. How many degrees down from the point directly overhead is the moon when it crosses the meridian in certain situations? Why do we want to know that? Because we can compare that with what calculation of the moon's position should be at that same date and time. And that will give us what's called the lunar parallax. Essentially, the difference between observing the direction to the moon from Alexandria uh, and observing, and, and if you were at the center of the Earth, which is the center of the universe. All the theory is about observing from the center of the universe, and usually we can pretend that we're there because the Earth is so tiny compared to everything else. But for the Moon, the Moon's pretty close. It's only about 60 Earth radii away. And so there is a measurable difference in where the Moon appears to be and where it's calculated to be. Uh, and Ptolemy wants to know what that is because from that he can get the distance to the moon. Uh, and also he needs that for doing things like predicting solar eclipses, which are affected by that parallax. So this instrument is a very simple affair again of swinging, uh, swinging rods. Um, the simplicity is deliberate. The intention is to minimize elements that are going to introduce errors and you know messiness in the observation. So really what you want to do is do as little um, in terms of moving parts as possible. And uh, so here we just have two swinging rods and uh, a ruler that's graduated rather like the ruler on the uh, on the monochord um, and which is where you do the measurement. And it's from that measured distance that you, you calculate the angle using trigonometry. On the other hand, there are certain observations for which Ptolemy uses a rather complicated instrument. And uh, he calls this an astrolabe. It's not what, you know, when you go to a museum now that has such things, what is now called an astrolabe is a flat object. And I will come back to that at the end of this talk. Um, but this is, it, the name simply means something that, that takes or uh, seizes a star <laughs> or a heavenly body. Um, and it's it, this instrument had seven bronze rings nested in various ways that could be, so the rings could be either slid inside another ring to different orientations or could be rotated on, on pegs at their poles uh, so that the, the rings inside can be oriented in various useful ways. And the basic idea of this instrument is so that the in, inner rings that you use for making observations, citing directions to the sun or the moon or to planets um, is in essentially in an orientation that gives you the kind of coordinates that you want to be measuring in, which are along the circle through the middle of the zodiac, the so-called ecliptic circle and perpendicular to that circle, which you can't see in the sky. Um, all you can see are the heavenly bodies themselves, the stars and the, the moon, sun, and planets. Um, so you, you need to use these rings to set up um, a scale of observations so that you're sighting and measuring off the angles that you really want to do uh, the astronomical deductions that Ptolemy wants to do in his book. 
Uh, so this is quite elaborate. It's, it's, uh, we, we don't have any surviving examples of Ptolemy's instrument or anything like it from antiquity. Uh, I'm showing a photograph of a, of a reconstruction of one uh, that uh, Dennis Duke, a historian of astronomy at Florida State University, uh, had made um, to give something of an idea of what this would look as a physical object. But imagine this bronze is what Ptolemy says it should be made of, not this, uh, I presume, aluminum or some, some such modern alloy. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you know, again, Ptolemy doesn't say how big to make it. He doesn't talk about thicknesses of rings, except in a very qualitative way. Uh, we do have one thing that's sort of like it, but much smaller and simpler. Uh, it's a portable sundial from about 150 years after Ptolemy's time that was found in a house in Philippi in Macedonia. Uh, and it's a time-telling device that you can carry around. And you notice it's got a little, it, it has a little, uh, uh, you know, the hanger attachment so that you can dangle it because the idea is that you hold this uh, so that uh, light from the sun passes through that tiny hole that you can see in the in the horizontal ring here uh, so that it shines on the, the ring on the opposite side and you can read off the time having set the instrument <coughs> appropriately for the time of year and where you are on the earth. So this is not a scientific observ observation instrument. It's like a pocket watch. Uh, and and it's it, nice that it's, it survived complete. There's only one like it. Uh, and uh, it's only about seven centimeters diameter. So presumably way, way smaller than Ptolemy's more complex instrument. Now here I want to, to get to uh, something quite new. Um, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit, but but. In his book on cartography, Ptolemy says that essentially to get the data for drawing maps, you ideally you want lots of astronomical observations from different places that will give latitudes and longitudes really well because they're based on an objective observation of the sun and of timings between eclipses, between places and so on. But in reality, you depend a lot on kind of surveying measurements and what mariners say are the, the time intervals between when they're at one spot along a coast and another, that kind of stuff. You've got to be translated somehow into distances on the spherical Earth. To do that kind of translation, to change from stades or Roman miles to degrees on the sphere, you need to know how big is the Earth as a sphere. And of course, that is, a, that is something that had been done back in Hellenistic times most famously by Eratosthenes. Um, and the way it was always had always been done, Ptolemy say, said, is to find two places that are supposed to be on the same meridian, one due north of the other. And you find what is the difference in latitude between them and the difference in distance in between them. And dividing one by the other tells you how many land units there are to each degree. Uh, so you can then use that to, to translate all these estimates of, of terrestrial distances into angles on the sphere. Uh, but Ptolemy says, you really don't have to limit yourself to places that are due north or south of each other. He says, we, meaning I, Ptolemy, uh, this is, he uses the first person plural to talk about himself, uh, have established by means of construction of a meteoroscopic instrument, a meteoroscopion, uh, that we can do this even taking two places that are not on the same meridian. And he describes certain kinds of things you can do with it, both observational uh, measurements you can do about directions, but also a kind of calculation thing where you can then use this thing as a kind of, a, of, of a, an analog computer to work out what is the length of the arc in units um, on parts of the instrument. And he, he doesn't, he doesn't in this passage, he doesn't talk at all about how the instrument works uh, sort of advertising its existence, and that's all. Well, we now have a pretty good idea of what it was, um, because we found parts of a book that Ptolemy wrote that was entirely about this meteoroscopy, this heaven-observing instrument. Uh, they come from a manuscript, and I'm going to whiz through this, but it's, it's a palimpsest manuscript um, where the, if you look at the manuscript, what you see immediately is 8th century writing, of a Latin encyclopedia work by Isidore of Seville. And this manuscript was at one time in the famous monastic library of Bobbio in North Italy. It is now in the Ambrosiana Library in Italy. This is Bobbio as it is more or less today. This is the, the Abbey Church, which had a library that had a lot of palimpsest manuscripts in its collection, uh, many of which had Greek texts as their original use. So 
a good, pages from a Greek parchment manuscript had been cleaned off as well as one could, so they could re reuse to make a codex with some more currently valuable text, typically normally in Latin. Um, and uh, many of these Palmasus manuscripts uh, ended up in uh, various modern collections. Um, and uh, in the early 19th century, Angelo Mai, who worked in the Ambrosiana Library in Milan, discovered a number of these things. He was very destructive with them, unfortunately. He used chemicals to try to bring out the writing. Um, and um, this particular manuscript with the Isidore Seville text, he found uh, had uh, something like 30 pages of Greek texts only a tiny bit of which Maya was able to read. And he published a uh, facsimile of one page that is sort of mechanical writings, some material that's sort of related to Archimedes' work on mathematizing centers of gravity problems, things like that. Uh, but, but beyond that, uh, through most of the 19th century, very little of this manuscript was, uh, uh, for the Greek text, was uh, successfully read. Uh, so, and my, my chemicals in this case didn't eat holes in the parchment, but left these very dark uh, patches of, of, uh, of chemical staining, it's dark brown in a color photograph that make it very difficult to read. Uh, the, in, in the late 19th century, the Danish scholar uh, in jail Pyberg discovered uh, that there were 12 pages of a work of Ptolemy's that was already known from Latin translation from the Middle Ages called Analemma. Uh, and this is sundial theory. Uh, and But this was the first time that we had parts of it in the original Greek. And he also found that there were another 12 pages of some other astronomical text, but he couldn't read enough to be able to work out what it was. Uh, so just to give an idea of the problem with reading palimpsests like this one, I'm making a kind of artificial palimpsest in my slide. So here I'm taking uh, an undertext and you know, imagine now that first of all, you wash the ink off as well as you can, leaving sort of faint traces. Then you write a different text over it with a different line spacing so that you get a sort of cycle between lines that you can read of the under text because they fall between the lines of the upper text and other lines that are really hard to read because they coincide with the upper text. So it's sort of a beat pattern between more legible and less legible lines. So this really, it's, that's very hard to deal with. Uh, and then you have Maya's chemicals thrown on top of it. And this is this is sort of like a simulation of the, the state of this manuscript. When I saw it back in the 1980s, I was a graduate student at the time visiting Milan. And I, I wasn't working on this manuscript for my dissertation, but I knew about it and I, I wanted to get some sense of what was the state of it in the 1980s, a hundred years after Heiberg had reported that it was really very difficult to read through this uh, chemical staining. And and it was absolutely true. But at the same time, you could see that, you know, maybe if, if somebody had some way of getting through the chemical staining and, you know, somehow uh, using some trick of light to distinguish the different inks, maybe more could be read. But in the 1980s, there really wasn't something available to do that. Uh, there is now. And I, I've had the, the great joy of working in collaboration with two scholars, Victor Giesenberg and Emmanuel Zing at the Sorbonne, uh, using multispectral imaging on this manuscript to read the 12 previously unidentified pages uh, of this manuscript. There, we're, we're also working on trying to get the analemma text better, um, but the, the really exciting thing is the 12 previously unidentified things. So th those are just a couple of photos of the imaging process which involves using different spectra of light and uh, digital photography, and then playing around with various kinds of combinations of different spectral images to, to get the contrasts as, as good as possible. Uh, so here are just a couple of examples of different things. This is an ultraviolet fluorescent image. And if you, if you look very carefully, you can see upside down is the Latin text and faintly, uh, well, for example, around the middle, you can just see faintly here, there is upright uh, Greek writing. And then here's another that involves a, a combination of different spectra in a black and white or grayscale image. And here the Greek writing is, comes out much more clearly as almost white Greek letters in between the lines sometimes, but sometimes lost through the superposition of the Latin right over the Greek. So, I mean, we can read some of that too, but it's way harder. 
and so we, you know, the transcription. We're still working on this, and uh, and and it, some pages we can read sort of ninety some percent. Some pages we can read only a tiny tiny bit. Um, and I just want to want to say that you know we, we've got a section title we can read, which refers to in, with some terminology about angles, and this was the main key to identifying the thing. Uh, these are angles that are referred to in Ptolemy's Analemma, uh, and they're names that were used by Ptolemy's predecessors and names that Ptolemy says he introduced. And in our text, one of the passages we can read quite well uses the first person to say we have, you know, we mean the writer has introduced this new terminology replacing these old terms. So this is Ptolemy. And the text turns out to be about the this instrument, the meteoroscope that he referred to in the geography. It's a nine ring instrument. Uh, and uh, I'm going to turn off the uh, sharing now uh, so that I can show you. Um, stop share. Okay, I want to show you a reproduction of this that has just been made for me by NYU's uh, lab for 3D printing from the first specs that we're getting out of this text for how it works. You can see it's, it's really complicated. I haven't yet learned how to use it, uh, but I can describe basically what we have here is there's an outer meridian ring and you see it's on a stand. You can also dangle it. Uh, like that little portable sundial. And for certain purposes, it seems it was meant to be dangled that way. But mostly you would set it up on a stand. Uh, I need to put it on a pile of books to make it visible without even holding it. And then you can turn this green inner ring to set to your latitude. So I'm setting it to about 43 degrees, which is about where I am in Nova Scotia right now. Move the camera a little further away so you can see it better. Uh, and so it's now set for my latitude, and I can now set various inner rings that spin in various ways to correspond to something I want to measure or something that I want to uh, observe. And that's about all I can say about it at present, um, but it's a work in progress. And it's really quite exciting to have a new work by Ptolemy uh, that we have 12 pages from. So nothing like the whole work, but enough to get a sense of the character of it and the detail that Ptolemy gives for how this thing operated is much, uh, much higher than the descriptions of instruments in the Almagest. I'm going to stop here because I've run over time, uh, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions people have. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really exciting presentation and I love the 3D model. That's, su that's such an exciting piece of news that we've got something new and physical to work with. Yeah, Unfortunately, I, I, we I, are I, I out of- I love that to get any sense of how you work this thing. You can't do it on paper. <laughs> yeah, it's really fabulous. Um, and, and thank you to our folks in chat who have been following along. Unfortunately, we are, as you said, over time, and so I should let us move on to our next presentation. But Alex, thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, at this point, I am going to hand uh, moderation back over to SASA's own Cassie May. Uh, Cassie, take us away. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm just going to share my screen. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. All right, and we are now starting session two, traditions, flora and fauna. Our present presenters today will be Reverend Tara Woodward and Patrick Grantow. A brief introduction to our session. In this session, our presenters examine the ways in which we connect to and change the natural world around us. Reverend Tara Woodward examines the connection between agriculture and religion in a way that connects Christian scripture to modern agriculture. And Patrick Grantow discusses the ways in which ancient medics used various species of mollusks to cure an assortment of diseases and ailments. How do flora and fauna affect the ways in which humans interact and view the world around them? Uh, we will find out shortly. 
Our first presenter is Tara Woodward. Uh, she'll be presenting Reading Rural, Intersecting Agrarian Theology and Technology with Psalm 65. A bit about Tara. Reverend Tara Woodward has called many places home, the golden grasslands of Nebraska, sunflower fields of Moldova, cornfields of Iowa, and farminary, New Jersey garden at Princeton Seminary, but most recently the rust red dirt of South Africa. Each home has shaped her love and academic interest in place and pedagogy and agrarian readings of sacred texts. Tara has a dual Master of Divinity and Master of Arts in Christian Education and Formation from Princeton Theological Seminary, as well as a Master of Arts from Western Theological Seminary. She is an ordained Minister of Word and Sacrament in the Reformed Church of America. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Tara, and I will stop the share and turn everything over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Cassie. I'm going to quickly share my screen so that you can um, see the website that I'll be presenting. Um, thank you so much uh, for uh, tuning into this particular presentation. Like Cassie said, my name is the Reverend Tara Woodward, and I'm so grateful to be continuing to research and present this topic on a place that's really close, um, not only to home, because I'm actually presenting today from Nebraska, but also um, was my senior thesis research at Princeton. And this has been presented everywhere from Yale's Conference on Theology and Ecology, as well as Society of Biblical Literature, and most recently in July at the International Society of Biblical Literature in Pretoria, South Africa. So it's turned into a multicultural project spanning country, culture, and religious backgrounds. As Cassie inter um, opened up, or if, if you've read the introduction um, uh, to the presentation, I said, I've never seen a bush burn like it did for Moses, but I've seen grassland turn golden as a way to express my own love of landscape and lived theological experience. As I mentioned earlier, I'm currently presenting on a rural ranch in Nebraska. And if Nebraska is the agrarian landscape of my rural upbringing, then Southern Africa uh, specifically has become a uh, second home after an extended field education and now the home of my South African partner. So consider this presentation an ode to how landscape shapes not only context that we're from and our encounters with sacred texts and new contexts, but also our relationship with technology, both from a modern and agrarian, um, ancient agrarian context. If I had begun this presentation with a pedagogical reflection and asked you to name a landscape that you loved, no doubt your imagination might take you to any number of places that are very personal. And this wasn't something I realized um, until I had moved from a rural space uh, to Prince and then to Princeton, which is a bit more of an urban space and started taking classes at the seminary's farminary where students engage in classroom learning literally outside um, and engage in conversations around ecology, sustainability and food justice. And interestingly, it was at the farminary when I first considered how land and landscape are hermeneutical tools that deeply shape how sacred texts are interpreted. So I marvel at how tangible sacred texts like Psalm 65, nine through tens, you visit the land and water it, you drench it abundantly. The river of God is full of water. You establish its grain for thus you establish it, soaking its furrows and settling its ridges. With showers, you melt it, its sproutings you bless. Have become something of a prayer for farmers, ranchers, and those who work in agricultural settings. My original research began with interviewing five North American farmers, and I discovered how tangible these sacred texts are for rural readers in those settings, and how instinctive their connections are between their own agri agricultural context and that of the Hebrew Bible's context, and how their lived experience would be towards these tangibly constructed theologies of sacred scripture in ways that we might not realize. And this was ever so true as I also began researching three other types of farmers um, in South Africa, which is English, Afrikaans, and Black African farmers. As the third most biodiverse country in the world after Brazil and Indonesia, South Africans farming landscape and geography greatly varies across their provincial borders. So while some concerns and issues affect South African farmers across the country, such as security, corruption, and political instability, other experiences and pressures like poor infrastructure, access to water, and weather-related disasters like the floods in KwaZulu-Natal are as diverse as the landscapes and kinds of crops that farmers can produce. 
So while my original research began interviewing five farmers in modern agricultural settings in the US, I also um, interviewed three more farmers in South Africa. And I began researching the agricultural motifs present in Psalm 65 alongside their modern experiences and expressions of agrarianism, which is featured in this website podcast called reading-rural.squarespace.com. Um, and it's featured as these different podcasts with various episodes, as if you can see um, these episodes here. And I played this, this same method uh, to when I researched farming communities in South Africa. So I initially wondered what connections are present between Psalm 65 and a farmer's sense of self, vocation, the divine, their land and animals, and what might we miss in larger conversations of agriculture and hermeneutics without acknowledging their localized perspectives. There's certainly a long tradition of agrarian studies influencing biblical scholarship, but I found that no one has asked farmers how these connect. Most of the field work has not been on the field, but in air conditioned offices, which further distances the field from the farmer, both from the perspective of the land and that of the scholar. So in short, while agrarianism and hermeneutics clearly connect, no one has asked a farmer. And yet from my interviews with farmers, I found intimate connections present between farmers, their land, animals, and scripture, as well as obvious disconnections present with how we read scripture and urban conceptions of modern agriculture. In order to control the factors present in my research, I narrowed it to these three questions. How might rural American and African Christianity read Psalm 65? How do rural readers speak towards tangibly constructed theologies of place? What is the relationship between the ancient context and modern readers have with farming technology? My research method include interviewing questions about the impact that farming has had on their faith and on reading Psalm 65. And the participants included a diversity of ages, locations, and religious experiences, uh, which reveal the particularity of expressions. And these are not only shaped by denominational differences, such as Methodist, Reformed, Evangelical, and Zion Christian Church, which is called ZCC, but also by specific locations, which in the U.S. spanned from uh, Maryland to the Midwest and in South Africa um, across different coastal provinces of KwaZulu-Natal and the high Belt province of Mpumalanga. So for example, notice the different dynamics present between how the young organic farmer in Iowa began farming to that of the retired dairy farmer, which we will hear in this clip. Here's. Yeah, but I was um, still farming too. Yes, but it was more of a hobby. So when we got married, we made the decision together to go into full-time farming and try and make a go at it, try and make it like livable to pay the bills. So for us doing farming full time, it's now been, let's see, 2015, 2016, since 2016. So five years now, this will be year five. Mm -hmm. So um, what was your other questions? Oh, no. One of the things that this particular farmer mentioned is that um, he had to develop his own GPS and be very innovative, which uh, he said that new technologies on a budget, um, uh, which pretty much sums up his farming career. And uh, listen also to this other um, uh, Maryland farmer about his experience farming. The young person couldn't start farming the day the way I started farming mm. because there's nothing left. The, the, the community, the, it, it's, it's not here anymore. The, the the places of business that carried me on 30 days. My father used to tell me I was bankrupt and didn't know it. He said, if everybody would call in a 30-day account, you couldn't pay. And he was right. But these people had faith in me, and they, they carried me along. Gas bills, feed bills, seed bills. Notice these dynamics even compared to the nearly retired Kwasi-Natal Methodist farmer compared to the young Afrikaans reformed farmer and even the Zulus at CC Family Farm. Okay, my I've been farming since 91. And my family started farming in South Africa in 1918. Oh, wow. My grandparents, <clears throat> after the First World War, were bought land from the government, and that's how they started. And then 
my dad started farming in 1969. Okay. And then, and then I came along in 91. Hmm. How did you, did you, did your dad purchase this land or how did you, how did your family? No, he worked for uh, previous bosses. He's been working in this farm. Mm. For long mm. yeah. Did your grandfather have this, or how did you come to this like piece of land here? The, the piece of land. Okay. Um, my father used to work for for for, for this uh, other guy, and then he sold the farm to to the mine. Mm. So they shifted us where we were staying. Then they shifted us this side. Okay. Which folks? Yeah, it's a very independent mindset. Uh, like the Dutch when they came on okay. the ships to Cape Town. Okay. They basically arrived here and yeah, you know the story. They, like any community, they start farming and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, essentially they've got a very independent sort of mindset, maybe you could say. Okay. They don't like to be under rule, actually. <laughs> That's why they left the Cape, came up here. And the only way to make a living was through farming. And so that's sort of been passed down through the generations mostly. And, and yeah, it's, it's pretty much a, it's a fairly common practice. Yeah, and you probably know, everyone knows someone that's farming. And uh, yeah, if you want to talk about lifestyle, it's just, uh, Maybe say it's a calling to some extent. Okay. The sense of calling um, is beautifully echoed in Psalm 65 threes, blessed are the ones you choose. And uh, although Alvain is fluent in Afrikaans and English, most of his academic education was conducted in Afrikaans at the University of Pretoria. So initially he wrote his interview questions and he opened with, I've been farming for seven years now, and the type of farming is a mixture of livestock, sheep and cattle, and planting of maize, which is corn, and soya beans. The way I got into farming is because the opportunity presented itself since my father was farming as a hobby and mentioned that I could take over from him if I wished to do so. I also thought that the lifestyle would suit me and that I could forge a decent living from it. All of these participants would be classified as farmers, and yet their experiences and expressions are particular, not universal. Just as the Hebrew Bible uses specific terms for describing ancient agricultural work and the technologies used, such as the soft image of shepherd in Psalm 20, 23 to the suggest, sexually suggestive image of plower in Psalm 129, so also should scholars in the research of agrarian hermeneutics discuss both ancient and farming farming and all of its particularities and expressions. Farming and agriculture are not universal, but dependent upon particular context. A cattle, sheep, and grain farmer in the lower bushfeld might share similarities with an avocado and macadamia nut farmer in near subtropical Durban, and yet there's distinct cultural and contextual differences present. And that might seem obvious when I presented some of this research in South Africa with a place that has nothing short of 12 officially recognized languages, but that's less ob obvious um, in a monolingual farming context, such as in the United States, the UK, or even parts of France. These differences are true even in their descriptions. To offer comparison, while most of the farmers interviewed in the US were small to medium scale, who usually focused on one or two crops or livestock, these similar scales of farming in a South African context are far more diversified. Um, they are not just dairy, grain, or one variety of organic vegetable farming, but rather they use technologies to diversify between the cattle, sheep, and grain, or their family's farm between avocado, macadamia nut, or formerly sugarcane in order to mitigate risk. To farm in South Africa and in the US and in the United States means to be highly adaptable to changing, quickly changing conditions such as political instability, particularly in South Africa, climate change and land appropriation laws, which all highlight the complex issues that farmers face. And these differences are most apparent uh, when I initially shared some of my research findings with South African pastors whose congregations are filled with Zulu and Afrikaans farmers and farm workers, especially since they highlighted Psalm 65-7's turmoil of the nations that resonated with their increasing concerns of security, land claims, and widespread violence in the country. 
particularly this is also present in uh, one of the Iowa um, farmers' description of not just creation as they read, but also suffering. Um, especially people coming from urban areas, there's this ideology about oh, yeah. organic or getting your stuff at the farmer's market. Like it's nostalgic, it's sweet, it's, there's like, yeah, this nostalgic connection. And sometimes I feel like, you know, we have those philosophical feelings about God and us and the land. And then sometimes in the day-to-day -day operations, it's tough. Sometimes it's miserable. We don't do animals, but like when you do animals, you see death, you see sickness. I mean, we see sickness in our crops. I mean, you just have problems and it's hard work and it doesn't work out the way you planned. And so like, I feel like being, creation. yeah, you see the fall, you see sin and corruption and it's not like this perfect world. I feel like there is this ideology that creation is like, if you connect to creation, you're getting closer to your spiritual side or something. Um, but it's like creation isn't the end. You know, there is, there is like, um, I'm getting lost in what, like how to express myself. It's just like, there is suffering too. And when that was also, this also present in Alvin's um, description of a recent um, experience that he had, which caused him actually now to, to get out of farming. Okay. Yeah, like that, there's a set, right? Like there's a sense of injustice like that comes with this, you know, with somebody having um, taken something that's not theirs. Do you find that some of those kind of, when you read scripture and you hear about like, you know, injustice or someone often the Psalms kind of feeling like something's being taken from them that that's been um, sadly, because if nobody wants something taken away from them, like enlivened in a different way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Because of that theft, I thought, well, I've been thinking about leaving the phone for a long time. A little difficult to hear in this particular part because I was also recording and typing at the same time. But he also said that reading the book of Job is easier to empathize with because he had 7,000 heads of sheep and he lost it all in a day. I lost 22 cows with calves the other day, and it makes you think about how he would have felt. Because of that theft, I was thinking about leaving the farm for a long time and thought this is my cue to start packing up. If it was my land, I would have played it differently, but it's only a year to your contract, so it's hard to want to do any investment. The theft is infuriating, the weather and the lack of profits and it's chaotic and you never can really relax because if you hear a cow mooing, then you have to get up and go look, meaning that uh, a sense of security concerns. Um, uh, however, the biblical studies research field of Psalm 65 have often neglected these particularities with interpretations um, that assume not only a universal experience in farming in both ancient uh, Israel and modern agrarianism, but also a ideal utopian one. In our article, God the Farmer, Dr. Ellen Davis from Duke wrote that this farmer poet in Psalm 65, as I imagine her or him, writes a verbal icon of God, the maker of heaven and earth, driving home at the end of a long day in the fields, the wagon so loaded that the grain is falling over the sides and God's wagon tracks drip rich richness. But compared the various stories that we've heard, such as the young Afrikaans farmer Alvain and Abel's family, or Simon, whose experience of farming included seasons of significant pressures, mining threats, security concerns, and economic instability. You grow like your own food, like you have a garden here, or do you typically buy your groceries in town? Or no, we don't have a garden. Okay. I didn't know if it was like you could grow gardens here or what people did. I think we can't because of okay. the mines. Oh, okay. The mines are closed, and you see that uh, it's going to be, uh, there's something going to happen to the, to the, the planet. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is that like, does the mine really negatively influence like the farm in terms of like 
it does the soil isn't as healthy or it just feels like you can't grow food because it won't be as good. Um, yeah, we are planning. That, sorry, of, I don't know if that's no, too we are planning of, of, of adding the guard, but in the next uh, yes, we're just looking at the environment. Okay. Of, yeah. Because the, the mine, it. like like the pollution. The pollution. Okay. Yeah, that's the problem. It's, that's what it's just like right comes. there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. So when it's windy, see everything oh, comes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does um can you drink like the water here, or do you have to purchase water in town and bring it here because of the mine? We are struggling with water. Right? Okay. Yeah, we even um go in in your farm. There's one to, 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 to get water to get water, yeah, and then put it using our tank. We struggle with water, but um, after hearing both Alvain and Abel's story, um, and doing a little bit of math, uh, because the Villacasi's farm is, is next to Alvain's farm, which it's about a less than a kilometer away, um, it's likely that they both lost cattle due to a syndicate on the same night. Alvain lost 22 and Abel 17, which underscores that both black and white farmers, especially in South Africa, face similar significant setbacks. The economic climate and political factors of their situation, which include crop failure and significant safety concerns, all, all quite frankly resist the dripping romantic richness of farming that Dr. Davis suggests. Moreover, while Psalm 65 evokes agricultural imagery in its praise of divine act activity, as many Hebrew Bible scholars and commentators suggest, none of them personified images of God as farmer in this passage, um, but rather they resisted the sense of divine personification. Um, none of the farmers, either in the US or South Africa, personified God as a farmer, um, but rather expressed their experience to call for the created world. And this Sacred reading is beautifully expressed in an agriculture journal that a premier South African agriculture publication called Farmers Weekly just published. And it said, I consume consciously and with appreciation. When food spoils in my home, I throw it away with a heavy heart. And not just because of the money wasted, but because of the water, energy, and effort that I've allowed to go to waste by not using the product. I sit down to a meal thankful for the hands of farm workers and farmers who worked very hard in often uncomfortable conditions to produce the food. I have developed a reverence for earthworms and bees to the point where I feel like crying when I see a drowned bee in a swimming pool. But rather, South African and American rural readings resist this sort of human-centric view of farming. Instead, the readings of Psalm 65 pay more attention to the voice of the created world present and to their own contest, which sort of offers a different orientation towards a close reading. This is apparent when Alvin said that um, when he reads the story of Job, he reads with more empathy. The way that farmers might construct their theology comes from practice and imagination in a physical place and community, and it's always in conversation with creation and the creator. Farmers depend on the non-human world, which situates them as participants and students alongside the activity and agency of the soil and the animals under their care. Farming means you not only have to learn about the livestock and all of the biological critters in the soil, as the Iowa farmer said, but it also means that the non-human world are active participants in liberation, as Simon expressed in how he reads the Exodus passage, which he said that the Bible helps him uh, when it comes to learning how to care for animals because the Israelites didn't leave them behind during the Exodus. Farming in this way, um, as the young organic farmer um, said, means that. It, thinking about it, technology is generally neutral. So like, it's how you use technology, because if you think about it, we have people who are using genetically modified, which is a technology. Um, and then you have people like me who are using technology, but it's just to drive a tractor or do something like that. So like, I just want to interrupt to say, I don't know. Um, in terms of technology, uh, it, what was interesting about the farmers is that they all resisted any impulse to credit the verdant valleys of Psalm 65 to human product progress, but expressed it as a gift of God. And interestingly, they also expressed a wide range of opinions to the role of technology in farming from neutral to negative or um, to ambivalent or even positive. Um, Jaron, which is the Iowa farmer, particularly expressed that um, even if you look at, for example, Amish farmers in Pennsylvania, they use technologies that are just older. Their carriages and wheels are still technology. It's just a different kind of technology. And when they related um, 
some of the more negative effects of technology. They defined chemicals, especially as an organic farmer, as sort of a man-made way of creating or improving or sometimes worsening something. And they personally feel like chemicals are a technology that doesn't necessarily care for the creation of God's soil and land. And it takes a lot to sort of combat them um, because it gets rid of the weeds and it's a detriment to the soil biology. When it comes to soil biology, uh, he also expressed this. For Jaron, especially focusing on the biology. Oh, okay, sorry, I think I will wrap up in just a second. Of the soil, so we have to learn more about biology and like you kind of have to become your own biologist. Good soil, like good soil health. So it's interesting. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Learn about about all the the livestock that we actually own, all the little critters little in the soil, microbes. the microbes and all that. Yeah, they're always in the bio biological side of of the organic farming and stuff. They're always talking about all your making sure your livestock are healthy when you're, even when you're row crops, because it's all. When it comes to a modern sense of technology, you can see that positive sense, whereas in the case of Abel, um, a mine and a negative sense of technology affects their water quality and their uh, soil and even their ability to grow food for their family. So in conclusion, when farmers and scholars read Psalm 65 together, this sort of interdisciplinary way of reading both tests and confirms assumptions made in how we engage with sacred agrarian texts and the sort of multivalent view of technology used. I hope in this um, approach, it will contribute to larger conversations about changing agricultural spaces across South Africa and the United States, as well as the decreased use of the Hebrew Bible in congregational settings. How might listening to and engaging with these perspectives from both the field of biblical studies and that of the farm assist us in creating rural American and African readings of the Old Testament that highlight agricultural motifs and how might this play con in conversations about congregational care um, of and in rural American African religious communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tara, for sharing that and as well as for sharing your time and your research. It's much appreciated. I do think in the interest of time, we need to move on to the next presentation, but thank you to everyone watching along as well. I'm just going to share my screen again and do a brief intro for our next presenter. Okay, now our next presenter uh, is Patrick Grancow who will be talking about ancient medicinal uses of selected marine mollusks in the light of literary sources. A little bit about Patrick. Uh, he is a student uh, of history at the uh, Faculty of Philosophy and History in the University of Lotz. I do apologize if I mispronounced that. In 2020 to 2022, he was the secretary of the Student Academic Association of Historians of the University of Lotz. And currently, for the term 2022 to 2023, uh, he is the vice president of that association. In 2022, Patrick organized the student doctoral conference, Crimes in History. Uh, he wrote an article called The Pedagogical Character of Pederastry in, the ancient, in Ancient Greece in the Light of Selected Examples of Gifts, published in the University of Lotz Press in 2021. And again in 2022, he wrote and defended a bachelor's thesis, The Beliefs of the Ancient Egyptians, as seen by Diodorus Sicilian in Bibliotheca Historica. Patrick is currently writing a master's thesis uh, titled Aquatic Fauna in the Culinary Art and Medicine of Antiquity in the Light of Select Literary Sources. His current research interests include the reception of antiquity through the ages, the reception of Egyptian civilization in Greek and Roman historiography, and social issues in the Greco-Roman world, with a particular emphasis on the history of medicine and gastronomy. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn everything over to Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, just a, a second to... Uh, share my screen. 
Absolutely, take your time. Okay. I, I hope you can see uh, my screen, my presentation. Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, and uh, before I begin, uh, I begin, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference uh, for allowing me to appear today. Uh, and today I would like to present to you some of the results of my research on ancient medicine. Uh, and the purpose of the paper uh, which I will present today is to analyze the importance of marine mollusks in ancient medicine uh, in the uh, light of the uh, literary sources. Um, and uh, the basis uh, for my analysis uh, of today's topic uh, was the works of mainly several ancient authors, uh, for example, Hippocrates, Dioscorides, uh, Galen and Pliny the Elder. Uh, the first three authors uh, were notable medics and authors of medical works in which we can find, among other things, recipes for uh, medicines. Uh, and uh, Pliny, uh, although he was not a medic, uh, he devoted several books in his natural history, in Latin uh, Naturalis Historia, uh, to medicines. And in the 32nd uh, book, he describes uh, the use usage of marine animals in uh, medicine. Uh, during uh, my research, I have also uh, used texts by Celsus, Xenocrates of Aphrodisia, uh, uh, Athenaeus of Naucratis, and uh, fragments of Treaty uh, uh, Kyranides. And uh, what exactly uh, will I deal with today? Uh, mollusks uh, referred to in ancient Greece by the term malachia uh, are the second most numerous uh, types of animals after arthropods, uh, comprising thousands, thousands of species. Uh, and due to such many species of marine mollusks, it is impossible to discuss the use of each uh, of these animals in ancient medicine. Uh, and uh, because of that, I uh, selected few species using the uh, and using the these examples uh, of I will show I will try show how mollusks were used in ancient medicine uh, and the choice of uh, animals uh, I uh, selected was not random I have tried to choose such animals that are mentioned very often in ancient medic medical texts uh, as well uh, as such animals that I believe are represent uh, representative uh, of each cluster. Uh, and uh, of cephalopods, I will uh, tell you about the cuttlefish, um, uh, of the clams, uh, uh, bivalvia in Latin, uh, I will I choose the oyster and of the snails, uh, I will tell you about murex uh, snails. Um, and uh, I would like to start my presentation with cephalopods. Uh, one of the cephalopods uh, whose use, uh, usage in the ancient medicine uh, can be confirmed based on surviving literary sources is cuttlefish. Uh, based on the analysis of medical texts, it can be concluded that among cephalopods, this is the animal that was most often used medically. Uh, ancient authors distinguished uh, between different species of cuttlefish, giving them different names, and I want to uh, explain that to you. Uh, the term sepia, used in both Greek and Latin texts, uh, refers to the most common species in the Mediterranean, the common cuttlefish, sepia officinalis in Latin. Uh, the term was also a general name applied to cuttlefish, and uh, in turn the Greek, uh, Greek term sepidion and the Latin sepiola referred to the species sepiola rondeletti, and was also a general word used uh, to, to refer a small cuttlefish. And uh, the part of the cuttlefish most often mentioned in the sources that was used during treatment uh, is the cuttlefish bone in Latin os sepia. Uh, 
Uh, this limestone plate, uh, which is the most important part of the cuttlefish's internal skeleton, could be used both in the treatment of various diseases and for hygienic activities. Uh, as for therapeutical uh, and pharmaco pharmacological use of cuttlefish bone, Pliny the Elder, Dioscorides, as well as Galen, point uh, to its usefulness in treating skin diseases. As Galen writes, uh, cuttlefish bone, when burned, is suitable for removing alphos. This is a type of non-infectious leprosy. Uh, dark uh, and also removes uh, dark growth on the skin, navy and impetigo. Uh, on the other hand, in uh, other uh, book, Galen uh, points out the vital, vital um, importance of cuttlefish bone in treatment of profound alopecia areata. Uh, in that case, uh, as he indicates, a spot on the skin should be treated with vinegar and then the area should be wrapped with a cuttlefish bone. Um, Pliny, on the other hand, indicates that cuttlefish bone can effectively help remove freckles, sores on the skin or help recover hair in a scabious infected area. Uh, Dioscorides also add, da, adds dandruff uh, to the above diseases treated with cuttlefish bone. Uh, in addition uh, to the derm dermatological diseases, the authors point to the use of, bone, uh, of cuttlefish bone to treat eye diseases. According to Pliny, uh, powdered uh, cuttlefish bone with the addition of breast milk were to help uh, with swollen and red eyes. Galen indicates the use of cuttlefish bones in the treatment of uh, endophil endophthalmitis, uh, among uh, other things. Uh, and for this purpose, it was necessary to add honey to, to the powdered bone, and then the resulting mass was burned, crushed once again, and so obtained uh, ash wrapped into uh, endophthalmitis. Uh, of other exemplary uses of cuttlefish bones uh, in the therapeutic process, Hippocrates uh, gives a recipe for a remedy to be used for uterine prolapse. Uh, to do this, the crushed uh, cuttlefish bone had to be mixed with wine, applied to, uh, for example, wool, and placed uh, on genitalia. Uh, what is interesting, the cuttlefish bone could also have been used for hygienic or grooming purposes. Uh, Galen indicates several such uses of cuttlefish bones. Among others, uh, it was supposed to be suitable for cleaning teeth. Uh, he also indicates the use of powdered uh, cuttlefish bones by poor people as a remedy that should lead to the elimination of hair. Uh, in addition uh, to the cuttlefish bone, ancient medics also used other parts of cuttlefish uh, in therapeutic practices, but uh, they were not as popular as cuttlefish bone. Uh, meat, eggs and cuttlefish ink uh, were used during treatment. Uh, meat is, uh, was mentioned several times in men is recommended for uh, women who are pregnant or have given birth. Hippocrates, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Hippocrates, for example, recommends that the woman after childbirth uh, consume cooked, cooked or roasted garlic and roasted small octopus and cuttlefish. On the other hand, Athenaeus uh, states that uh, cuttlefish meat is good for the uh, intel. Uh, intestines, uh, the juice obtained from cooking the meat delayed the blood and facilitate exertion if you have hemorrhoids. Uh, as indicated by Pliny the Elder, uh, cuttlefish eggs have diuretic properties and remove phlegm from kidneys. Thus, uh, they were supposed to cleanse the kidneys and help treat urinary diseases. Eggs are also mentioned by Hippocrates in the context of treating uh, gynecological ailments. For example, in order to extract placenta after childbirth, the patient was supposed to drink a mixture included 15 sepia eggs. Uh, as for the use of sepia ink in medicine, on the other hand, the number of passages is very small. 
both Dioscorides and Celsus uh, mention that the ink has laxative properties. Uh, and it can be assumed that it was recommended by medics for consumption in case of need to get rid of bad juices in the pa uh, from a patient. Later authors such as Paul of Egina and Alexander of Tralles, 6th, uh, 7th century AD, also mentioned the use of ink to treat skin or eye diseases. Uh, among the various snails that ancient authors list among uh, medicinal products, one encounters especially often the animals called porphyra in Greek. Uh, under this term, whose Latin equivalent was murex, pur purpura, sometimes also bucinum or pelagia, uh, is hidden not one but several different species of snails, among which uh, should be mentioned hexaplex trunculus, thais hemastoma or bolinus Brandaris. Uh, although these snails is in antiquity were primarily known for their use in the production of dye, authors such as Hippocrates, Galen, Dioscorides, and others also point uh, to its possible use in medicine. Uh, all parts uh, of these snails, both meat and shell, were used for medicinal purposes. The meat of purple shell uh, was mainly used to treat gastric problems. According to Aphineus, cooked feet of murex were said, uh, were said to be good for stomach ailments, which is also confirmed by Celsus in his work on medicine. Hippocrates indicates that the broth from the meat of these animals is supposed to have laxative properties. A similar opinion is presented by Galen in his work De Alimentorum Facultatibus. Uh, also, the author of the treaty Chiranides described the beneficial effects of murex on the digestive system as he states, drinking soap made from them calms the stomach and improves intense intentional function. Xenocrates of Aphrodisias, a Greek physician, uh, indicates that a fragment of body uh, of snails, the hippobranchial gland, uh, the gland responsible for producing mucus uh, used in ancient times to produce uh, dye, uh, has a number of positive uh, therapeutic properties that could be used uh, in the course of treating diseases of the digestive system. Uh, according to this author, hippobranchial gland is supposed to have laxative and diuretic properties. It is also supposed to increase the production of salvia and sweat. However, a user needs to be careful with the amount of meat of these snails consumed, as uh, excess could cause diarrhea and vomiting. Uh, in the treaty Chiranides, the author also indicates that the meat of murex snails was also supposed to help with headaches and remove migraines. For this purpose, it was necessary to apply the raw meat of the snail itself to the forehead or crush the meat of snails, mix with the mare and only so obtain sub substance applied to the painful place. However, the most mentioned part of murex snails uh, in medis, uh, medical sources is the shell. It was used to treat several ailments. For this purpose, the shell was usually roasted or ground and often liquid products such as wine or honey uh, were added to the powder uh, so prepared. Dioscorides, describing the me medical properties of murex in his work, uh, De Materia Medica, states that burnt murex shells have drying and cleansing properties and uh, can be used in cleansing and treating wounds. A similar use uh, is hinted uh, by Celsus, uh, where he provides a, precip, a recipe for a cure for an abscess in which he decalcinated murex shell is an ingredient. Uh, also, uh, in Galen's work, uh, we can find a fragment testifying to the use of the drying and cleansing properties of murex shells in the treatment of wounds. Uh, 
Galen, in his work De Compositione Medicamentorum per Genera, conveys a recipe for white patches, which are used to treat ulcers or suburenting wounds. Uh, such patches included, uh, for example, zinc oxide, lime, uh, hemimorphite, and the burned shells of several clams and snails, including murex shells. Uh, the shells of murex were also said to he have anti-inflammatory effects. This may be confirmed by Pliny the Elder, according to whom the ash of murex shells with the addition of honey was supposed to be a good remedy for swelling of uh, the par per uh, parotid glands. Uh, in addition, according to the same author, the same mixture, honey with the addition of ashed murex shells, uh, was also said to treat female breast pain. Uh, authors of medical texts also point to the use of powdered murex shells to treat dermatological diseases. According to the author of the work Historia Naturalia, a mixture of honey and ashed murex shells was supposed to be a good remedy for sores on the head. Uh, in turn, the ashes murex shells themselves were supposed to help remove spots from woman's face. Pliny also indicates the use of burned shells in anti-wrinkle treatment. Uh, Dioscorides in the Materia Medica uh, also mentioned the medicinal use of the murex operculum. Uh, this part of the snail, boiled in oil and used as an ointment, was said to prevent hair loss. Hair loss. Uh, on the other hand, operculum, uh, mixed with vinegar, was supposed to reduce swelling of the spleen, and when burned, uh, and when burned, was supposed to help women suffering from uterine suffocation, as well as help remove the placenta after childbirth. Uh, Unfortunately, in the case of some of medical texts, it is impossible to determine which parts of the murex was used for medicinal purposes. Uh, an example of such a text is a passus from Pliny the Elder, where the author mentions that purpura quoque contra venena prosunt. Nevertheless, the author indicates that murex uh, could also be used as an antidote to poisons. Unfortunately, he does not mention which poison poisons, uh, but it uh, can be assumed that this refers to poisoning caused by uh, sea hair. What is interesting, purple shell was uh, also used uh, for hygienic purposes. Dioscorides mentioned the use of burnt murex shells to clean teeth. Uh, and the last uh, one, oyster. The last animal I would like to tell you about today during the paper is oyster. Uh, the Greek term ostreon and the Latin ostrea uh, were used to describe the species that is most found in the Mediterranean, ostrea edulis, European flat oyster, uh, and allied spe species. This mollusk, which belongs to the cluster of bivalves and the oyster family, was widely used in the daily life of ancient Greeks and Romans. Considered a special delicacy, it was consumed as early as Mycenaean Greece. Uh, but what is interesting, this animal rather associated with gastronomy also found several uses in antiquity in uh, medicine. Uh, all, parts, uh, although all parts of the oyster were used for medicinal purposes, as in the case of the previously discussed animals, the oyster shell appears most often in the sauces. It was especially often used to treat ulcers, wounds, and the skin diseases. As Pliny mentions, uh, ashed oyster shell combined with old urine uh, were used to treat all types of ulcers and uh, in the treatment of body rashes of infants. On the other hand, oyster shell ash uh, mixed with water was supposed to treat sores on the head and smooth the skin of women. The practice, the practice of using ashed oyster shells to treat ulcers is also indicated by, uh, by Oribasius, a physician from the 4th century AD, as well uh, as Galen. 
Uh, in, he, uh, in work of Galen, the Simplicium Medicamentorum uh, Temperamentis ac Facultatibus, um, Galen includes uh, burnt oyster shell among the remedies to heal wounds. For this purpose, the wound had to be sprinkled with oyster shell ash. Uh, According to Pliny, powdered oyster shell combined with vinegar was supposed to cure itching and eruptions, uh, and uh, in turn, burn uh, wounds should be sprinkled with oyster shell uh, ash alone, uh, as said Pliny. Uh, in addition to treating skin diseases, oyster shells were also used to treat other conditions. Uh, according to Pliny, oyster shell ash uh, mixed with honey was supposed to relieve uvula and tonsil ailments. Um, the same mixture was supposed to help with swollen parotid glands, superficial abscesses, or breast sclerosis. Uh, according to Galen, ash from burnt oyster shell was also supposed to help with gum diseases. Uh, as an aside, it should be added that oyster shell as well as murex shells uh, were also used for hygienic purposes and uh, as said Pliny, uh, ash from oyster shells is a, was a popular remedy for cleaning teeth. The meat of the oyster was also used in medicine, which was either used raw uh, for this purpose or first cooked. As Pliny points out, the meat of these uh, animals uh, has several positive properties that help with ailments related to the digestive system. According to him, oysters are specific for settling the stomach, they restore lost appetite, and they are also a mild laxative. Uh, in addition, oyster meat cooked in honey wine is supposed to have a beneficial effect on the urinary system, cleansing the alkerated bladder and curing tenesmus. According to Pliny, meat from cooked unopened oyster was supposed to have a miraculous effect on colds. On the other hand, raw previously smashed meat was supposed to cure sores on and food sores. Most likely, the smashed meat should have been applied to such a piece of skin. Uh, according to Pliny, oysters were also supposed to act as an antidote to the sea hare. Uh, sea hare uh, was a, uh, is a sea snail uh, of the Aplysia depilans species. Um, and uh, as said, Pliny, uh, oysters uh, was antidote to sea hare poison. Uh, but uh, he does not does not specify which specific part of the animal was supposed to have such properties. But we may assume that uh, oyster meat uh, had to be consumed to uh, uh, to deal with uh, sea hair poison. Uh, in addition, Alec Alex, a fermented paste made from fish seafood or sludge left uh, over from the production of garum, was product, uh, produced we, in ancient times from, among other things, oyster meat. And Alec uh, was said to have a few medicinal properties. It was supposed to help with itchy skin. It was also supposed to be good for skin wounds from dog bites uh, and uh, be anti to see Draco Venom. Uh, as, uh, and uh, as you uh, could see during my paper, mollusks undoubtedly were used in ancient medicine as uh, evidenced by quite several surviving passages. Analyzing the works of authors such as Hippocrates, Xenocrates, Dioscorides, Pliny, Galen, and Oribasius, it can be seen that mollusks were mainly used during the treatment of diseases of the uh, genitounitary system, uh, digestive system, skin diseases, eye uh, diseases, injuries, as well as during pregnancy, labor, and postpartum. Of course, the ex extent of, uh, to which individual mollusks were used in ancient medicine uh, was varied. The three species, uh, species presented today were particularly often used in pharmacotherapy. However, among mollusks, there are also species uh, whose importance in medicine was minor, for example, squid. 
or octopus. Uh, for uh, medicinal purposes, ancient medics used virtually all parts of mollusks, meat, shells, and other parts. Uh, in the case of clams and snails, the most mentioned part of the animal used for therapeutic purposes was the shell, which usually had to be burned on the, or gr grinded into powder. The powder thus uh, obtained could be uh, used on its own, for example, sprinkled uh, on a wound, or by combining it with some liquid, such as vinegar or honey, uh, to create a suspension, then uh, applied to the affected area. The meat of mollusks uh, was also used in medicine uh, and could be baked, boiled, or a broth could be made from it. Often, mollusks meat uh, occurred as a part of medicinal diet or was consumed to produce an effect desired by the doctor, uh, such as laxation or urine, uh, urine production. This may not come as, as a surprise, uh, as in ancient times, mollusks meat, uh, mollusk meat uh, was prized for its nutritional value, which was invaluable uh, in the treatment of diseases. Meat could also serve as antidote to poisons. In case of other diseases, other body parts of marine animals pro, uh, or products made by them, such as ink and cuttlefish eggs, were also used, mainly also as a part of a medicinal diet or as an ingredient uh, on, in medicine. So, we, uh, as you can see, marine mollusks were well known for their medicinal properties uh, and were uh, willingly uh, used in the medicine, medical practice of the ancient Greek uh, and Romans uh, through uh, antiquity, as evidenced by texts uh, written from 4th uh, century BC to the 5th century AD. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Hello, and thank you for that wonderful presentation, Patrick. It was very informative, and I know it got our chat going, so plenty of people also found it interpret, uh, <laughs> informative. Now, I am in the interest of time going to move on to our second keynote speaker. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, uh, and our second keynote speaker uh, is Dr. Jeffrey Moser, whose presentation is titled Making Antiquity in Medieval China. Now, before I tell you a bit about Dr. Moser, I just want to remind everyone that we do have a fundraiser going up on our website, savingshipstudies.org forward slash virtual conference to get there. Uh, the, we do have a raffle going right now. It's $25 a ticket five for 100 if you are so generous and so inclined. The prize of this is a Sasa swag bag. Definitely check it out if you're at all interested. But moving on for now, Dr. Moser. Uh, Professor Moser's research attends broadly to the conceptual and material processes whereby past things are made present with particular attention to the ways in which those processes intersect in the artistic practices and scholarly uh, technology in medieval China. He is also interested in the problem of historical agency and the interconnections between ecological, technological, and perceptual change over time. Having studied in Taiwan, Japan, and the United States, and taught in China and Quebec before coming to Brown, Uni Brown University, Professor Moser endeavors to integrate the perspectives of diverse scholarly traditions in his teaching, he teaches an introductory course on the arts of Asia organized around the biographies of exemplary objects, as well as a wide range of other surveys and seminars. He also advises graduate students in all fields of Chinese art history. It's wonderful to have you with us today, Dr. Moser. I'm going to stop my screen share now and hand everything over to you. Thank you very much, Cassie, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, and I also want to begin by, by thanking David and Anne and everyone who's been involved in organizing uh, this conference today for giving me the opportunity to speak here. It's 
It's really a pleasure to get to know a little bit more about um, the Save Ancient Studies Alliance and to get a stronger sense of the incredible diversity of work that people are out in the field are doing and, uh, and to just sort of see the strength of the collective effort that you're all making to, uh, to sustain the study of the ancient world today. So that's been very inspiring so far. Um, and, and I thought that the way I might start my sort of modest contribution to the conversation here today is um, by asking a couple overarching questions. And then I'll get into my formal, my formal presentation. Um, and I guess the sort of overarching question I have um, to start with is one that's sort of nurtured by the recognition that among, among the various papers and the topics that we're seeing represented here today, um, things from China don't have a particularly prominent place. Uh, most of the people I understand presenting today and, and might, who might actually, people who might actually, how they might actually think of ancient studies as something that's focused perhaps largely around the Mediterranean and, and, and the Near East. And, and so what would it mean to sort of cast the net of ancient studies a bit more broadly, a bit more widely, as, as I think this conference is seeking to do? What does China, and specifically the ancient Chinese past, have to offer ancient studies? Um, why include China and the study of the ancient Chinese past in a discussion about saving ancient studies? Um, if the theme of our conversation today is opening the ancient world, what might it mean to open the ancient world to the study of the distant Chinese past? And how might that stimulate change in the wider conversations that we're having? Now, thinking from the perspective of ancient China, or more specifically, from the perspective of the study of the ancient past in China, is, to my mind, something that raises several questions that I think are relevant to the wider conversations we're having here over these two days. So the first question is, uh, does, a simple one, is, does China have ancient studies? And if so, when did these ancient studies begin? Now, by this, I mean not the question of when is the ancient period in, Chinese, in China, as in what are the centuries, the appropriate centuries that we might think of as China's ancient period, um, but rather, when did the scholarly study of the ancient past as such begin? Is ancient studies a modern phenomenon in China? Is it an early modern phenomenon? Or is it itself an ancient phenomenon? As in, did people in ancient China themselves look to people who were still more ancient than them in an effort to determine how to move forward in their present? Now, the second question I have to ask is, how is the study of ancient China relevant to the present challenge of saving ancient studies? Does the study of ancient China need saving, for example? Is ancient studies also imperiled in China? Or is saving ancient studies a more local concern, one that is particularly pertinent to American academia in its present, and some might say ever-present, moment of crisis? While there are many who have, and I think would continue to argue, that the study of the ancient past in China remains in certain ways trapped within nationalistic paradigms. At least we can say that the commitment of the nation state to mobilizing the ancient past in the production of modern contemporary identity um, has meant that there's been considerable amounts of state support and sponsorship for scholars and students interested in studying the ancient past. Um, I think that where I'd like to focus my conversation and our conversation here today is less on the question of how the ancient past is being studied and utilized politically today in China, and more on the question of what the study of the ancient Chinese past can do for ancient studies a little bit closer to home, uh, largely here in the United States. Um, my sense of the imperiled nature of ancient studies at the center of our conversation here today has much more to do with the circumstances of the contemporary labor market here in the United States and the state of field at our universities. Now, in this context, the concerns I expect are pretty well known to many of you. Um, the sense that ancient studies is threatened by university administrators and wider publics who are ever more focused on practical career-oriented training. The sense that ancient studies is threatened by a market-based approach to education, which has a tendency to dissuade students from devoting the years of study that are necessary to develop the capacity in the ancient languages necessary to explore ancient topics. And more generally, the sense that ancient studies is threatened by a sense that they lack relevance to the problems of the contemporary world. Now, as I understand it, 
The Save Ancient Studies Alliance was created specifically because of pervasive precarity on the part of those who seek to study the ancient world, both professionally and independently. And our gathering here today is not simply an effort to share research findings about the ancient world, but also, as we just heard from that fundraising call, a more focused, even political effort to advocate for greater investment in the study of the ancient world. So the first thing that we might emphasize is that this sense of precarity motivating our present gathering has at least two aspects. On one hand, there is the sense that there is something that is known, or at least something that could be known, um, a critical archive, if you will, that is in imminent danger of being lost. Now, mostly I mean this fear of loss, not in the sense of an ancient building or a museum that because of warfare or neglect or deliberate iconoclasm is literally in danger of being wiped from the face of the earth. Although this is of course, you know, a major concern at cultural heritage sites around the world. Um, today, what I'm referring to is um, somewhat the more diffuse fear that uh, the archive, that, um, that, that the archive from which we derive our knowledge of the ancient past um, uh, might survive, but that its contents might become unintelligible to us because of the skills necessary to decipher and to understand that archive are not being successfully transmitted from teacher to student. In other words, that our collective ability to grapple directly with the traces of the past is declining and that we are forced more and more to understand those traces through translation or through outdated secondary scholarship and so forth, rather than being able to grapple with the complexity of those traces directly on their own terms. Now this concern about our failure to transmit the skills and knowledge of scholars of the past to future generations um, is linked to the second aspect of the sense of precarity that I think brings many of us here today. What the very fact of save, the Save Ancient Studies Alliance makes clear is that this fear about the transmission of skills does not in any way arise from a dearth of individuals who are interested in seeking to develop those skills. To the contrary, as you all know, there are plenty of people listening right now who either have or are in the midst of developing precisely the skills that one needs to engage in a serious and rigorous way in the pursuit of ancient studies. What we are confronting rather, what is missing rather, is the sustained institutional support that is necessary to support all those who seek to study the ancient past in a substantive way. What we are confronting is the reality that the jobs in which one can pursue ancient studies are increasingly insecure and characterized by adjunct fixed term appointments. Uh, more generally, I think it's safe to say that as the Save Ancient Studies Alliance demonstrates, many of those pursuing ancient studies do so in spite of, not because of, the expectations of their employers, working within a greater community of intellectual inquiry, but outside the formal auspices of the academy. Now, while the circumstances that have generated the Save Ancient Studies Alliance are particular, I think, to our present moment, the connection, this connection between professional precarity and a kind of desire to study antiquity is actually, I'd like to argue, not. And it's this connection, I think, in an interesting way that helps us see how the questions of when ancient studies began in China and the question of what the study of China can do to save ancient studies might actually be connected to one another. So how might we answer the question? And this is, so this is what I'm gonna explore over the course of the next 30 minutes or so. And the way I'm gonna explore it is first of all, by, by sort of looking at how we might begin to answer the question of when ancient studies began in China. And I'm gonna share my screen. Great. I'll just check the chat here, excuse me, just to make sure that's working, yep. Okay. So over the course of the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna propose uh, three different ways of answering this question, of uh, this answering this question of when ancient studies began. Um, and um, 
And in so doing, I'm going I'm to do this in the context of this talk that I've, 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 I've given the title of Making Antiquity in Medieval China. Now, in the process, we're going to learn something. We're going to learn two things, actually. First of all, we're going to learn about the transmission of knowledge about the ancient past in China through time, how knowledge about the ancient past was transmitted over time down to the present. And second, we're going to learn a little bit about the historical development of the methods, and indeed, we might even say the technologies that scholars at different times used to create knowledge about the ancient past. So to get the ball rolling, one simple way to answer the question of when ancient studies began is to study, is to say that the study of the ancients has been there from the beginning, uh, that the study of the ancients in China is itself an ancient practice. And we see clear evidence of this. Let me see if I can advance my screen there. Yep. Um, uh, in the writings of Confucius himself, which date to the 6th century BCE, with some complexities and debates, which I won't bore you with today. Um, Confucius wrote, I am one, not, but one born, not born, I'm sorry, I am not one born into knowledge, but one who cherishes antiquity and diligently seeks it there. Now, the antiquity that Confucius is thinking of here is the antiquity represented by the progenitors of civilization and the founders of the Zhou dynasty, individuals who, at least mythically, lived hundreds of years or even thousands of years before Confucius came onto the scene, and to whom he looked as models for how to organize society in a moral and ethical way in his own time. Now, what's interesting here is that the very fact of looking to the ancients, this very practice of looking to the ancients that we see in the work of Confucius and in the work of his students and in the generations who followed them was historically driven by a sense of social and political precarity on the part of the people doing the looking. When Confucius pronounced in the sixth century BCE that he cherished antiquity and diligently sought knowledge there, he was an itinerant philosopher with only a handful of disciples who had, on the most part, and for the whole, failed to persuade anyone in power to follow his teachings. Um, when the proponents, for example, of the ancient style movement in the 10th and 11th centuries CE um, proposed a new way of governing that followed the teachings of Confucius in a more authentically ancient way, as they put it, they also did so from a position of, of insecurity as a small and marginal faction at court, and, and so on and so forth. Um, in a sense, we can say that Confucius himself, in different terms than those today, was seeking to save ancient studies. Now, the point is that for all of these figures, it was precisely a sense of precarity that compelled them to look to the past for alternatives. And so I think it's worth asking the question, at least, of whether our own interest in studying the ancients is nurtured in some sense by the precarity that we are witnessing and experiencing in the world all around us. One of the things that this passage also demonstrates is that in addition to possessing a rich and complex ancient past, China also possesses a remarkable repository of the various ways in which people have, over time, sought to make the past present in their own lives. Some saw antiquity as a repository of formal models to reproduce, others as a source of more abstract, ethical, and political guidance. Still others used it as a catalyst for creativity, as a way of breaking free from the bonds of tradition and proposing radical new alternatives. If we are interested not just in what happened in the ancient past or what happened in the ancient past in China, but in how we might use knowledge about the past in the present, I think there's actually no better place to start looking and start exploring that question than in the study of how ancient knowledge in China has become part of our present reality. So that's one way of framing the question of when, the study, when ancient studies begin. It begins in ancient times um, themselves. A different way to approach the question is to begin rather from the objects and textual sources that scholars today typically utilize to create knowledge about ancient China and, um, and also that museums and other organizations utilize to represent ancient China as such to wider publics, both here in the United States, in China and elsewhere around the world. 
And so what are some of these objects that are used to help us envision what ancient China looked like and what people living in ancient China did? Well, one of these traditions are the painted pottery vessels of uh, Northwest China that I'm showing you examples here. Examples of burnished earthenware bearing of highly detailed uh, geometric designs that were typically recovered from tombs. And while following the basic contours of functional vessels were clearly designed to serve in a ritual function in a, as well. Um, another body of materials that's relatively well known are bronze ritual vessels that were cast in the early courts of the Shang and the Zhou dynasties from roughly the 18th to the fifth centuries BCE. Vessels that are emblematic of China's Bronze Age and that bear on their surface elaborate combinations of geometric and zoomorphic patterns um, that were used to sort of vitalize these vessels, to imbue these vessels with additional powers of, of the animal world and to make these vessels um, powerful, useful, effective, efficacious conduits for the transmission of um, offerings and um, in fact, filial devotion um, on the part of those making the offerings to their ancestors in the other world. Um, another category of objects that are frequently used uh, when we talk about the study of ancient China are um, um, bones of oxen, and in this case, turtle plastrons, the belly shells of turtles that bear the earliest surviving examples of Chinese writing. These are regularly invoked when everyone wants to talk about the history of writing in China. Uh, these are um, bones that were used ritualistically um, by, by, by soothsayers to uh, ask questions of the ancestors in the worlds beyond us um, and to divine the answers to those questions by applying red hot pokers to the bones that would cause the bones to pop and make a popping sound that the diviners would then read. And the answers um, to the questions would then be inscribed with the questions themselves onto the bones as a kind of early ritual record keeping that sort of set the stages for the later practices of historians um, in China. So this is, yet, this is another category that we're, uh, we regularly turn to when talking about ancient China. Yet a third category, or yet a fourth category, um, uh, we might look to this extraordinary, mysterious, bronze faces with enlarged peering eyes that have been recovered from the site of Sanqingdui in Sichuan that represent another face of early bronze civilization, very, very different from what we experience uh, when looking through the archaeological recoveries or the archaeological materials recovered uh, from the Yellow River Valley to the north. Uh, still another category of um, objects that has um, traveled widely and widely been used to represent ancient China to wider publics is one that I suspect many of you listening today are reasonably familiar with, and that is, of course, uh, the Terracotta Army, um, a massive army that was entombed in the vicinity of the tomb of the first emperor of China in the late 3rd century BCE that to date has yielded a total of over 7,000 life-size figures, including 36 discrete chariot and warrior groups composed of each composed of a single three-man chariot team and uh, 50 to 100 infantrymen, um, as well as a variety of other specialty troops like crossbowmen and cavalry, and even a unique command unit of generals and officers. And the figures that collectively make up the Terracotta Army pose all sorts of fascinating questions about the nature of representation and the, the goals of sort of creating, creating mimetic art um, at this particular period in, in Chinese history. Um, the figures are life-size, um, they're modular, made of components created through molds, but yet their faces have been individualized. And so what we see across this, um, across these body of soldiers is a sort of limited repertoire of prefabricated units that are then adapted in place. So they serve not simply as representations of specific individual humans, but rather as the kind of, a, as a kind of collective representation of the variation that occurs within a larger army and a disciplining of that variation into a singular and coherent unit. Realism in the army was functional rather than aesthetic and designed to make it an effective surrogate, a kind of stand-in for a real army, standing in perpetual guard over the first emperor's tomb. Now, these and other sources have been widely mobilized by scholars of, um, of early China to talk about things like the origins of bureaucracy, the origins of systematic state-sponsored and state 
centered ritual activities, and indeed the origins of social and economic inequality. One um, additional uh, thing that I think is worth, worth mentioning in this particular context is um, that, that um, all of these, all of these early discoveries, and this is actually really, really fundamental and key, all of these important key critical materials that are utilized by scholars today to talk about ancient China, all of them were discovered in the modern period. None of the materials that I've just shown you today were known in China prior to the 20th century. The painted pottery of China's Northwest was first systematically documented by the Swedish archeologist, Johan Gunnar Andersson in a series of trips in the 1920s. The majority of the bronzes that can be securely dated to the late Shang dynasty um, did not come to light until the excavation of the Shang royal tombs at Anyang by the Academia Sinica in the 1920s. Oracle bones were not discovered until 1899, and there wasn't a sufficient number of them known to scholars to begin the arduous process of decipherment until those same royal tombs and the immediate areas around them were excavated uh, in the 1920s. Um, and just as a quick aside here, as a quick plug, if you're curious about the excavation, this, this, this history of excavation in the 1920s, uh, the Smithsonian's, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian, Ancient, of Asian Art, excuse me, is uh, right now putting on a wonderful exhibition on Anyang, uh, China's ancient city of kings, which I strongly recommend um, anyone who's at all interested uh, in the subject. Uh, similarly, um, the ancient bronze civilization that inhabited the Sichuan Basin in the late second millennium BCE was not known until the discovery of those bronzes in two refuse pits where they had been ceremoniously broken and buried, we think by their creators, um, possibly by, by, by other groups nearby who were in some sort of struggle with the founders of San Jingdui. Um, they weren't discovered, these things weren't discovered until 1986. Uh, in the course of the excavation of the cellar of a brick factory, as, as it happens. And similarly, the terracotta army itself was not discovered until 1974. So while the tomb of the first emperor was well known from historical sources like Sima Qin's a famous record of the grand historian, no historical source, no transmitted historical source contains any mention of the army. This entire construct was not in fact known until peasants began digging a well in the vicinity of the site in um, 1974 and raised a couple of broken ceramic heads in the process that then prompted the more systematic excavation. Um, it's also worth noting that the appearance of the army itself is largely a modern construct, uh, rebuilt through uh, the painstaking effort of hundreds of conservators who've reassembled the army from the fragments um, in which it was found. Now, all of these objects, of course, now play a central role in constructing both domestic and international narratives about Chinese history. They are sites where visiting dignitaries, for example, um, are taken to see, see and understand the Chinese past, like Queen Elizabeth in this file photo from the 1980s. Um, they're because of this, there are also sites, I think it's useful to note that um, trouble many academics um, that I know personally in China who see um, the fact that sort of one of their principal cultural dem um, diplomats is uh, this army um, has sort of projects a kind of militaristic um, sense of China upon the world. And I think many in China today are concerned um, as, 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 as sort of their calling card, of taking this as their calling card. And I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A if, if people are curious. Um, well, all of these materials though are from ancient China. The story that they now tell us about ancient China is kind of a modern story. Um, as I said, no one prior to the 20th century used these to trace the ancient history of China. But so if they weren't using sources like this, what, what, what sort of sources were they using or how else was the past of China known? 
Well, one thing that we do know was transmitted over time from the ancient days of Confucius down to the present um, were things like the Confucian classics, which were canonized in the second century BCE and then continuously transmitted onto the present day. Um, and they were transmitted in a variety of forms. One of the most common or one of the most significant ways in which they were transmitted was through carving those classics literally onto stone. As you see here, I'm giving you an example of the so-called Kaicheng stone classics, which were carved into tablets between the entire Confucian canon carved into tablets between the years 833 and 837 um, BCE. They're now in a site known as the Forest of Steles Museum, which I'll say a little bit more about um, in a moment. Um, here's an example of a rubbing taken of one of these sets of tablets. And, um, and, a, and a, a detail there so you get a sense of um, how the text of, in this case, the classic of changes is represented um, in this format. Probably another and, in fact, more common and important format um, in which uh, classical knowledge was transmitted, both the Confucian classics and other classical texts, uh, is, in the, is in the format of manuscripts and ultimately once printing was widely adopted in the 10th and 11th centuries through, through Widblock print. And just so you can get a sense of the sort of way in which um, this kind of knowledge would be communicated, I've just brought to you an example of a page from a 12th century printed uh, edition of um, uh, probably the most famous or one of the most significant of all uh, Confucian classics, the, the, uh, the Record of Rites. Um, and the, the opening page of the Record of Rights. And so I'm showing you here, this is the title of the text, the Record of Rights, uh, the first chapter, uh, which is titled um, The Contours of Ritual. Um, and then of course, the first line of the Contours of Ritual, which says as one might unsurprisingly, in all things uh, be reverent. Now, what I'm pointing out here is something that's actually quite striking and important to remember about this tradition of textual transmission. And that's that what you're seeing here highlighted in red is the actual text of the classic itself. And everything else highlighted in blue are commentaries on this classic, commentaries that were written by a series of Confucian scholars over the course of the first millennium CE that postdate the classic text by hundreds of years and in some cases more than a thousand years. Now this practice of reading the classics in dialogue with inter interlinearity commentaries, as they're typically understood, is widespread and was the primary way in which people sort of learned about uh, what the ancient past included, what it involved, and so forth. Now, another category of um, another mechanism, if you will, uh, whereby the ancient past was transmitted um, down, down through the centuries that started very early on since the canonization of the Confucian classics in the period between the second century BCE and the second century CE is the production of these sort of visual commentaries or illustrated commentaries, which are attempts to, to visualize the various um, objects and implements and entities that are discussed, described, or named in the Confucian classics. Now, here's another example um, taken from a relatively well-known work known as the illustrations of the three ritual classics. Now, it's important to recognize that these visual commentaries are not depictions, not descriptive depictions of actual historical implements that existed in the past, but rather attempts to translate the names that are recorded in these texts into actual physical things. And this tells us something very important about the classical texts that people have often used to try to understand the ancient past. Those classical texts, especially the Confucian classics, are prescriptive rather than descriptive in nature. They are propositional. The texts are filled with complex liturgies that are intended to support rituals that might be used in, in, in the future to make the world harmonious. So much of the interpretation that is focused on these texts is focused less on describing and explaining historically the world that was, and more on transforming the present world by putting the objects and the liturgies and the other normative forms that are recorded in these classic texts into practice. In a sense, what commentators are trying to do is take an ideal that existed in the past and to make it real. Now, these texts and commentaries were also transmitted 
Um, but what's interesting is that here too, modern discoveries in the 20th century have radically disrupted the way in which we understand the relationship between those classical texts and what actually happened, what actually thought was thought in ancient China. And the principal way they've done this is by demonstrating that what appear to us now and what were in fact transmitted from the second century BCE as coherent texts were in fact in their own day transmitted in a variety of much more fragmentary forms. Individual chapters of a classic text were, were, were distributed as, um, as, as, as whole books unto themselves. Um, various classic texts re retained traces of orality. Many of them were transmitted as individual aphorisms, individual sayings that were only then brought together and kind of rationalized and made into the words of Confucius by um, scholars at the early courts of imperial China in the second and the first centuries um, BCE in an effort to kind of create a coherent and shared and, and ideologically consistent understanding of that earlier past. That much of what we now think of as the core sources for understanding ancient China were in fact products of the early imperial period, attempts to rationalize, synthesize, and bring together the fragments of earlier civilizations, which in and of itself could be understood as another form of ancient studies. Now, the last way I wanna talk about um, how we might think of ancient studies sort of coming into existence is not necessarily as something that's been going on since ancient times or early imperial times, and not something that's taken on radically new forms in modern times, but actually in a third sense as something that really became possible in a new way in medieval times. And, and here I wanna talk about, I know that our conversations over these two days is really about technology. I'm gonna use technology in a kind of very broad sense here to think about new innovations, new ways of organizing knowledge and transmitting knowledge that emerged over the course of the medieval period and that made the ancient past accessible to scholars in ways that it, it had in certain ways never been accessible before, not even to those scholars in the early imperial period who were trying to kind of rationalize the fragments of the past. So what are some of these new technologies that emerged? Well, one of these technologies, and its origins are a little bit hard to trace, but I think most scholars today would recognize that sort of heyday for the production of this new kind of genre of textual production really is in the, in the 10th and 11th centuries, is the encyclopedia or the, the lei shu, the, the category book, as it might be directly translated. And I've given you one example of these category books, a, a work known as the Six Writings of Master Kong by a figure named Kong Chan, who, as it happens, was the 47th lineal descendant of Confucius. Um, himself. And I'm showing you here a, an imprint of this text, a woodblock printed edition of this text from the year 1166 that's now in the collection of the National Palace Museum in Taiwan. Um, what, is, what was important about these encyclopedias? Um, well, I think what's important about these and about the, in fact, the other technologies that I'm going to tell you about are that they were a way of sort of linking up the material with the textual. And what I mean by that is that they were a way of taking knowledge that might be derived from the empirical investigation of the material world, the physical traces of the past that surround us and integrating those with the received knowledge that came through the textual tradition. Um, so what's interesting when you look through an encyclopedia like this is that even though many of the passages cited in these encyclopedias were quoted from classical texts, the categories into which these citations were organized were derived from actual empirical observations of things in the world. In other words, scholars who created encyclopedias started from the investigation and the curiosity of the world all around them, and then they looked for information from the classic texts to, to, to sort of bolster their knowledge about the, that, the, that material world, rather than starting from the classical text and cons constraining themselves to the problem of explaining the contents of those that text as earlier classical commentators had done. And we see this very, very clearly in, uh, in the way these, these texts are organized and the categories in which, into which they're organized. And so, for example, this text is fascinating. Uh, I strongly recommend it. It's never been fully translated, um, but it's filled with just all sorts of wonderful details about all kinds of phenomena, including things like uh, um, uh, atmospheric phenomena like, like hail 
or uh, rainbows, for example, um, as well as uh, other phenomena uh, like, like chickens, uh, flora and fauna, and even things like foodstuffs, uh, porridge, and so on. And so forth. one can go on and on and on. There's, there's 30 fascicles that make up the text, and there's a tremendously wide range of different categories of knowledge represented in it. Um, so let me just restate one more time. Now, this mode of knowledge production differs from classical commentaries um, because rather than building on traditions of received knowledge transmitted through canonical texts, they begin from the investigation of the world itself. Now, another way in which we see those new tools being developed is in the advent of a kind of systematic science of paleography. Um, and here, what we see scholars do, beginning to do is building upon earlier traditions of graphical lexicography. What is graphical lexicography? Basically, the idea that you organize dictionaries around the graphical analysis, rather than, say, the semantic analysis or the pronunciation of Chinese characters. And this is a tradition. This tradition of graphical lexicography goes, goes way back. It goes way back to the second century B, uh, CE. But what's striking here is that scholars begin using this tradition to integrate um, ancient forms of writing that predate the standardization of the Chinese writing system in the third century of BCE under the first emperor. And so we can see here examples of that going on. And I've just shown it, th thrown in a few quick examples just so you get an idea of what's going on in a text like this. Um, this is the, the radical water. And what you can see, the radical is, the, uh, is an element in the Chinese character that's generally associated with meaning. Um, what you can see here above is the actual more archaic form of the script. Um, there's all sorts of questions of where, um, where Guo Zhongshu, the author of this text, is getting these different variations, which ones are coming from um, actual surviving bamboo slips upon which texts were written, which ones are coming from other sources. But in any case, um, the, the larger point is that this is a sort of this is the kind of synthetic version of that early of those early graphs that he he was able to derive. And uh, and then the more modern. Um, way of writing that character, one that would be recognizable to, uh, to a Chinese, uh, literate Chinese readers today. Um, and we can see that then being used as a radical across a variety of characters. So here, for example, um, is the character uh, for C. Uh, here is the character for the word that means clear. And, uh, oops, excuse me. And there is the character uh, for the word that means marsh. And of course, you can see how all of these are related meaning-wise to the presence of water in the character. So, so we see this kind of tool. We see the emergence of, um, of, of a kind of graphic paleographic study. Now, how were scholars able to pursue paleography in this way? In other words, how were they able to gather up a corpus of uh, early inscriptions that they, could, that they could analyze in these ways? Well, they did that um, by, develop, by utilizing another new technology. And this was the technology of the inked impression. Now, the inked impression was um, a mechanism that's actually very widespread today, but was only really first developed until in the early medieval period in the 6th and 7th centuries um, CE, where a, um, a, a piece of moistened paper would be delicately tapped in to a stone or metal impression, and then an inked pad would be systematically tapped across the surface of this white, across the white surface of this sheet of paper to create a negative impression of the writing um, inscribed on the stone or, or, or metal matrix. Here you see an example of someone producing one of these impressions today. Uh, here's another example. Now, um, interestingly, these impressions, and in fact, uh, one of the things that's striking about how the, um, uh, the changes that occurred over the middle period is that beginning in the 11th century, scholars not only sought to gather up and collect these impressions of inscriptions, but actually the inscriptions themselves. And they began collecting these inscriptions at a site in the modern day city of Xi'an, uh, known as the Baling or Forest of Steles, which exists to this day. It was founded in the year 1087. And um, you know there's an argument that can be made for this being, uh, uh, several scholars have made such an argument for this being in fact, China's earliest museum. Um, a site that I strongly recommend anyone visit if they have an opportunity to visit Northwest China. Um, and there, within the Forest of Steles, you can find thousands of stone inscriptions that have been collected over the course of the past 1,000 years as sources for a variety of different um, modes of scholarly inquiry, among which 
uh, paleography is one, either freestanding or encased literally in the stone fabric of um, um, the compound in which these, of, of the compound itself. Now, the last technology that I want to emphasize, and that's one that sort of builds upon these other technologies, is the technology of the antiquarian catalog. And what do I mean by an antiquarian catalog? Well, this is an example of an early bronze. And I mentioned earlier that um, the bronzes from the late Shang dynasty that were known from Anyang were really only known from the early part of the 20th century. But that's not to say that bronzes more generally as a category were not known from earlier times. And in fact, the study of ancient bronze is something that really takes off in the 11th century CE and that is closely connected to the emergence of a sort of systematic study of paleography. Um, this is a bronze that dates from the roughly the 7th century BCE. And here you see a very similar bronze represented in a printed antiquarian catalog that was compiled in the 11th century CE, roughly 1700 years later. And what we see in these catalogs are reproductions of rubbings or inked impressions taken from the inscriptions on those bronze vessels, and then transcriptions of those inscriptions into what was at the time a more modern contemporary, and actually remains to this day, a more modern and contemporary um, Chinese script. So this process of decipherment, this process of deciphering older forms of writing into something that would be legible in medieval times allowed scholars to do something that was really, really fundamentally important. And that was, it allowed them to recognize that many of these inscriptions included the names, the sort of typological names of the objects on which they were inscribed. So in this case, the inscription includes the word E and thus the, um, the compilers of this catalog recognized that the vessel in question was called an E. And so in this way, they were able to actually mesh together to, to match up the textually transmitted records of ancient ritual with the materially transmitted archeology span of the actual physical traces of ritual itself. And we see that across a wide range of different categories of objects. You could also say, for, for example, that, that, that the practice of iconography begins in the 11th century as scholars are for the first time able to recognize that these zoomorphic forms that they're seeing on the surfaces of their vessels can be associated with a classical term for a ravenous beast known as the Tautia. Now, these associations actually, interestingly enough, persist all the way into the present. And, um, and, and more importantly, what's interesting about the development of this technology is that because of the underlying technology of print, scholars were able to the first time not only match up a classical name with a classical form, but then ensure that they could share the connection between that classical name and classical form with other people out there. They could help people learn how to recognize the Tautia for themselves by looking at other bronzes that shared formal properties with the bronzes that they were looking at in these catalogs. And we see this sort of emergence then of a kind of sort of proto-science of um, typology that um, actually to this day undergirds the typologies that modern Chinese archeologists utilize to organize the material that they're pulling out of the ground. And this we see most clearly and most precisely and most, you know, facet in, in the most fascinating way, I think, um, with this work, this catalog attributed to um, a scholar, 11th century scholar named Lu Daling. Um, and what I'm going to just mention briefly is the catalog's title. It's called the Kaogutu, or Illustrated Investigations of Antiquity. And what I think is really striking and really memorable and really wonderful about this particular example is that when scholars in 19th and 20th century China sought to figure out how they should translate the Western term archaeology into their own indigenous Chinese language, this is the text that they look to as a model. And in fact, this term, the investigation of antiquity or kaogu, as it might be translated in the 11th century context, is what scholars today use to translate the modern word archeology. span So kaogu, this, this practice of investigating the ancients in the medieval world became at a very basic, in a very basic and fundamental way, the framework for which it became possible to imagine indigenous Chinese 
an indigenous Chinese practice of archaeology. So what do we see from all of this? Well, what we see is that the medieval period played an essential role in the development of the informational and the graphic technologies that made it possible to integrate the material and the textual traces of the past. Um, it made it possible to integrate things like the terracotta army into the historiography of ancient China. So what does all of this, what does all of this tell us in conclusion? And it, it appears that by one definition, we could say that ancient studies in China is itself ancient. Um, by another definition, we could say that it's modern. And by still another definition, we could say that it's medieval. Perhaps what all of this is telling us is that perhaps I'm asking the wrong question. Perhaps rather than asking the question of when ancient studies began, it might be more appropriate to ask how the study of the ancients changed over time. And personally, I like asking the question in this way because it also prompts us to consider how ancient studies might change in the future and what organizations like the Save Ancient Studies Alliance are doing to change it. It reminds us that ancient studies is not simply something to save, but something to create anew. To seek to study the ancient past is also, I think inevitably, to assert the knowledge gleaned from such study matters, both to our contemporaries in the here and now, and importantly, to those still to come. In acknowledging the paleographers and the chroniclers and the lexicographers and all those other knowledge keepers who transmitted the ancient past to us, we are also proposing ourselves as worthy of acknowledgement by those who will follow. We are asking the generations to come to hear us, to hear our call, to acknowledge our methods and our findings and yes, our oversights and even our errors. There is, I think we must admit, a certain arrogance in asserting ourselves in this way. And I think it behooves us to think long and hard, not just about the past that we are transmitting, but the methods for studying that past that we are quite literally advancing upon the future. In the end, what mattered most about Confucius was not the past that he diligently sought, but the moral practice that he modeled for his disciples. That practice cannot, and it should not be our practice, but it can remind us that however we might endeavor to interpret the ancient world on its own terms, there is an inherent ethical charge in seeking the past, and that it's up to us collectively to determine what future to make of the past that we find. By opening ancient studies in an inclusive and ecumenical way, this conference and the organization behind it, I think, is an admirable effort to bring together a much wider range of voices than are typically present in academic conferences and to nurture a collective conversation about what ancient studies can do and just as importantly, who ancient studies are for. This, more than anything else, seems a model worth transmitting, a generous mode of mutual support making all of those gathered here today worthy of being ancients for a world yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moser. That was a fascinating presentation. Do you think we have a few minutes left? If anyone has any questions, definitely put them in the chat and we'll see if we can have time to get to them. I did notice a couple come in as you were presenting. So I, I'll start with those. Uh, they were from Aries Aurelian on YouTube. Uh, they were asking a bit what the classical period is, if you could perhaps define those for them watching. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, there's various ways to define it. The classical period um, is generally understood as the period um, leading up to um, leading up the advent of the, the first um, imperial dynasty, so the period prior to the centralization of authority under the first emperor in the third century BCE. Um, the term classical period is used in a variety of different ways by different historians, but um, a, a loose way of thinking about it is to kind of align it with um, either the period that's most associated with the teachings of Confucius and the models that he looked to of the Zhou dynasty, so the, roughly the 10th century BCE down to the 
fifth or fourth century BC, or to define it a little more broadly to take in the entirety of the Bronze Age um, going back to, to roughly the 18th or 17th centuries BC. Great. And uh, the same uh, person asked, did they use paper and printing press back then? Uh, I assume they meant, you know, when did that come about? Sure, in antiquity sure. In great question. Um, so the first thing to say is that they did not use the printing press. Um, a, a press was not involved in the production of woodblock prints. Um, rather, the, the, the wooden matrix would be stationary on a table and actually the, the pieces of paper would be pressed onto the inked block itself um, by hand. But the, uh, the practice of woodblock printing, the origins of woodblock printing are a little bit hard to pin down. We have, we have textual evidence of things that we think were woodblock prints existing as early as the late 6th, early 7th centuries. The first actual surviving woodblock prints date to the 8th century. The earliest securely dated woodblock prints with an actual date comes from the 9th century. And they really take off as a primary means of textual reproduction in the mm, late 11th to 12th centuries. Um, so that's the kind of that's the kind of broader broader um, sort of narrative of how the technology was adopted. Interestingly, by comparison with the history of the um, uh, uh, printing press in 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 the West, is that we don't see printing having a really dramatic transformative effect in China in the same way. It's a, it's a technology that sort of got going over time, um, in 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 ways that I think are very interesting when we think about when we think of a sort of broader comparative context of the history of print. Yeah, great. Okay, and I don't see any more questions that have come in, but we do have a bit of time and I have one that came to mind when I was watching. Um, what kind of challenges would you say are inherent to using sources like the ones you discussed in your presentation for research? Um, well, I mean, there's always, there's the intrinsically, there's there's the issue of, um, as I was explaining, all those transmitted sources that we see are transmitted, are sources that have been doctored over time, have been changed, have, you know, sort of have absorbed or, or accumulated the opinions and judgments and revisions and reworkings of gen the generations of scholars who participated in, um, in, in transmitting them. And so this produces all kinds of things. It produces all sorts of errors and, and oversights and deliberate attempts to restructure an earlier text to make it a, you know, coincide with a, with a later ideology. Um, and I think part of the interest, certainly starting from the medieval period, and, and, and continuing, this is another way in which the modern we moderns are very much indebted to our medieval forebears, is... Um, uh, to 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 think that by sort of skipping over this transmitted corpus by looking back to earlier material sources um, that that haven't been mediated in this way is one way of you know kind of investigating the past more more securely or on, on more secure grounds. I think I think the other, but I mean I think your question raises a, a sort of much deeper philosophical um, uh, a, a question of like you know, more generally, what are the dangers of using the past and present at all? Um, like, like what, uh, to what extent does the fact of seeking to endorse our present um, modes of knowledge production, our present ideologies, our ways of thinking about what matters in the world, to what extent does the utilization of ancient sources, the republication of ancient texts that, that seem to support or nurture or just provide the kind of scholarly sustenance to, to the work that we do, to what extent is that, you know, are we actually using those sources to, to, um, to reproduce and to, to reinforce ideologies that, you know, very rightly deserve to be questioned? I mean, I think that, I think that kind of question is something that's going on, I think, quite um, uh, in, a, in a quite sustained way and, a, and in a usefully self-reflexive way um, in, 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 in historical disciplines in general uh, right now, but, uh, but especially for those of us engaged in the, in the study of the classical world. So I don't know if that if that answers if, if that's if that's the, if the beginning of an answer. It's it's a it's a complex yeah. question. Yeah, it's a big question, and I don't think we have quite the time to really dig into it, but sure. perhaps it needs. So thank you very much again for your time today and your presentation and your engagement with uh, the Save Ancient Studies Alliance. It means a lot. Uh, and now we are moving on to session three. Uh, of our conference today. And I'm going to turn everything over to Taylor, who will be moderating the rest of that. Thank you so much, Cassie. And thanks again, Dr. Moser. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I am going to share my screen really quickly. Mm -hmm. There we go.
So our next session is Traditions Transmission Over Time. Sorry, I'm just putting it in the slideshow mode. Oh, print slide. So our next session is session three, Traditions, Transmission of Scientific Knowledge Over Time. Um, we will be hearing from Ben Broadbent, Georgina Longley, Patrick Clancy, and Emily Ferry. Before we begin, I just wanted to plug the raffle one more time. It is still going on at saveancientstudies.org. Um, but to get started, our first presenter is Ben Broadbent, presenting on ancient science in the Astronotilia. Though Ben was born in Greenwich, he has spent most of his time in the Wirral, a forgotten strip of land between Wales and Liverpool in the northwest of England. He attended a state school where he picked up Latin and fell in love with antiquity. Once older, he learned intermediate Greek outside it. Ben went to Oxford to study classics from 2018. He stuck with his degree despite the trials of COVID and stayed on and won entry to the MPhil program and has subsequently been trying to expand his scope of research as far as possible. He first started studying the astronautilia in his own time throughout lockdown and has read it continually ever since, producing his translation. Beyond education, he has started to reteach himself the ability to draw which he used to do frequently until he was around 13, and also dabble, by his own words quite poorly, on the piano. Perhaps unsurprisingly, he voraciously reads and watches a lot of science fiction as something normally quite different from ancient texts. His non-translation writing normally follows on from this. I'm going to hand it over to Ben. Please drop your questions and comments in the chat, um, and we will turn it over. Thanks, Ben. Thanks very much, Taylor, for that. Um introduction. I'm going to try now sharing my screen, so let's see if um, fireworks uh, start or not. Uh, give me one moment. Right. Is that visible? Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, I can see it. Wonderful. Right. Um, I will get started then. Um, so yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, and it is a um, great delight today to be um, opening this um, panel on uh, the transmission of um, scientific knowledge over time. Um, I'm hoping in this presentation um, to show how ideas in ancient science have been um, transmitted into a uh, 20th century poem um, called uh, The Astronautilia. Um, now, The Astronautilia is a 24 book uh, ancient Greek uh, epic poem based um, especially on the Odyssey, um, but was written in the 1990s. And yes, this is an epic written in Homeric Greek. Um, but from 1993 to um, 1994. Um, it was composed by a Czech polymath called Jan Krasadlo, um, who worked primarily in um, psychology, but was a real Renaissance man. He was capable in 20 or 30 languages or so, um, one of them being um, ancient uh, Greek. Um, and at the end of his life, um, he set himself the task of um, composing an original um, ancient Greek epic, which he uh, regrettably um, never lived to see um, published. Um, the poem is laid out with his handwritten um, ancient Greek on the left-hand page and a line-by-line -line, um, hexameter Czech translation on the right, as I put up here on the slideshow. Um, there are 20, so there are 250 uh, such double pages, um, overall giving 6,600 lines of Homeric hexameters spread over 24 books. Um, and I've also put up a photo of me holding the astronautilia a lot, so you can see quite how hefty um, a volume this is. Uh, and despite the sheer wonder of this text, it has received little to no attention from uh, scholarship. There are no published pieces um, on this poem. So as um, Taylor mentioned, um, I have written an um, English translation of this epic into line by line hexameters, which I'm trying to get published myself. We'll see how that goes. And in my presentation today, I'm going to be using uh, extracts um, of that translation when I quote lines of the poem in Greek. Um, now, as goes a conference on ancient science, um, the Astronautilia makes a wonderful contribution um, because of its theme as a um, sci fi text. Um, the poem recounts the interstellar voyage of a space captain um, called Udes, um, whose, Greek, whose name is ancient Greek for no one, who I wonder what that's a reference to in the Odyssey. Um, Udes pilots a spaceship uh, with his crewmates, uh, made up of both humans and robots, um, in a mission of pursuit um, for Mandis and the uh, cosmos-observing um, sheep. 
um, Udes and his crew land on many um, alien planets in their encounters, and they encounter many uh, remarkable um, alien species as they do so. Um, in this talk, I'm going to pick up uh, pick out uh, three topics where I will illustrate um, how ancient science and ancient scientific ideas um, come to be updated in the astronaut ilia and mixed with contemporary understandings. Um, so first, let's look at robots. Um, the companions of Udes, unlike Odysseus's crew, um, are made up of both humans and robots, um, with individual characters named in each of um, the species. Um, robots have long been around in literature, taking one of their earliest appearances in Homer's Iliad um, in Book 18, um, a locus classicus for literary studies of robots. Um, and in this book, um, Thetis has gone to the engineer god Hephaestus to ask him to craft a new set of armor for her son Achilles, because Hector has stolen Achilles' armor away from the corpse of Patroclus. Um, the lab of um, Hephaestus contains a group of figures who look like human women, but are made of solid gold. Um, and maids scurry to their lord, golden, resembling to living women. Uh, theirs was intelligence in their mind, as well as speech and strength, and they knew uh, the doings of immortal gods. Uh, they toiled for their lord. Now, Homer does not quite use the word robot, uh, nor any um, innovatory term here, but the arch scientist of the gods does seem to have some figures who really do look and sound like our contemporary robots. Homer tells us that these mannequins are made of gold and look like young women, so they're not organic like we are, but made of an artificial material. They're not simple tools either, you know, like hammers or bellows. Um, Homer tells us they have a mind, nos, they have speech, out there, and they have strength, uh, stenos. Um, they aren't simple objects, but have a consciousness, you know, possibly even personality. Um, this conception of robots uh, lies in the background of the um, Stranaltilia. Um, so here I, I've put up a passage uh, in the poem, which just so happens to capture all of the angles of Homer's golden maidens that I've just um, outlined for context. Um, Udes is leading an assault on the city of the tailed women, and he is sent out to the robots um, ahead in battle. Um, only our Evo the robots continued to wander our straight backs, along with the other robotics. They hadn't the programming that would hurl themselves down to the ground if a person's beginning to blast them. The girls in the shore of the concentrate fire right onto these very robots with ruinous bullets. A rattle began when they blasted, nor were they able to execute damage upon the robotics. All of them certainly made out of adamant and of a metal. So consider this passage against what we've just read in Homer. Crisato uh, here shows how he has solved Homer's vocab problem by simply borrowing the word robot. Um, look at the first line of the passage, robotos. Um, this word robot, um, in fact, comes from Czech from a play called RUR, or Rossum's Universal Robots, um, by the great Czech writer, Karel Čapek. Um, so Chris Sadlow is here borrowing a word from his native language back into ancient Greek. Um, Evo and the other robots, um, though they don't have the programming to duck to avoid fire, nevertheless they'll have a mind. They clearly have strength if they can resist bullets. They are capable of moving autonomously. And we see the robots elsewhere speaking. Um, these robots too are metallic, as says the, uh, the final line of the passage. Um, and Chris Sadlow draws on the mythical metal of adamant from which the sickle of Kronos was made when he castrated his father, Uranus. So though modern robotics is not quite as advanced yet, uh, we can nevertheless see that the ancient Greek conception of artificial metallic intelligence reaches its logical conclusion in this poem. Um, for something a bit closer to home, a discovery already made by modern science, let's now turn to atoms. Um, the Astrodaltilia, because it was written in the 1990s, uh, was privileged enough to have access to many scientific uh, advances, are the commonplace today, but are utterly alien to an uh, ancient audience. So for instance, in book four, um, Udes lands on a planet inhabited by zoophytes, um, plants that are so advanced that they are capable of moving like animals, even at one point rushing the crew and killing one of the companions. Um, Udes explains how they can move so quickly and so effectively um, because of the chlorophyll contained within them. Always in silly chartres for the reason that chlorophyll is present uh, in them, with inside their cutis, and this is the chlorophyll given to serve as the name for a substance possessing a structure compacted. Fifty and five of the carbon to start off, and seven the argon. Oxygen six and the nitrogen four, for magnesium nine volt. This is the first of the orders, but in its own term, then the second, 
being so very alike to the former has something far greater, 10 times the numbers for hydrogen. Otherwise, each of their equals. Um, so here, Chris Sadler is probably speaking actually correct. Um, chlorophyll does normally have 55 atoms of carbon, six of oxygen and four of nitrogen. Nine magnesium atoms is a little bit more weird and seven argon is completely mad. Um, argon is a noble gas and cannot react. Um, but anyway, the astronaut Ilya fully embraces the idea of the universe being um, atomic. Now, atoms are one of Greek science's best success stories, an ancient theory whose reality has been demonstrated and wholeheartedly embraced by modern science. Um, atomic theory derives from the pre-Socratics, Leucippus, and especially Democritus, whose works regrettably are mostly lost. Uh, we have scraps and fragments, um, as well as testimonies. So let's turn to one of these um, testimonies. This is um, Aristotle on Democritus. Um, Democritus thinks that substances are so small as to escape our senses, and they exist in every shape and every form and in variations of size. And from this, then, he knew that just as if from letters, they generate and combine masses that are visible and sensible to the naked eye. Um, now, what is particularly interesting here is the concept that atoms are comparable to letters. Just as various atoms combine in different shapes of different numbers to produce the various things in the world, so too do letters recombine and recur to form new words. Um, from this quotation, it's not quite clear if the parenthetical comment is Aristotle's or if he's genuinely uh, reflecting a parallel that was drawn by Democritus. But nevertheless, it is there, and the idea comes up in other ancient atomists. Um, take Lucretius, the Roman poet, whose De Rerum Natura is an absolute treasure trove of philosophy, literature, and science. At the end of book one, Lucretius is working to disprove um, Anaxagoras' idea that everything contains everything else. So for instance, all plants, according to Anaxagoras, contain little bits of flesh. And that is how, when we eat them, we can grow by extracting the flesh from plants. Um, Lucretius invokes a um, hypothetical um, Anaxagorean who protests that trees can spontaneously combust through friction because they already contain fire. Um, Lucretius disagrees, arguing that they contain the atoms that produce fire already. And he demonstrates this with a little bit of um, punning. Um, in this way, the words themselves are, um, also are made of elements, only a little different amongst themselves, when we moniker fire and furs with a different name. Um, so I've taken the pun from uh, Munro, but the point is clear. The words lignis wood and ignis fire contain the same letters, and this helps us detect the relationship between the two. Moreover, elementa is a translation of the Greek word stokeia, the same word that was used in the Aristotle quote of Democritus' um, conception of atoms as letters. Um, and it can be used in Latin, genuinely, this word elementa, um, to refer to alphabetical letters in a non-philosophical sense. Um, so we have come full circle. The ancient atomists conceived that the world was being made up of a number of basic units and parallel to how all words and alphabets are made up of a number of basic elements. Modern science, which has shown that the atomist theory of the world is broadly correct, has gone right back round to using letters to describe the composition of materials. This is what the astronaut Tilia does, giving the chemical structure mostly in chemical symbols from the periodic table. Look at the Greek text. It uses the symbols, not the words. Um, so I say it mostly uses the chemical symbols because there is one element that it does not um, abbreviate, um, hydrogen. Notice how it spells this word out at the very end of the passage. And this seems a rather odd choice. Like, why would you write out the full word when you can abbreviate it to its symbol? Um, well, you can't. What's the chemical symbol for hydrogen? H. And Greek has no letter for H. You can't write down the abbreviation for hydrogen, you know, let alone in a metrical text um, like the Astronautilia. So for my final topic, um, I'm going to consider a very uh, different matter, um, that of ancient geography. Um, our most important surviving ancient text on geography is that of Strabo, who examines Homer's conceptions of ocean um, at the beginning of his work and claims that Homer is the source of the science of um, geography. So this is what Strabo writes at one point in his uh, introduction. And otherwise, he, Homer, shows uh, the ocean surrounding the earth in a circle. Um, as when Hera says, I shall go to the bounds of the much uh, pastured earth to see ocean, the source of the gods. He says that the ocean is intimate with all boundaries and that the boundaries lie in a circle. And in the arms making of the shield of Achilles, he puts ocean on um, the rim. Um, so Strabo noted, notes um, Homer's idea of ocean as a river encircling the world 
pointing out also that Homer has the sun rise in ocean and set in ocean, therefore encompassing the world in a circle. Now in the Odyssey, furthermore, um, Homer also tells us that the house of Hades is located beside ocean. Um, the one you come across ocean in your ship, where the fertile shore and Persephone's groves and sizable poplars and the willows that lose fruit, beach your ship on deep whirling ocean and personally enter the moldy home of Hades. Um, so Homer creates this um, mythological link um, to the geographic fact that is ocean. Now let's put a pin in that idea and then have a look at one of the books of the Astronautilia. In book eight, Udes and his crew arrive at a rather unusual planet um, described here. This was a planet that whirled in an orbit, a wonder to witness. Only just once on its axis in each of its cyclical years, just like the path of a planet that's taking around its own solar. The fashion on moon likes to orbit around the enclosure of Gaia back in our home. The result is that half of the planet close by is always controlled by unparalleled nighttime as well as a chillness, while on the other, a sweltering hotness as well as a daytime. Life is enabled to occupy either the halves of the planet, one that's as hot as can be and the other that as cold as can be, while a ribbon assuredly straddles between the two hemisphere regions, which has a climate that cultivates life and is sweet and exquisite. So this is a tidally locked planet. Tidally locked objects, as they orbit another body, rotate in such a way that the same surface always faces that larger object. So as regards this particular planet, as it orbits its sun, one side of the planet always faces that sun and is therefore intolerably hot, um, while the other hemisphere is always turned away and therefore is freezing cold. Um, if you want an example closer to home, you need to think no further than the moon, which is tidally locked to Earth, and therefore we only ever get to see one side of the moon. We didn't know what the far side of the moon looked like until we got modern um, satellites. Um, but anyway, back to this planet. Um, if one hemisphere is um, insufferably hot and the other deadly cold, then there must be some narrow point where, um, in the style of Goldilocks, the temperature is just right for life. And this is where Udes lands, and he encounters um, a bounty of nature, um, as well as a race of butterflies. Beings, moreover, there were in this region, and all of them winged, bearing resemblance to hummingbirds, covered by all the tinges, or even those minuscule animals, fond of the flowers and winged. One that the Greeks who were ancient have styled as butterflies, psuchai. Whoever take notes, Lepidoptera now is the name of the moderns. The beings beheld on this planet, their bore resemblance to which things, though in their beauty and body transcending the ones that we're used to. Oh, isn't this nice? How idyllic. The butterflies then go on to wax about how gorgeous their lives are, how peaceful and how ideal. Um, but they tell Udes, um, there is one problem with their lot. Um, from out of the cold side of the planet, um, emerge a race of aliens called the Groggles, and the Groggles attack the butterflies. So Udes and his crewmates defend the butterflies, and they build up a fortification to prevent the Groggles invading them again. In return, butterflies tell Udes that, buried in the ice on one of the planet's moons, there is a Groggle prophet who can give them some rather useful advice um, on their mission throughout um, the cosmos. So the crewmates then go and find this seer, they dig him out of the ice, resurrect him, and the seer makes a prophecy for them, which is helpful in their ultimate um, journey. Now, this whole book of the Astronautilia is a delightful rewrite of Odyssey 11, um, the Nequia, the book in which Odysseus goes to consult with uh, the spirits of the dead. Um, the Greek word for soul or life breath is psuche, which yes, also means butterfly. Um, so both Odysseus and Udes consult with a flutter of psuche. In the case of Odysseus, they are souls. And in the case of Udes, they're butterflies. Um, the reason that Odysseus went to the underworld, we uh, remember, is he went to go and consult Tiresias, uh, a prophet who gives him useful information on his uh, return journey, just like the Groggle prophet that Udes goes to see. But the most important parallel is that of the planet, and this is where the ancient science comes in. Remember that this planet is tidally locked, with one side burning and the other side freezing, but it is along the narrow strip that divides those two hemispheres that we have this ribbon that encircles the world, and that is where the butterflies live. So yes, this is another world encircled by a ring, and we should compare this to ocean, a ring which encircles the Homeric world. 
And we just saw that it is there in ocean that Odysseus goes in order to visit the underworld. He sails to the edge of the world to go and visit the house of Hades and meet the Psukai, just as Udes goes to a ring himself to meet other Psukai. The idea of a tidally locked world is an absolutely modern conception, one that has only come about through modern astronomy and scientific advances. But Crisadlo seamlessly aligns it with the ancient Homeric idea of ocean for his own sci-fi catabasis. The Astronautilia overall then elegantly blends ancient and modern science together, showing how ancient ideas about robots, atoms, and ocean can perfectly well be transposed over into modern science. And all the while, never breaking the Homeric character, continuing to be written in ancient Greek with fantastic linguistic borrowings from modern vocabulary to plug the verbal gaps in Greek for modern ideas. The ancient Greeks were fascinated by science, and even the earliest poets, um, the earliest attested poets, shows interest in how the world works and what it could be. It is no wonder then that these ideas were transmitted over into the ancient Greek epic of the 20th century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, I'm going to give it a couple more minutes just to let some questions come in. Um, it looks like we have one from Aries Aurelian asking for some clarification. Um, I think they're asking about the yep. meaning of stokeia. Yes, so stokeia um, in Greek means um, letter or element. So it's the word, word used in that um, passage, uh, where, where's it gone? Here, um, in Aristotle to refer to letters, stokeion, um, which is then the word also used um, or uh, translated as elementa in the um, Lucretius passage. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have a little bit of a delay on the stream, I think. So, um, That's all right. how did you come about finding this, uh, finding this work? I mean, it's something that I've never heard of. I don't think a lot of people have. You mentioned your abstract. It's it's understudied in academia. Yes, very fortunately, very much so. Um, yeah, so the, I came across it, bef um, I think like, during my A-levels before I went to university, I found a, um, a video on YouTube made by the author's son in which he put up an animation of um, the, the crew spaceship flying throughout the cosmos. And over that animation, um, Chris Adlow's son um, recited the proem of the, um, the astronaut Hillier in Greek as the audio. I thought, oh, this is quite interesting. And then I thought, you know, and then Oxford has a copy in its um, central library. So I got it out um, once I had learned a bit more Homer and Greek and then started reading it. And then the rest is history, you know, and locked down as um, biography of mine mentioned, um, I, I started getting really into this thing. And I've been reading it an awful lot since trying to study it more and more. Because yeah, no one has written an ancient Greek epic since the Renaissance. This is the first ancient Greek poem in over 400 years. It's utterly unique. And I would love it to be more widely known and more widely studied. Fingers crossed that my translation will uh, help deal with that problem. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see how the story can be translated from ancient Greek to a more modern era. Obviously this is 30 years ago, but still very interesting. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions pop up. A couple, <laughs> a couple comments from uh, what appears to be the warrior queen Boudicca herself. Um, and curiosity is key, which is definitely something that we can agree with. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. I am going to pass it on to our next presenter at this point. But thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. Make sure this is going on. All right, so our next presenter is Dr. Georgina Longley, and she will be presenting her work on Herodotus, the crafty historian, and the exploration of technology in Herodotus's histories. Georgina completed her undergraduate degree, master's, and doctor of philosophy at the University of Oxford. Her doctorate focused on the ancient Greek historian Polybius and his methods of political and behavioral analysis. She has always maintained her interest in research and writing, although not in full-time academia. 
She's preparing her DPhil for publication with Oxford University Press. And her first book, Commentary on One of the New A-Level Latin Set Texts, was released February 2023. Cicero Pro Caillo, a selection for Bloomsbury. She has also published two articles and volumes for OUP and has written three reviews for Bryn Mawr Classical Review. In 21 and 2022, Georgina presented at the Save Ancient Studies Alliance online conference and is a co-editor on the volume based on our first conference currently in preparation. She taught for three years at the University of Oxford and loved teaching and wanted to bring classics to a wider audience. She moved into school teaching for nine years. She was actively involved in outreach and access widening projects throughout her teaching career and now tutors privately and writes and researches independently, maintaining her website focused on promoting classics and her blog. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Longley. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Taylor. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And can I also thank Ben for that um, amazing opening uh, uh, paper for this panel. Thank you very much. Can everyone see that okay? Uh, yeah. Okay, that should be shared now. Please, anyone, anyway, someone say if I've got this massively. Okay. Yes, we can see your screen. Brilliant. Okay, cool. Right, thank you very much. Okay, so Herodotus the Crafty Historian. So technology has never been more advanced than it is today. We can, for example, control our homes from our phones and our media bring us daily reports of the latest smartphone or ever advancing AI, often alarmingly. Reports tell of awe-inspiring and jaw-dropping creations, unusual constructions showing our resourcefulness and skill, or particular objects of great cultural significance. We are naturally fascinated by what we create as human beings, how we innovate, how we use our resources, and the significance we attach to what we have produced. And we haven't changed a great deal for a very long time. And as I will show in this paper, these are themes that we also find in the great father of history, Herodotus. He furnishes us with abundant examples of human innovation, creativity, and skill. So without further ado, on to Herodotus himself. Herodotus was from Halicarnassus in Ionia which had from at least the archaic period been an absolute hub for creativity, innovation and technology, science and philosophy and geographical curiosity. It was where the um, philosophers we often know as the pre-Socratics came from, for example. So he had grown up in this atmosphere of innovation, creativity and exploration. And the atmosphere of this dynamic center greatly influenced what he valued as important for the historical record. Art, technology and science are central to his work. Perhaps they do not make up as much space as wars and statesmen, but they are certainly there in expressive numbers. As he says at the beginning of his work, when he's telling us why one should write history, so that the things done by men should not fade with time and that the great and wondrous deeds shown by both Greek and non-Greek should not be without fame not just victories and uh, great elections either. Herodotus' purpose in recording deeds relating to technology, engineering and art are both celebratory, but also anthropological and cultural. My investigation will proceed as follows. Firstly, I shall look at objects and building constructions. He classes worthy of note, the marvelous, the unusual and the impressive. I shall then look at how he explores the adaptability of human creativity and skill. My third topic is pivotal pieces, objects that are historiographically or symbolically significant. And finally, we shall look at ancient art heists. More on that later. So first up, things worthy of note. The fact that Herodotus names a number of craftsmen responsible for works he describes clearly shows that technological achievements are an important part of the deeds he wished to commit to human memory. We see Eupalinus, son of Nostrophus of Megara, Glaucus the Chian, Theodorus of Samos, Roike, son of Philus, and Mandricles the Samian. Now, one of Herodotus's key examples of engineering feats that he considers highly worthy of mention are three creations he attributes to the Samians. 
I'll apologise for the pun in the title. I'm sorry. Um, the account occupies section 60 of book three and is placed just before the narrative switches from Samos back to his main narrative of Persia. He concludes thus. I have spoken about the Samians at such length because the three greatest works of all the Greeks were constructed by them. His emphasis on the importance of such works as part of history could not be clearer. The first is a water channel dug through a high mountain to bring water from a spring to the city. He even describes its measurements in details and accurate or not, these reflect the importance they attaches to this achievement. The second work is a bank enclosing the Samian harbour, dug down to a great depth. And the third is the temple that was first constructed by Roikius, a Samian architect. The work reflects a high level of craftsmanship and skill and have thus earned their place in historic Herodotus' account. Herodotus also records and designs and feats that he regards as clever or prudent, not just those of remarkable size or splendour, such as the great Egyptian temples of his second book. Babylonian Queen Nitocris is praised for her replanning of the city's layout with an eye on the city's safety. He mentions several monuments attributable to Nitocris. However, what he particularly praises at 185 is her labyrinth-like diversions of the Euphrates through and around Babylon in a bid to delay and confuse any would-be invaders. Then they were particularly frightened of the Medes. So he says, but by digging canals higher up, she made the river so crooked that its course now passes through one of the Assyrian villages three times. The village by which the Euphrates flows is called Adarika. That's some deja vu. So she set the course so that anyone entering by the river would have an awful task taking Babylon. It worked for a long time, but eventually Cyrus cracked it. However, the invention represents the wisdom for which Herodotus seeks to praise her. We are no less impressed nowadays by clever innovation and creative engagement with our landscape. Herodotus, similarly impressed, wishes his readers to be aware of these remarkable examples of human ingenuity and capacity for innovation. Different people, different skills. Herodotus on the diversity of human creativity and resources. It has long been noticed that there is a very important anthropological aspect in Herodotus' work, as evidenced in his interest in other peoples, their practices and customs, which includes their crafts, materials and resources, and their creative deployment. Their use often determined by what is available locally in terms of resources. In book three, at the end of the Persian spies tour of the city of the Ethiopians and the food bearing table of the sun, Herodotus describes the burial practices of the, pe of the long lived people. And they come lastly to the coffins of the dead. These, he said, are made from a pliable, transparent stone, mined in abundance in that area. They then set around it, that is the corpse, a pillar of clear crystal like stone, which they dig plentifully from the ground and which is highly malleable. Herodotus seems to expect that his Greek audience would be unfamiliar with the unusual of stone, giving a vivid account of how the Ethiopians use the unusual material that is widely available to them to create pillars through which they can put their mummified uh, dead um, citizens on display. The pillar is placed in the house of the dead person's relatives for a year and worship before it is displayed around the city, displaying the corpse, which is painted and made to look like the dead person did in life. The second example comes in book three, showing Herodotus' interest in the diversity of peoples across the world which he seeks to paint for us. He describes a type of reed, from which a certain tribe of Indians make not only their boats, but also their breastplates, which they weave from it. It comes in the digression on the Indian peoples following his description of the tribute and provinces of the Persian Empire. Finally, we come to a rather sweet story from the, uh, the histories called, um, where he describes a little tail cart made by Arabian shepherds. Yes, you heard that right, it is a tail cart. The breed of sheep possesses a tail so long, nine feet, according to Herodotus, 
that it would cause injury if it were allowed to trail on the ground. However, every shepherd there knows sufficient carpentry to make little carts, which they bind under the tails, tying the tail of each sheep on its own cart. And thus, sheep can avoid sores and wounds to their tails. So from this, we can see whether we're talking about um, great pillars made from crystals like stone or little tail carts, Herodotus recognised and was interested in humans' ability to adapt and effectively work the materials available to peoples to create and solve problems they face or achieve particular goals. OK, we come now to pivotal pieces. We humans like to attach importance to objects. For example, they may have been central to historical events or possess a particular symbolic value, a personal sentimental meaning, such as an heirloom, for example. And Herodotus tells us of similar objects. The first one is a map, which Aristagoras of Miletus brings on a visit to Cleomenes of Sparta. Aristagoras claims that the map represents the entire world. His aim in bringing this map to Cleomenes is to spur the Spartan king on to join him in driving the Persians out of Ionia. As he elaborates, he moves eastwards to the Lydians, then to the Phrygians, pointing to the map as he traces the journey of the proposed conquest. The map is pivotal in Aristagoras' attempt to win Cleomenes over. Is this story really true and did the map really exist? We cannot be sure. However, that matters perhaps less than what it represents. It represents the growing interest in geography and the lands beyond Greece and Ionia, which was visible from the 6th century BC onwards, not entirely disconnected from the expanding horizons of the Persian Empire. Before Herodotus, Hecateus of Miletus had recounted the history, customs and practices of many peoples. So whether the map was real or not, its symbolic purpose is perhaps more revealing, pointing to a growing zeal for discovery and exploration, a trend which influenced Herodotus and with which he actively engaged. With such widening horizons and diversity of peoples and lands, the stakes would be conquerors set their sights on were also rising. This is also what the map symbolizes in Aristagoras' argument. The second item is the famous ring of Polycrates, which ominously returns to confirm the excessive good fortune of the Samian tyrant. Notwithstanding the folkloric element of the tale, a ring that magically returns in the belly of a fish, Herodotus grounds this episode more historically, detailing the appearance of the ring and its creator. Please excuse the Tolkien reference. Polycrates, he wore a seal, an emerald set in gold, crafted by Theodorus, son of Telecles of Samos. Polycrates is advised by Amasis of Egypt to take pains to end his good fortune, fearing he will come to an untimely end. Considering his ring his most precious possession, he cast it into the sea in front of an audience in a bid to fabricate a misfortune. Uh, this fails. But the significance of the ring is not just its ominous um, portending of Polycrates uh, un later device. Herodotus depicts it as an item created by great skill, whose maker is worthy of mention. Thus, in Herodotus, crafts and creators can be central to a story, whether they are more practical in provoking a keen conqueror, like the map, or more weirdly and thematically symbolic, like the ring. Okay, my final um, area for today is ancient art heists, crafts with a cultural significance. A type of object often recorded in Herodotus are artworks commissioned and skillfully created as offerings to gods or as gifts between rulers to establish friendships or alliances. The relevance of these objects is twofold. They reveal the technological skill possessed by craftsmen of their time, Herodotus often names the creators, but they also reveal the very real cultural importance that these creations represented. Their theft caused outrage. And here we shall look at the history of a bowl and a breastplate. At 151, Herodotus describes a large bowl, quite likely the, also produced by Theodorus, 
and he states that it is of no ordinary craftsmanship. The bowl was commissioned by King Croesus and sent to Delphi as an offering where it came to feature prominently in the feast of the Theophania, the divine appearance. Another bowl, being brought to Croesus this time by the Spartans as a gift, comes to lie at the heart of Spartan resentment against the Sanians. At 170, Herodotus describes the splendid size and adornment of the piece, carefully crafted as an illustration of Spartan respect and willingness to cooperate with Croesus. A bowl of bronze it was, engraved with figures and large enough to hold 2,700 gallons, and brought it with the intention of making a gift in return to Croesus. But this bowl never reached Sardis, for which two reasons are given. The Lacedaemonians say that when the bowl was near Samos on its way to Sardis, the Samians descended upon them in warships and carried it off. However, Herodotus shrouds this in mystery, as the Samians claim the Spartans sold it to them after hearing of the fall of Sardis. The issue of the bowl appears at 347, when the Spartans join a group of exiled Samians in their bid to overthrow Polycrates, citing the theft of the bowl as their motive. At 347, Herodotus goes on to describe another object, an exquisite breastplate sent by Amasis to the Spartans as a gift. What makes it worthy of wonder, he writes, is that each thread of the breastplate, each being fine, is made up of 360 strands, each clearly to be seen. Thus Herodotus once again celebrates the magnificent talent that created the object. That the Egyptians were skilled embroiderers appears also in the book of Ezekiel. It is an object worthy of wonder, he says. Such was the care lavished on objects that either symbolized or proffered alliance or meant for the divine. To conclude, the significance of the study I have offered you today has been twofold, I believe. Firstly, the interest in recording and hearing about innovations from clever riven diversions to AI connects us and the fifth century BC as curious and creative humans. Secondly, I think we can see Herodotus at the start of a hitherto underestimated tradition of ancient historiography. Craft, different techniques, remarkable objects and their creators were very important back then too. Herodotus records a diversity of approach and practice, commemorates the skill possessed by craftsmen, and eulogizes the advancement of engineering and art. For Herodotus, this made them worthy of commemoration so that they should not pass out of human memory and should not be forgotten. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Longley. That was a very entertaining presentation. Um, I'm just looking through to see if we have any questions. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, a few comments, um, a reference to the odd couple. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for that presentation. I thought it was very interesting. It's interesting to look at it not only from a historical aspect, but uh, from the anthropological as well. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Give it another thank couple you. seconds. We do have a bit of a delay on the stream. Getting some uh, applause emojis. <laughs> Just to say, I had to. I didn't put anything about medicine in it, but that's very big in Herodotus' histories as well. Though a lot of people looked at how it shapes his method, um, how he celebrates it as an act of innovation hasn't been done uh, so much. But I, I couldn't quite put everything in. But that's a pretty cool aspect of the histories as well, the celebration of medical advances. Yeah, definitely hard to uh, pare Herodotus down to twenty minutes, but you did. <laughs> You yes. <laughs> yeah. Can't quite get everything in, but he's a great, yes. great author. All right. At this point, I think we are going to turn it over to our next participant, uh, Patrick Clancy. <laughs> Thank you again, Dr. Longley. Um, it was very You're enjoyable. Very welcome. Thank today. you. Well, thank you for inviting me back again this year. It's been great. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Great. Thank you. Next slide. There we go. All right. So our next presenter is going to be Patrick Clancy on the, uh, pardon my pronunciation, but I believe it's Agoye, um, from what I looked up, something like that. Um, Transmission of Culture and Science. 
Uh, Patrick Clancy obtained his bachelor's from Canisius College in 2015 with a double major in classical Hellenic studies and communication with a focus on advertising. He then worked in the advertising field for three years before returning to his education in 2018. He obtained his master's in classics from the University of Buffalo in 2020. Patrick is currently an academic advisor at Bryant and Stratton College Online and is a PhD student at the Uni University of Birmingham, United Kingdom, researching the importance of athletics and athleticism in classical Spartan culture. His career goals are to continue working in higher education administration and serve as an advocate for ancient history and the humanities. So now we're going to turn it over to Patrick. Hello, can everyone hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Very good. Yes, it's the uh, the Agoge, um, something that I know um, a lot of people are not super familiar with Sparta, um, but that's all right. Uh, the point of this uh, presentation uh, today is to um, make this as, as entry level as possible. Um, hopefully any questions, you know, I can uh, shore up any uh, any questions that we have on everything. Um, and before I do get started, I um, also want to say a big thank you to um, the organizers today um, to put on this wonderful conference. It's been great to uh, all day have all of these amazing talks going on. Uh, everyone is just so fascinating, and it's great to see it from all different angles. Um, but can uh, can everyone see my uh, my presentation? Yes, we can see it. All right, good. I'll get started then. Um, so yes, uh, the classical Spartans were primarily known for their military. However, this is just one aspect of uh, one thread of a rich tapestry of interwoven threads that was Spartan culture. Uh, one thread which set them apart from other poles, our city-states, uh, was their state-sponsored schooling known as the agoge. Um, through, although an exact agoge curriculum likely never existed. Uh, we do know the Agoge is where future Spartan citizens, Spartiates, learned about and integrated into their, cult their culture. Uh, this paper will focus on the Spartan diet, uh, its cultural importance, um, which was likely transmitted through the Agoge, um, and connect the ancient social norms and sources to contemporary scientific research. So we'll start off with... Um, you know, what the Goge was, um, how it um, focused on their diet, um, and then get into uh, Ariston, which was, uh, we'll, we'll get into when, when we're there. Um, but yeah, so we'll be focusing on that. So understanding the Spartans comes from understanding their culture. As the Spartans had a transactional relationship with the Agoge, um, they shaped it to fit their needs, and in turn, the Agoge shaped the future generations of Spartan soldiers. Uh, this created a culture feedback loop with highly enforced social norms that were passed down through the Agoge um, with few changes for generations. Uh, the Agoge had an intense focus on physical education, which served two purposes. Um, the first purpose was the utilization of athletic to socially condition discipline into future Spartiates um, so that they would adhere to strict laws. And the second was to harness that discipline and physical fitness on the hoplite battlefield. Oops. So um, the Agoge education began um, when the Pides or boys were around seven years old. Um, and this is uh, where they were introduced they were introduced to discipline, tough, toughness, physical fitness, and rhythm. Uh, it was a time when the boys began harsh training uh, to become future citizen soldiers. Um, and under intense observation, Pides were highly encouraged uh, through competitive sport to display their strength, aggression, and leadership qualities. Uh, they trained while running races, wrestling, jumping, as well as in throwing discus and javelin. 
Uh, hunting was introduced to Pydes, uh, and Xenophon suggested that uh, hunting be started at this age, as it taught many life lessons, instilled discipline, promoted endurance through exercise, as well as in general prepared for military service. Hunting was always done as a collaborative or team activity, um, and hunting parties were made of mixed age groups, possibly um, from one's messmates. Uh, game from the hunt would be shared during Depnon, uh, which is the evening meal held in the Sicitia, uh, the communal mess. So, hunting wasn't the only way Pydes were able to get food. Uh, their prefect, or Eren, um, who was a member of the Hibontes age group, provided rations to share for the troop of Pydes to prevent them from starving. Uh, Pydes were also encouraged to steal supplemental nutrition, provided that they were not caught stealing. Um, that's the big asterisk on there. Um, on the stealing of food, Xenophon seems to imply that this made them better soldiers, that they were able to provide for themselves on campaign. So, after the Pydes uh, age group came the Pydiskoi, when the boys became boy-ish. Um, while there is some debate on if this age group started at 12 or 14 and lasted until either 18 or 20, um, it is certainly when the physical education became significantly more intense. They experienced quasi-military discipline um, and even began sleeping in barracks. Uh, the games they played, such as Phyromachia, Battle Ball, or Platinistas, uh, the Grove of the Plain Trees, were highly competitive as well as incredibly violent. Um, however, uh, these games were not violent simply for the sake of being violent. Instead, they were intended to educate the future Spartiates on the culture they were growing up in and how to play the role of a soldier in their society. It is also believed um, at the Padisco age group uh, when pederastic relationships began with older Spartiates, um, the Padiscoi were invited as guests um, to the Sicitia um, for them to witness what Spartan culture was really like. Um, competition for these relationships were likely fierce um, and reputation based for both Erastai, lovers, and Eromanoi, um, those who are beloved. Um, athletic displays may have been used to increase reputation or at least invite attention for both Erastes and Eromanoi. So the Hibontes this is the final age group. So these were no longer boys in the Agoge. However, they were also not men with complete citizenship status, uh, meaning they couldn't run for elected office or on most occasions even leave Sparta. Uh, their education formally ended and the focus shifted from learning athletics and their culture to demonstrate, demonstrating their athletic prowess in the Spartan army. Hebontes had the strongest spirit of rivalry, um, which made their sections in the chorus and their athletic contests the finest to watch. Um, and in fact, the level of rivalry was so strong that Hibontes frequently got into fistfights with each other. They were often, they were competing so vigorously um, because they wanted to be elected into a fiditia, a dining club, uh, to become members of the Hippes, uh, the Knights, or possibly even to become a member of the secretive Cryptea. Um, all of these were um, selected on merit. Uh, and a major indicator that merit was um, centrally on athletic performance, or at least the perception of athleticism, as the Spartans selected troops for um, certain positions based on physical fitness or even just on physical appearance. So after the um, completing the Igoge, members from the Hibontes age group needed to be unanimously accepted into a Fiditia, um, which was possibly comprised of 15 to 30 men, mixed age groups. Um, Hibontes needed to demonstrate their valor, reliability, and dedication to the Spartan way of life, um, as there is evidence that each Fiditia or closely linked Fiditia um, made up a military unit known as an Amotia. So, as Pydes, they were introduced to communal din dining by the Eren. Um, as Padiskoi and Eromanoi, they were brought to witness the Sicitia 
by the Erastes, and finally, when they were Hebontes, they were up for election into their own fiditia. Um, their cultural schooling all led to the education, uh, to the election into a fiditia, and um, they would prove their merit um, by performing well in athletic contests against peers. This allowed Spartiates the ability to become homoioi, or similars, um, with their fellow citizens through status, athletics, and even through diet. So the Spartans not only held great cultural significance on the election into the Fiditia, um, but they also placed a great importance on their diet. So Sparta, unlike other poles, um, provided rations for um, its citizens, which were all pooled together from a mess tax taken from all Spartiates. Uh, food was made available to all citizens and to those in the agoge, um, and it was prepared by enslaved helots um, who would have acted as hereditary cooks. Um, the Spartans believed that their diet supported men to grow tall and slim um, by providing them not too much food nor too little um, and encouraged them to stay away from excessive wine drinking. Uh, they not only needed to keep up their portions by, provo pr by providing their mestus, but they also needed to keep up their physical um, appearance uh, and fitness. So in general, um, the Spartans were famous for their simple and at times less appealing food. Um, they also seemed to disdain sweets, um, which they believed only should be enjoyed in small amounts. Uh, in particular, they had a black broth, uh, likely a mixture of pork, blood, vinegar, and salt, um, which was not well received by outsiders, as you can read from the quotes there. Um, the Spartans also typically ate burgers or patties of uncooked barley, uh, alfitia, um, which could have also been made into gruel, porridge, or a mash, um, something Roman soldiers would have been given as a punishment was their normal meal. Uh, however, this lack of processing would have also would have at least served nutritional purposes as unrefined cereal helps to protect um, cardiovascular systems and supplies soluble fi fiber, folic acid, antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals. So barley was a hardier crop um, than wheat. So typically only Spartiates um, grew, uh, wealthier Spartiates grew wheat to share with their Fiditia members. Um, their helot ram farms or cleroi in Messenia uh, were fertile and provided much of the cereal production for Sparta. So the average ordinary Spartan cleroi is estimated to be around um, 18.41 hectares, um, while the average elite Spartan owned Cleroi was likely closer to 44.62 hectares. Um, the ordinary um, Cleroi had to had the potential to produce around uh, 34,329 calories per day um, worth of foodstuffs for personal use, helot use, mess tax, um, as well as a surplus to protect against bad harvest years. Um, it has been estimated that Cleroi needed to be at least 10 hectares to um, produce enough for a Spartiate to support his needs and fulfill the mess tax requirement. Uh, Hodkinson uh, believes that the average Greek ate a one adequinic of uh, barley per day, um, which he estimates to be around 2,803 calories. Uh, Hodkinson estimated that uh, Spartiate Mestus may have been around 5,294 calories um, worth of barley. Uh, he then adds 1,100 more calories of supplementary donations for olive oil, wine, cheese, figs, nuts for a piclion, a dessert course, and opson, a uh, bread relish, bringing the total to around 6,394 calories for the evening meal of Depnon. And um, the common measurements used for this base estimation um, for portion sizes given to us from Thucydides, um, the, from the truce at Sphacteria in 425 BCE. Um, this truce allowed Spartiate prisoners and their hell attendants to um, two adequinicus of alfita, barley, um, two colotei of wine, and an unmeasured amount of meat. Um, this has been estimated to be around 4,641 calories. Um, this gives us around 2,300 calories if 
you know, split down the half, um, but likely they were not given equal shares for the helots. So while these numbers are important to gain perspective, um, the Spartans didn't know what calories were. They certainly didn't count calories in food um, the way that we do. Um, and additionally, even with contemporary numbers, so like 3,320 uh, calories is su suggested for very active in individuals. Um, this is for industrialized societies with food processing and an abundance of raw material globally, uh, which I do not believe necessarily applies to uh, classical Greece. So. For some perspective, a 2004 study of sumo wrestlers who stood between um, five foot eight and six one and weighed between 200 um, and 340 pounds ate a mean of 4,305 calories per day. To compare uh, contemporary European or American adult males stand approximately around 5'9 and weigh around 196 pounds. I'm a little bit bigger than that, but that's all right. Uh, remains of ancient Greek males show they average between 5'3, 5'4 um, and likely weighed approximately 132 to 143 pounds. So despite being more active in athletics and hunting than other Greeks, I don't believe that a sumo wrestler's calorie intake could be comparable to ancient Greek or the Spartan diet, especially considering um, larger contemporary persons generally need between 1,500 and 2,000 calories to sustain daily activities. Spartan cuisine underwent minimal processing uh, with many items eaten raw, um, which were more difficult to metabolize. So cooking, Break down, breaks down food, reduces volume, and facilitates easier digestion, which in turn allows humans to eat more food and absorb the nutrients more efficiently. Well, the Spartans were clearly athletes and therefore likely needed a higher, higher calorie intake to sustain their active metabolisms, one must also understand the Spartans um, could have only eaten so much raw, unprocessed food. So on campaign, foraging and hunting were the main sources of procuring pr provisions uh, if a marketplace was not made available. Uh, the Spartans certainly foraged many foodstuffs such as fruits, vegetables, and herbs, which were all likely eaten raw. Um, while describing a hunting expedition uh, during his Anabasis, Xenophon makes an explicit note while in the desert for a period of time, the men had to subsist off meat alone. This specific, this specific mention uh, denotes how ordinary foraging was uh, for the Spartans and that their diet was balanced with meat as well as with wild foraged um, fruits and vegetables. So how much the Spartans ate is still pretty uncertain. We'll likely never have an answer for that. However, when they ate will be made much clearer. So the first meal, Ariston, is often translated as breakfast. Now, while I do not dispute that this meal was the first meal, I do believe that this translation of breakfast is outdated. Um, the translation that I propose is midday meal instead of breakfast, as the, close, the, the meal was closer to noon than it was to dawn. Um, so typically, Greeks ate two meals, Ariston and Depnon. Um, those who could not afford two meals only ate Depnon. Um, as established before, Spartiates were wealthy enough to have land uh, for a mess tax, and thus they could afford two meals. Uh, the Spartans exercised twice a day, um, and it is likely that they exercised in the morning, then had Ariston in the late morning or around midday. Um, their second session of exercise would happen later in the day when it was cooler um, and they had rested after and then in the early evening they likely ate Depnon before turning in for the night. Um, the bulk of this thesis for Ariston around midday comes from reading Xenophon's Anabasis, where he served alongside uh, Spartan mercenaries and under the leadership of Spartan commanders. When Xenophon mentions dawn as an indicator of time, it's usually not followed by breaking the fast with a meal. Instead, it's typically followed by a dawn sacrifice or troop movement, then a break to eat. Um, this is likely due to the fact that accidents happen at the dark um, when you're moving in unfamiliar territory with a large mass of people. 
Um, this trend of movement before and after midday period seems to be noted even for hunting and traveling in general. Um, once Aristam was finished, it appears to be common to have some wine and rest, much like an afternoon siesta. Uh, this midday feasting, then wine drinking, may have also been the reason why the Spartans were caught flat-footed at the Battle of Leuctra. So, Recently, there's been scientific interest in the concept of chrononutrition, or the interaction between meal timing and circadian rhythm. Um, as the circadian rhythm orchestrates metabolism, appetite, energy expenditure, and insulin production. Uh, an afternoon nap does not change the circadian phase. It improves cognition and restores routine metabolic functions. Additionally, the slow wave, slow wave sleep, or SWS, of a nap can improve athletic performance through cellular restoration and greater growth hormone secretion. So if the Spartans ate Ariston at midday and had their Dapnon in the evening, this fasting period is similar to time-restricted feeding, or TRF. Uh, TRF is a type of intermittent fasting where food is limited to a window of time, typically 8 to 10 hours with or without caloric restriction, CR. Um, generally, intermittent fasting has also been found to de decrease blood pressure, decrease body fat percentage, and improve gut health. Um, there is some evidence that TRF may provide improvement in biomedical risk markers like proper weight management, reduction of appetite, and overall metabolic health when nighttime food is um, avoided. So the elongation of daily fasting during TRF promotes robust oscillations of the circadian clock gene and aids in ATP production or endosine triphosphate, um, which is a chemical compound that stores and releases energy. So with TRF managing appetite and metabolic health, this further elucidates on how the Spartans likely were not eating 6,394 calories. Um, even with the increased exercise, the Spartans experience, uh, the Spartans experience, it appears the evolutionary basis of the human metabolism seems to be based on high intensity of energy demands with erratic food availability. So this type of fasting may also improve the maximum intake of oxygen within the body, known as a VO2 max, uh, thus improving aerobic function, uh, muscle strength, as well as growth and overall athletic endurance. Fasting has shown to have some effect on hormonal responses and the metabolism of glucose Oh, metabolism, uh, glucose, protein, and lipids. Uh, these general factors may have improved overall health for the Spartans, just as it is observed today. Um, so with all of this um, information, it's possible, if not likely, that the Spartans observed the positive effects from their eating habits, adopted them into their athletic culture, and continually transferred that cultural knowledge through the agoge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, it was very interesting. I know we all think we know a lot about the Spartans, but it's very interesting to see just uh, how much scientific knowledge that you can gain from them. Um, the one question that I'm seeing so far, um, besides a question about rewatching videos, which yes, you can rewatch the videos. They'll be hosted, I believe, on our website, if not our YouTube channel. Um, Felix the cat asks, how accurate are these data? I think they're wondering um, kind of where are you getting your information from, I assume. I obviously Absolutely. you've got great sources. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that is the unfortunate part. Um, there's a wonderful uh, property and wealth in classical Sparta, um, Stephen Hodkinson, as well as others. Um, but Hodkinson is the, the most recent and um, the most comprehensive, um, follows so many um, aggregates of data on potential land use, um, as well as that. Um, that is the unfortunate part is this is an exercise um, not in futility, I'll say, because it is important to understand potentially what they could have been producing, how much um, they could have made, which, you know, affects other things as, as you kind of get with this talk. Um, 
but if we're ever going to have an exact no unfortunately we won't um these are just the best estimates that we have with the available information that we have um so they're as accurate as they can be um but unfortunately that's still not too accurate it's it's more of a theoretical um theoretical process than it is oh this is actually what they did now we know how, what they ate um, because there are records that they had not great food um, but in general they also had the access to the same things that um, other Greek cities had um, and that they enjoyed um, but in general they were not known for the best types of food Got it. Thank you. Yeah, such is the nature of ancient studies that uh, we can only really hypothesize. You can't know exactly what was going on there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, so at this point, I'm going to say thank you, Patrick. Was there anything else you wanted to add? We do have a little bit more time. We are running a bit ahead. Yeah, sure. I mean, the one thing um, that I did want to add, again, uh, as a thank you um, to Sasa, this is just an absolutely fantastic conference. Um, but also with the um, kind of ongoing of the calories and everything, of course, it's not entirely 100% um, accurate, as well as the other scientific information that I have. Um, but I do think it's important um, to engage in these thought processes um, and kind of engage with the scientific community as well as we're looking to save ancient studies um, to find uh, how we can make ourselves um, available to the the departments that are getting funding well we can show them hey you can even find information on that in the ancient world as well and give yourself some uh, standpoint from a historical perspective Okay, great. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you. Um, at this point, I believe I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Emily Ferry. Uh, I apologize, Emily, we did have some technical difficulties, but hopefully you're in with us now. Um, I just want to make sure. So I'll give you the intro. And we will go from there. Uh, if you do need me, I can share my screen to show your pictures if it winds up happening that way. But let me give you the intro. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Great. Hi. Um, yes, I am having uh, I'm having just a little bit of um, of a technical issue with uh, with loading, but I just want to say hello first and to introduce myself. Um, my name is uh, is Dr. Emily Ferry. Uh, I've been working in classics for a very, very long time, um, doing a lot of work in the CUNY Graduate Center, the CUNY system, um, Sarah Lawrence most recently, sometimes uh, Drew University. Um, I actually, uh, I think it would be probably good if you would share your screen Julie, actually, that would be really, really helpful um, and share that presentation that I did send to you. Do you think that that would be possible today? Yes, uh, you did send me. Let me just make sure. Yeah, yes. I sent you the link. Your uh, your Arcus link, right? Yes, that's correct. Um, okay. I, just because um, we've been having I've been having so many issues here and I'm finally trying to get it to load on this other computer, but it doesn't. I'm. I'm not going to have another uh, another issue, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Um, it doesn't take me to like a, a presentation with slides. There are images that would you? Yes. It's like a that's like correct a paper. Okay, great. Yeah. So I will share that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can people see? People can see the hydraulis page. Can you see, everybody can see the presentation? Just um, sure. That is great, thank you. You can see it, okay, great. Uh, okay. Just let me know where you want me to scroll and I can go through and show the pictures that you've got and everything. Okay, that's, uh, that's wonderful, Taylor, thank you so much. Um, if you could just, uh, you know, scroll down a little bit now and um, I'll just talk to you for a minute or two about the hydraulis and uh, what it is. 
Um, hydrolysis is an amazing invention from Hellenistic Egypt. And it's one that had an, really an incredible career all through um, the Roman Empire, uh, through the, the Byzantine Empire, um, then down to um, the kingdom of the Franks in uh, the history of, of Islam, the hydralis was spread all around and it even got as far as China at some points. Um, there's quite a lot of resources about the hydralis that I could tell you in detail. Um, my main point of interest today is on the connection between hydralis and public spectacle, particularly the public spectacle of kings, emperors, popes, uh, people who were trying to project an image of power. Um, that is not to say that there weren't um, water organs or even pneumatic organs uh, that were smaller scale used by you know, individuals in the privacy of the home. Nevertheless, it was, it was a, um, a very public instrument, a spectacular instrument, one that could enable all sorts of incredible effects. And I think that it's, um, you know, a really a stunning sort of history that it has. Now let's scroll down a little bit and let's look at our map here. Um, so, the, and let's click on the coin of Arsinoe of Alexandria. We can just uh, start looking at the first slide. Um, so the first invention of the uh, hydraulis is in Hellenistic Egypt in the era of the Ptolemies. And the hydraulis was invented by somebody called Ctesibios of Alexandria. Um, he was a very, very clever man, right? As they say, the son of a barber. Um, and he invented, in addition to the hydraulis, he invented an automaton um, that would pour wine and make a trumpet noise at the same time. We can go on to the next slide. Um, and this automaton, um, let's advance now. This automaton um, was in the shape of the special riton or cup of Arsinoe. Um, so what's interesting about the hydralis is that it was an invention of people, right? Whereas all of the other musical instruments known to the Greeks and Romans were all the inventions of gods. Um, but the hydralis is specifically an invention of people, um, not even a musician, an engineer, this fellow Ctesibios, who was the son of a barber, um, who just had a great yen for mechanical invention in Hellenistic Egypt, a time period when invention of all sorts, when you know sciences like chemistry, anatomy, um, astronomy were all being explored and there was even a joy in experimentation. So Ctesibius just had the good luck to be at this point where science and investigation and practical results and were celebrated um, and even funded and exhibited by people like Arsinoe, the deified queen of the Ptolemies. Um, so I really love this epigram. Um, all lovers of pure wine should go and see this riton in the temple of serene Arsinoe, lover of the west wind. Right? It's like the Egyptian dancer Besos, who gives forth a clear trumpet-like sound. Um, and of course, we go on here, we talk about the waters of the sovereign Nile. All of that is connected with this idea of in inspiration, um, inventive inspiration. Um, and then of course we mention Ctesibios as the inventor of this device. Now, if we scroll down to the next slide, please, um, and then click on the image. Um, this is this really interesting um, representation. It's actually the first artistic representation of a hydraulis. Um, and there's quite a gap, 
right? You don't really get a lot of literary representations or artistic representations for a hundred years or so um, as this invention, news of this invention sort of percolates around. But this is, you know, probably early first century BC and from Alexandria. And, you know, one thing that strikes me about the identity of um, the Salpinx player, that's the character who looks like a trumpeter, is that he also has some of the characteristics of the dwarf god Bessas that was mentioned in Hegelus's epigram. Bess was an Egyptian deity who was especially beloved by female musicians. And he was supposed to instill a kind of a joy in life and a jollity that sadly is in uh, short supply in other periods of history. Um, let's click on the image again and go back to the, uh, the slides now. Um, so as time goes on, right, we trickle in a couple of more early mentions of the hydraulos. And here we have this uh, inscription for this hydraulos player, Antipatros of Eleutherna. Um, I don't think we can really see that that well, but uh, I guess hopefully some other people can. Um, the gist of this inscription is that um, in the context of a whole bunch of other dedicatory inscriptions at Delphi that are celebrating the winners of the victories of musical contests. Um, there's hundreds of these inscriptions that are talking about how such and such won on the, uh, the Choropsaltria, a lot of female musicians as well. Um, they won Agones and then they dedicated this statue to the god or an inscription to the god. So this fellow Antipatros of Eleutherna was actually invited as a special concert to Delphi and was awarded all sorts of special, special treats, including citizenship, right? He uh, got the special status of proxenia um, along with his brother and his entire entourage. Um, and so this hydraulist Antipatros was clearly treated with pretty intense respect. Um, and I think the fact that he was given this inscription in a very public context shows how important and maybe novel it was to have such a new and exciting instrument um, that wasn't perhaps that well known at the time in Delphi. Um, so of course, uh, Antipatros came all the way from Crete, right, to Delphi, the island which you see, you know, to the south there. Um, let's continue on now to the next. So the, unfortunately, the next um, literary mention that we have um, is kind of a, a big jump in time, right, of uh, many decades. And this is in a different cultural context, not Greece now, but Rome. And so because, of course, the Hellenistic Empire is, you know, kingdom by kingdom conquered by the Romans and eaten up. Um, and finally, we get to the next literary mention of the Hydralis, which is by Cicero in his Tusculan Disputations. And what's interesting about this is that Cicero is showing a kind of an intellectual reaction to the Hydralis, which comes not from more recent scientific loving Hellenistic history, but a kind of a relapse to Stoicism and Platonic attitudes in which technical inventions, technical applications of knowledge and science were considered to be lowbrow. And another thing that influences this very critical comment by Cicero is the fact that he's opposed to Epicureans and their pleasure loving ways. But so what this statement by Cicero amounts to is that in fact, the hydraulis is one of the greatest pleasures that is available. And of course he compares it to flower beds, perfumes, and a manual of dissipation. Um, so I think this is a really interesting comment because it kind of shows what Cicero is reacting to, what he's 
responding to must be an upsurge of popularity for the hydraulis in Rome at this time. Um, and I would, I would imagine that more and more and more examples are starting to come in. We can move on here. Um, so around this same time, um, we get a literary mention of the hydraulis by a poet that we call the Etna poet. Um, if you like, you could click on the, uh, the slide and then we could see the, uh, the whole thing. Um, so the Etna poet is an anonymous poet whom some people consider could possibly be Virgil. Um, there's a lot of controversy there, which I'm not going to discuss right now. But what's interesting about this poem um, by the Etna poet, which is actually, this is the poem where he gets his name, the Etna poet, because here he talks about Mount Etna as, um, as a sort of a metaphor for the desire in human beings to achieve great accomplishments and the way that those who attempt to achieve those great accomplishments are constantly buffeted by, by winds and uh, you know the, that pound a mountain like Mount Etna. And he compares that in turn, the inventiveness of such a person who wants to achieve great things to the water organ, uh, the inspiration that is associated with water and the muses by so many poets at this time is here, you know, given a new human slant and, you know, controlled by people finally, as opposed to the gods again. So again, the water organ is this very particularly human instrument that, you know, not only has so many uh, different elements that all come together and kind of represent a unity in one, right? But it's also, it's got this uh, kind of humanity about it recognized here by the Etna poet. So you see, there's a lot of kind of widely varying attitudes about, about this instrument. But the one thing the Etna poet does note here is this uh, booming nature, the loud booming sound, right? As well as a melodious sound. And that kind of variegated nature of the sounds of the water organ become very important in its later history, um, which we're gonna go down and look at in a second. Let's move on a little bit here. Um, oh yeah, so this is a uh, contemporary to the, uh, the Etna poet approximately. Um, now, if you see the little button on the right next to the slide, you could click on that button, all right? Now there's a reconstruction of the Tarsus terracotta, which is, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, it shows here that uh, not only is there a hydraulic element, right? But there's also a man operated pneumatic element um, as they see, this is, you know, just a reconstruction by um, Pero of the Tarsus terracotta. But you can see that the scale of this is a very large instrument. And we can go back now. Um, the size of the hydraulis. Um, Taylor, I'm going to ask you now to go, go on and uh, go all the way down. We're going to go way past a couple of sections here to the next map. Um, actually, stop at uh, Nero, if you go back up, stop at Nero and the, uh, the performance, um, the heading there. Um, Nero and the politics of performance. Um, I'm sorry, I got you slightly off, off base there. Um, in any case, so what happens at this point is that, you know, following the somewhat more respectable um, Julio-Claudian emperors, then, you know, some of the, the emperors who, shall we say, indulged themselves quite a bit more in, in spectacle, uh, took on the hydraulis and revamped it and gave it a new life and a new sort of reputation. And in particular, this is the emperor Nero, 
um, Caligula to some extent as well. Um, but Nero um, practiced the hydraulis, not just as an aficionado, but as a performer. Um, and if we look at uh, the bottom of these, uh, these three quotations that we have here, Nero's real passion was for playing on the organ, right? And towards the end of his life, he declared publicly that if his condition didn't change, he would participate in the games to mark his victory. So, you know, he makes quite a few theatrical appearances on the, uh, the organ. And not only that, he develops new, louder, more variable and larger organs. And in a sense, Nero adapts the hydralis so that it is ready to appear in the gladiatorial games. And so let's move on a little bit now. Um, we have other evidence from the same period as Nero from the Cana Tremalchionis of Petronius um, describing a servant carving the meat in time to the music, like an Esidarius. Now an Esidarius is a type of charioteer. Um, he would fight in the arena as a charioteer. And so the roar of the wheels of the chariot, as well as the roar of the crowd must have been enormous. So an instrument like the hydraulis, which could in fact be very loud and booming when you used its reed pipes as opposed to its flue pipes would be really, really useful, well adapted to the arena. Um, let's move on a little more um, to the next. And as time goes on, right, if we, if we look even at, uh, at later antiquity, um, a hydraulis becomes sort of de rigueur whenever there's any kind of special event, whenever there is you know, a game to be planned and somebody wants a, a real spectacle, the ultimate spectacle, then um, you ask for a hydraulis. And this quotation of Claudian, right, really marking the consulship of, a, you know, Theodorus, a relatively unknown, um, but he was, uh, he, it's described here in such wonderful term, let him whose light touch draws forth mighty sounds, controlling the countless voices of a field of bronze pipes, let his fingers wandering make a sound of thunder, wherein he stirs up violently with a strong lever, the water from whose torment sweet music is born. So you have these overwhelmingly positive views of the hydraulis. But then, of course, if we look at our next quotation, right, we continue to have these reactions from you know, people who might be considered perhaps anti-hedonistic, like this uh, quotation from Ammianus uh, Marcellinus in his Historia. Um, and he sees these hydraulics, these organs being built ever larger and larger, kind of squeezing out the role of philosophy. Um, and so, I mean, I think that you start to see again and again, a dichotomy between the attitudes of people who, who seek pleasures, right? And who seek spectacle and want to take advantage of its effects versus people who would like to avoid spectacle and enter strictly into contemplation and uh, philosophical dialogue, don't appreciate the hydraulis and in fact would like to you know, escape it even. Um, let's look at a few examples of the hydraulis in art and inscription in the later Roman imperial period. And this is you know, from the first century AD, sorry, CE to uh, maybe 400 CE. This is this wonderful example of a carnelian sealstone ring um, first century CE. Um, this, because of the inscription, um, it's an amicus verus wovit is what those letters stand for. And you can see the hydralis and the two little children operating it on either side with the uh, hydralis on top. Um, that means a true friend dedicated it. So it's been hypothesized this might be a gift to a hydralist for a good performance. And we could move on here. Um, and then, of course, this is a very, very famous 
mosaic, um, 75 CE, the Darbuk Amera Villa uh, Gladiators. And what's so wonderful about this is that it really, it shows the close context of the Hydralos um, with gladiatorial games. And if you, if you look at the next, um, at the next slide, we have the, uh, the second, you can click on the, uh, the slide to see the entire image. Um, so anyway, so there were two opposing mosaics, two opposing organs and hydralists to go along with the different gladiatorial scenes. So what's interesting about this is it might presage the later pattern that we see in the Byzantine period where the different circus factions um, for the, uh, the chariot races, the blues and the greens, each have their own organ, their own uh, hydra, as it were. Um, we can move on now. Um, these, uh, these beautiful mosaics, by the way, are, um, sorry, and this is a different mosaic. There are so many wonderful mosaics that show the fascination that people, contemporary people at the time had with gladiatorial combats and the close context that we see the hydraulis in again and again. And here, this is in a very, very different place. This is um, this mosaic from Trier. Um, if we could, uh, we can't really zoom in here, but um, if we could go back to the, uh, the map for a second. Um, if you click on where it says eight medallion scenes for a, mo for a moment, um, we could see the, uh, um, in the text of the slide. And you can scroll down for a moment and you could see some of these, sorry, these, these incredible different mosaics, um, all showing like a different sort of, a different sort of gladiatorial combat. Um, it's actually really, really fascinating. And you can kind of see all of this in, that's the, that's the one right there, the entire mosaic right there all together in one floor. So anyway, these were from, probably created the second, third centuries a, uh, CE. And it, uh, they were in a villa that's probably from the first century CE. Um, in any case, like a hundred years or so after the previous mosaic that we saw. And it's really, um, it's interesting that the Hydraulis has such a close relationship to these gladiatorial games. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that the Hydralis played for certain passages, certain moments, or certain types of fighters for their entrances and exits. Um, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to the presentation now. And we can, uh, we can move on. Um, this is another really, really interesting. So we had, this is art and inscription. There's a couple of inscriptions that closely link the hydraulis with gladiators. And in fact, this is the epitaph of a gladiator, the, Reti the Retiarius Melanippus, right? Who second century CE, who will no longer hear the bronze trumpet nor rouse the clamor of the unequal pipes, which is of course a reference to the hydraulis. Um, which is it's very poignant, right? Very sad because his fellow slaves, Stalos and Zoe, have raised a monument to his memory. Um, we can look at the next slide now. Um, this engraved uh, stele from Asia Minor is just one of many. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, the next one. We're looking at the, uh, these are a couple of, um, of inscriptions. Here's an inscription that shows that this hydraulist was actually also a priest of Dionysus, who is, um, he's being celebrated here for the lavish gift that he made. Um, and he also made a gift to of 360 deniers to the player of the water organ charged with awakening the god. So what this shows here is that the, the water organ was actually used in a ceremony. We can move on here. Um, 
from the third century AD. So another sort of hot spot of Hydraule seems to be in Aquincum, which is modern Budapest. Um, so this is the sarcophagus of Elia Sabina, who was the wife of a legionary hydraulist, and she herself was a hydraulist player. Um, sorry, let's go back to that uh, second slide there, um, which shows the text, and you can click on it if you want to. Um, so what shows here is that she and her husband operated together as a hydraulist team, as it were. Um, and it's interesting that that was a fixed position in a legion, a military, a legionary hydraulist even, was, uh, was on the regular payroll, as well as his wife, sort of part of his entourage. Um, and I think that, you know, it's been suggested even that this might indicate there's some kind of temporary gladiatorial combats going on in the legions in Aquincum here, um, which would really be ancient Pannonia um, now, you know, Hungary, so some different places. And so in Aquincum, there's even yet another inscription, um, if you click onto the, the next one, um, which is in fact on the remains of an organ that was found in, uh, it's a, really an archeological, a material remain of an organ that has a, a plaque attached to it. Um, so, I mean, I think it shows quite a lot of kind of interest in the hydraulis in a public sphere. Um, let's go back and move on now. And so I'm now moving to the next section of the talk that I wanted to discuss, which is the, the organ in Byzantium. Um, and really it's the organ in uh, Byzantium and beyond. Um, can we click on the slide for one second? And we could see uh, a series of different scenes from the obelisk of Theodosius. So Theodosius was an emperor who, he loved the organ and he was also an emperor in Constantinople as opposed to Rome. But, you know, really in the, uh, the late fourth century CE, um, he, was, he was thus kind of standing at the beginning of the, the tradition concerning the hydraulis in Byzantium. Um, so here we have uh, this scene from the obelisk. He brought this wonderful obelisk from Egypt which had been there since the time of Tutmos III, um, you know, 1500 BCE or so, he brought it to Constantinople and set it up on a new pedestal that was decorated with scenes of his, his exploits, um, scenes of people submitting to him, and in particular, scenes of a chariot race with the blues and the greens on either side, each with their own particular organ. And so what you see in that image is the blues and greens on either side um, all kind of paying him homage. So there's the uh, the emperor in the center and down at the bottom right of the picture you can see the organ, the particular organ. Um, I think that's the greens there. Um, and then if we scroll to the next image um, in the, uh, the right there there's one more piece of media. Then we have kind of a close-up like, and you can see the rear of the, uh, the side. Um, we can come out of this now and the next slides. Um, so, talking about and the very public space of the water or obelisk is more and more water organs, their noises seem to be in the public sphere. Um, this is a quotation of Isaac in the mid fifth century. Um, it kind of shows the perspective again, the reaction of one of the early church fathers who 
is intrigued by, is even sort of lured in, right, by the water organ in this film, um, which was Syriac. But this decides that, in fact, to worship God the way that he wants to worship it, he has to avoid the organ, devote himself to a monastic life, and only praise God with his own voice, not with the sound of a musical instrument. Emily, I'm so um, sorry to interrupt. And showing this pattern of how... Uh, I'm yeah, sorry. Um, we're getting say that again? Audio. I didn't hear you. We're getting some audio issues on your end. Would you mind just cu uh, shutting off your camera to see if that helps? Oh, okay, sure. Um, that I'm going to try shutting it off. All right, is that any better with the audio? Um, it's. A little so chopping. Any better with um, the I think it's better with the camera off. Yeah, if you just leave it off, I think that sound is better. Yeah, is that better? Yes, that's much better. Okay, Thank so you. is that better now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, Taylor, let's move on from Isaac of Antioch. If that's okay. Um, we have another reference to a hydraulis by an Arab captive in Byzantium in 867. Um, if we uh, can click on that next slide. Um, this is a, a captive who, who sees and sort of marvels at, sorry, we can go back, marvels at the, uh, the instrument, which is um, at a banquet given for the Muslim captives on Christmas day by Emperor Basil I. Um, so again, <clears throat> this is exhibited at a very public celebratory event. Um, we can move on to the next slide. And again, we can, I think we can uh, skip past. We don't have to enter into uh, this slide all the way, but just to point out some more uh, Byzantine emperors like Theophilus, like Constantine Porphyrogigicus, they're all using organs in order to announce their entrances and exits. And they're doing this in Congress with the blue and the green circus factions, all with their own particular organs. And then the emperor responding with his own organ in turn. And now moving on further down here. So finally, we get back to Western Europe. And so all during this time, um, after the destruction of the, the uh, Western Roman Empire, um, the water organ and organs in general have been really forgotten um, in places like France, places like England and Italy. Um, so in fact, it's in the kingdom of the Franks, um, the father of Charlemagne, Pepin the Short, um, requests a water organ from the Emperor Constantine V of Byzantium, and the water organ is delivered. And all of the different annals of that year describe uh, the water organ being delivered. And sometimes that is the only event that is described. Eistulf falls off his horse and a water organ is delivered. And of course, this organ arrives in his domain at Compiègne to his palace at A or Ashen, and it causes a lot of excitement. Um, and again, it reinforces, it enhances the imperial prestige, right? The royal prestige of the king. Um, but so once, once this happens, the next step is that people in Western Europe want to be able to create organs of their own. And for quite some time, they are, you know, for another generation or so, they are unable to do this. Um, and it's actually with the son of Charlemagne um, that we get uh, Louis the Pious, um, that we get the advent of Gior Georgius the mon monk of Venice, who probably had been in contact with Byzantine organ builders and 
you know, and learned how to build the secrets of the organ, he comes and he, you know, he creates an organ for Louis the Pious. Um, and then Louis is so excited, so happy about this, that he installs Georgius as, um, he installs him in an abbey and kind of puts him in charge of his own domain, sets him to building organs, sets him to teaching the craft to all sorts of disciples. Um, and if you scan through those different uh, media, right, then you can see, right, the different information about that. Um, the final one, I think, talks about how he, um, you know, he, he teaches the craft to others. And then eventually, um, we start to see other people besides kings seeking royal, uh, the royal power of the organ out. We see popes, Pope John VIII, um, commissioning a bishop to try and get him an organ, or else he wants an organ and he wants someone who knows how to play an organ. Um, otherwise, he's going to be criticized for slothful negligence, which I find, uh, you know, kind of kind of uh, telling. Um, so, as you know, as time goes on, of course, the organ becomes more and more celebrated, more and more of an emblem of uh, of might and power and unity. And so, what's interesting is that in the early days of the of the church in, you know, the period up to around a thousand CE or so. Um, music and the church, instrumental music was kind of off limits, right? And so it's, it's with royal power that we see these first um, kind of celebrations of the organ. Um, but I think because of the connection of Georgius the monk, and the fact that organ builders were also people who could teach the organ. Um, the fact that so much of the political power also resided with religious figures in this time. Um, I think that that shows why the, you know, the interest in organs gradually shifts over to the religious side. Anyway, these are some very interesting poems um, which talk about essentially, you know, the inferiority complex that the people in the Frankish kingdom felt in the past because they didn't have an organ and how that is all better now because now they have an organ. And, you know, the, the impression that the organ makes on these different poets is really astonishing. Um, it's, you know, it's seen as just a miracle and a marvel a subtle melody setting people's hearts dancing anyway it's um it's a deserving of closer inspection but i want to uh kind of see the final trajectory um of the organ um i i'm interested in coming to terms with organ music in medieval church but um i'm going to sort of move past this for now because we are relatively short on time. And what I wanna talk about now is this final sort of discussion of um, the organ in the, in the Muslim, in the early Islam and China. Um, so all through the Middle Ages and through the Byzantine Empire, um, scholars in the, is, in the kingdom, early Islamic kingdoms had access to Greek texts discussing the organs. And of course, then they in turn, they have access to the instruments themselves from the Byzantines. So in a, around 1260 or 1264, an organ is sent from probably officials or authorities in Baghdad to the emperor Shi Tzu or Kublai Khan. So this is this really fascinating um, kind of uh, pollination that we see of, of this instrument um, going, starting from, you know, it's very, very isolated point in Hellenistic Egypt and going through all sorts of transformations, becoming larger, becoming smaller, um, becoming a pneumatic device because ultimately the hydraulic aspect of the water organ 
disappears. Um, water was originally essential to the mechanism, right? In its, uh, in its initial stages, but eventually the, uh, the bellows is refined, adapted and perfected. And we no longer need to see um, water, or we no longer see water as, you know, an essential part of the visual depictions. Um, in any case, um, so this was just sort of to point out uh, th this scholar, Abu Abul Majd, a doctor from Damascus, also had uh, the science here. Anyway, but it's just, it's come so far, right? And yet so close in a way to its original uh, construction. Um, can, Taylor, can you scroll up? Um, and I wanna go back to um, that medieval section just briefly to end up coming to terms with organ music. And let's look at the media here since we have just a moment or two more. Um, so I just wanted to show how far organ music went, right? I wanted to look at this reaction to the abuses of instrumental and vocal music during services by St. Aelred, the abbot of Real Vaux in Yorkshire in 1166, who he's saying, why do we see in church so great a number of organs and sets of bells, these terrifying blasts, why are they better suited than the sweetness of the human voice? And so again, you have a reaction against organ music, but then if we look at the next slide, um, then we have people who, we have the, a defense of the organ by Baldrick, Bishop of Dahl, right? And since this is a sort of a letter to the people of Fay Comp, talking about how wonderful the organ is, right? How it is made um, of all these different bronze pipes, made of all these different things. It's a marvel, gives forth pleasant music, low, medium, and high, and it unites everyone. It brings everyone together. Um, and if we click to the final slide here, there's detractors, right? But it brings everyone together in melody as a result of the, just as the pulp pipes bring everyone to get all the, the melody as a result of the air in them. So men should sink the same thoughts and inspired by the Holy Spirit, unite in a single purpose. All this I've learned from the organs installed in the church. Are we not the organs of the Holy Spirit? and let any man who banishes them from the church, likewise banish all vocal sounds and let him pray with Moses through motionless lips. So he basically is saying here, right, to wrap everything up, that organs are a good thing. And then they are in a sense, a metaphor for the harmony that the moderator of all things has instilled in us by putting together elements entirely discordant in themselves and binding them together by a harmonious rhythm. And so they undertake to use them in accordance with ecclesiastical custom. Um, and so I think we can come out of this now. Um, and Taylor, um, I think we can, uh, we can stop here. And I think just to, uh, to wrap things up, right? Ask if there's any questions about the organ public spectacle, or I'm not even sure if that's a possibility with this time frame, but just opening it up if if there is. All right, I'm just looking through our chat to see. Oh my goodness. Somebody is asking, uh, how large and audible were the first hydrolysis and organs? Um, I would say that uh, the first hydrolysis were you know, not as big as they eventually became. I think um, I would imagine that they were probably about, you know, maybe three feet tall or so, um, four feet tall three feet wide, but I mean, there was a certain amount of variation. And then the, the level of sound would vary as well, depending on the type of the pipes. They had two different pipes, flue pipes, which sounded a little bit more like a flute. 
and then reed pipes, which sounded much louder, much more nasal. And eventually, because of the compressed air, after you know, Nero gets his adaptations in play, they became very, very loud so that you could even hear a hydraulus 60 kilometers away. And they were, you know, sometimes even used in warfare in those cases. The original hydraulis, I imagine, would have been probably flue pipes, I would guess, and more melodious, right, with a sound kind of like a flute or if you were blowing into a bottle. Thank you. And one more question. Uh, Aries Aurelian wants to know, um, were they ever used in battle to demoralize the enemy? Because that would have been one extraordinary scene. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, I had quite a few quite a few quotations of how they were used in battle um, from some of my early Islamic sources. Um, there were some organs that were used by, you know, adapted for battle by some of the Byzantine emperors, and they were particularly particularly loud, used to horrify and terrify as well as to give signals. Very cool. All right. Thank you so much, Emily. I apologize again for the technical difficulties. Um, no, thank you so much for helping me through it. Uh, of course. And I apologize also to uh, our viewers right now because it looks like uh, having our webcams on is not conducive to uh, having our sound quality on. Okay. Uh, Good, so to know. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Thank you again, Emily. Um, at this point, that is. Uh, the end of session three. Thank you again to our absolutely wonderful presenters. We learned so much today. Thank you very much. Um, we just wanted to, so we are going to go into some uh, SASA team presentations. Uh, you know from today and from tomorrow what the virtual conferencing team has been doing. So now we're going to let you know what some of the other teams have been doing. Um, First, I'd like to let you all know that we are looking for interns for this upcoming fall. Uh, you can apply on our website. Um, I'm not sure. Let me just pull up the information really quick to see when our uh, applications are now open and they close July 31st. Um, I myself am an intern. Um, and as you can see, I am very involved with the whole process. Definitely recommend this as an internship if you're looking for more experience and especially if you want to help get involved in saving ancient studies. Um, I also just wanted to shout out our raffle one more time. Um, it is available for, tickets are available for purchase still on our website, saveancientstudies.org, um, under the Virtual Conference 2023 page. It is $25 for one ticket and $100 for five tickets. You can win a Sasa swag basket. There's some pretty great stuff in there. And every ticket you buy helps us save ancient studies. So at this point... Uh, we also have our donate page. Um, if you're not interested in the raffle, you definitely can donate to help us spread the word and help us save ancient studies. Uh, at this point, I am going to turn it over to our, let me just make sure if they're in the waiting room. Uh, our first presenters are Cassandra May and Lauren Kubosh from the live events team. So you guys can go home head and take over whenever you're ready. Hi, you guys. Um, yep, there's a few more people from the live events and communications team coming in. Um, I think Marcus is should be coming too. I think that's everyone that's coming for us. I'm gonna share my screen really quick. hopefully success. <laughs> okay, so hello everyone. Um, we are part of the live events and communications team with SASA. My name is Lauren Kubash. I am one of the co-team leaders of both of those teams. Um, so I will just get started. Oh, I, I guess I could let everyone else introduce themselves quick first, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, I always never know when to do introductions. But yeah, so I'll, I'll move on to Kathy right below me. 
Hi, yes, I'm Cassandra May. Many of you know me as a moderator from earlier today, but I am also the co-lead for the live events team. Charlotte, you're next on my screen. Oh. Hi, I'm Charlotte. I run the TikTok page, uh, but I also occasionally host a live event too. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marcus. Uh, I'm an intern at SASA and I was working on some of the reading groups that we were hosting this summer and I work on some of the Inspire campaign stuff and I help post for some of the social media pages as well. Perfect. We do have a few more other people that are on our teams too that just couldn't make it today. The one name that you see on the screen is Sage Michael. She had to call kind of last minute, but she has been on the live events team um, with me since SAFA started. She's super amazing. We have some other people on the comms team too. So what are SASA live events? It's ranging from monthly book clubs to archeo tours and reading groups. We will talk a little bit individually about each of the things that we do. Um, so you can hear from your favorite authors, learn more about our Port Ancient partners, sign up for summer and winter reading groups and take virtual live tours at different sites and museum locations. We are live streaming basically at least one once a week between our teams and then also the Archeo gaming team, which we'll talk a tiny bit about, but they also have their own presentation tomorrow. So reading groups, I was actually going to talk about this, but I'm thinking maybe I should let Marcus talk about this because Marcus has done a ton of work for the reading groups this summer, would not have been able to do it without him. So I will let him take it away. All right. <clears throat> well, um, so I actually don't have a background in ancient studies, but my main focus is on communication, but working with the reading groups, I've been exposed to a variety of very, very interesting topics in which um, we had different uh, wonderful reading group hosts that um, ha had their own specialization in different uh, historical topics. Um, and they get to talk about things ranging from antiquity to um, just all, all sorts of amazing things. Um, so Sasa's uh, summer and winter reading group uh, connect those uh, interested in the ancient world through a range of topics explored in the live weekly, discu uh, live weekly discussions. Uh, through this project, we aim to continue to open the world of ancient studies to students in high school, college, and beyond. Uh, each, each group is led by Sasa educational ambassadors, <clears throat> ambassadors uh, a dedicated PhD student specializing in that particular area of study. And this uh, summer, our uh, summer reading groups were sponsored by the Gladys Creebull Delmas Foundation uh, and the Society for Classic Studies. So we thank them very much for that because we could not have done it without them. So, and if you guys are interested in learning more about our reading groups, you guys can go to saveancientstudies.org slash reading groups. Yes. So just a tiny bit more about it. We also were uh, funded by the Del Almost Foundation last summer as well. That was really great. We were able to pay our educational ambassadors and for a lot of advertising and all the background setup of the reading groups. Um, so we are very appreciative of that. Um, and on that page that is listed on the screen, uh, there are links to what we call the live syllabi, which is basically wonderful open access reading lists that each of the groups use throughout the groups but then we save that as a pdf and link it on the image of each of these of each of the different groups listed on our page so i always say that those are great resources for people that might be writing a paper on this topic or studying that in school it's like a gold mine of, of like vetted resources basically um, and again shout out to the wonderful educational ambassadors who are mostly grad students and phd students um, on like Marcus said, all different kinds of topics from Mesoamerican studies to classics to Egyptology, biblical studies, et cetera. So we absolutely love the reading groups. It was the first project that SASA ever did and it has been growing strong since uh, 2020. Next up is monthly book clubs with Cassie. Yes, so our monthly book club. Uh, this is essentially your chance to pick the brains of some of your favorite ancient history authors, both fiction and nonfiction, academic books and novels, fantasy to reality. Uh, we explore the worlds of books which are set in ancient times and focus on ancient history. Our past book clubs this year alone, we've had Atalanta with Jennifer Saint, Stone Blind with Natalie Haynes and Cleopatra's Daughter with Dr. Jane Drakett. And upcoming in August, 
on the 20th, we have Empires of the Steps with Dr. Kenneth Harrell. I'm very excited for that one. And September 10th, Footmarks, Footmarks, A Journey into Our Restless Past with Dr. Jim Leary. And in October, I didn't put it on the book club uh, slide here, but we also have two scheduled, uh, Lilith with Nikki Marmory and MJ Pankey's Epic of Helinthia. So yeah, check out our YouTube and view the backlog there. They're all up. Yes, and almost every single one of our live events is recorded and saved on our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch platform. So do go and check out the playlist there. Next up, I think is still Cassie with Kareen the Ship, which is our partnership streams. Yes, yeah, these are a lot of fun. It enables us and um, myself a lot of the time in particular to interview people outside of academia who work on ancient history projects. Uh, we're a partnership network through which we can share a variety of projects that focus on different aspects of ancient studies. We believe these projects help pave the way to save ancient studies via public outreach, accessibility, and engagement with various audiences. Uh, we've done anything, worked with people who work on anything from operas to video projects, podcasts, websites, everything essentially, everything and anything. And our dedicated outreach team works to recruit partners that share our vision and then link it up with live events so we can highlight these projects for you. And, uh, oh, I was just gonna say shout out to a lot of the presenters and co-streamers for our conference today and tomorrow are also Port Ancient Partners. So thank you guys. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to mention that for sure. We couldn't be as big as we are without them. So thank you very much. And one of our most visible projects are our live stream highlights or crewing the ship series. These take place regularly. We aim for one or two a month. Doesn't always work out that way, but hopefully. And they're short 20 to 30 minute streams that are meant to showcase a partner and their work in a conversational way from Mesoamerican studies, Egypt, Greece, Rome, these streams, they cover a wide range of topics and host partners. And we've got some of ours below there on the, the slide. And again, those recordings are saved too. So mm -hmm. uh, in a playlist on YouTube, so a quick and easy place to learn about a lot of these cool projects. Next is Archeo Tours. Uh, so this is a project that we had in the past that we're actually trying to reboot a little bit again now. Um, so some of our, it's mostly through our Port Ancient partners, actually. Some of them are actually tour companies and people that do a lot of on-site kind of things. Um, so we thought that would be a great idea to give people all over the world better access to those kinds of sites and things, people that don't have $3,000 to fly to Italy <laughs> and go and see. Um, this is at um, Trajan's Column is the one on the right over here and stuff like that. Um, so we're trying to reboot that project a little bit um, and, and potentially have it also be at some archaeological dig sites. Again, something that is not very accessible to the open public and um, but people are very interested in. You know, it's a very like fantastical thing of like digging and finding something and like can you imagine if they would have had cameras to record them finding King Tut's tomb or something like that you know um so check look out for us um coming up having more Archeo tourism programs uh really quick I will talk about Archeo Gaming Live they do have a session tomorrow to talk more about their amazing project they're honestly probably our most successful live streams. They stream pretty much every single Friday um, playing video games. So shout out to now Dr. Kate Minetti and Alexander Vanderwalle. Um, they are our fearless leaders. They do an amazing job. Um, we have different guests come on that are usually ex experts in different fields that are related to the games that we're playing. Um, so even like specific, specific niche topic in those games. So like playing Assassin's Creed Creed one time we had someone who is an expert in ancient medicine and diseases um, to come on and talk about it. So pretty much every week we have someone on with our lovely experts to talk about different topics as they're playing through games. Right now, one of our lovely hosts, Julie, from the virtual conference is playing through um, Tears of the Kingdom, the new uh, Legend of Zelda game. So check that out on Friday afternoons. Um, let's keep going to this is just some general stuff about the communications team i think i will hand it over to charlotte absolutely hello so communications team we do a lot internally and uh, a 
communicating with uh, other people as well. Um, the communications team is responsible for everything you see on social media and our website. We work hard to keep our members and viewers up to date with everything SASA from promoting our live events, AEMs and access database to updating the website and creating the SASA Oracle, which is our now bi-monthly newsletter, which if you have signed up and RSVP, you'll probably be seeing a lot more of those. Uh, it is our job to make sure that the ancient world is everything SASA and our partners are doing to promote and protect ancient studies stays relevant, intriguing and fun for the general public. Uh, on that note, um, uh, you might see a very embarrassing photo of me on the screen. <laughs> I run the TikTok page, uh, which is the communications team's newest venture. Uh, TikTok is incredibly useful to young companies because of its ability to boost content and boost videos. Uh, Sasa's uh, most popular video to date, I think, has now had 20,000 views and 3,000 plus likes, which is a major celebration because <laughs> every time we get a view, that means that more people get to see the Save Ancient Studies Alliance and more people can then come over to our Instagram, our website, and find out about all of the wonderful things that we do, um, even if that is just a meme or a fun informational video that you see whilst you're scrolling through breakfast, or if it's directly about a live event or a project that we're doing, uh, TikTok's proving to be quite wonderful. Um, but as uh, the uh, slide you can see now says, we also do a lot of other stuff. Um, our Oracle newsletter is wonderful. We also uh, post, you might not know, the blog on our website, which is under the news tab. If you click on that, we have lots of lovely articles on there. Um, and uh, yes, uh, you will have seen a lot of posts going out about the virtual conference. We've been working around the clock. Uh, so yes, this is the communications team. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I think Marcus was gonna talk a little about the Inspire campaign. All right, yeah. So really quickly, I'll just say the Inspire campaign is one of the funnest things I've been able to do uh, with my time at SAS. I really enjoy um, finding new and creative ways to try to inspire people to uh, engage more with ancient studies. So what is the Inspire campaign? Uh, so SASA's uh, team of summer interns developed an ongoing social media campaign with the aim of inspiring curiosity, engagement, education, and enjoyment with the ancient world. And here are some of the uh, different categories of things we try to work on to inspire people um, uh, with our Inspire program. So uh, ancient anime, uh, pop culture, ancient wisdom, the ancient kitchen, uh, ancient ste uh, stem, uh, modern words, ancient roots, uh, what's that artifact, and my personal favorite, D&D and D&D, &D, which is um, Dungeons and Dragons, or we, uh, as we like to call it, uh, deities, demigods, and demons. Uh, and it just provides like a, a range of unique uh, characters and creatures that are kind of uh, tied back to different uh, mythologies and cool things like that so yeah. yeah and the newest one we were just floating by is sunday pun day um, to have basically meme kind of thing of ancient studies punny memes so look out for that coming up because we love this idea <laughs> um Next up is just where you can follow us. So this is pretty much the end of our presentation, getting towards the end, I think. So please do follow us. This makes a huge difference. The easiest way that you can support SASA is becoming a member of our website, and that is how you will get the SASA Oracle, and then following us on the social media platforms. Um, pretty much anywhere you can search Save Ancient Studies Alliance, and that will be a variation of what our our tag would be and again we post pretty much every single day so we have got lots of fun ancient studies content coming out we also try to sh encourage sharing stuff for our partners sharing stuff about like petitions for department closures um exciting things when um people get new jobs and things like that uh so please do follow us on these pages and check it out to get all the time ancient studies content <laughs> um so yes i think 
that's it. Unless anyone has anyone else has anything to add about our wonderful teens. I think the last thing I will throw in is if you do have a page, even just we're um, partners with like Instagram pages, like book talk and stuff like that. Um, so if you are involved in anything like that or have a project that you're working on, we have projects of all different sizes. Some people have a few hundred followers. Some people have many thousand followers. Um, so please do reach out to us or the outreach team to get involved with the Port Angel project or if you want to do any type of live stream with us um, and check out the saveancientstudies.org slash events page is where you can RSVP to all of our lovely events. So with that, I think there is another team presentation right after ours. So I will end my screen share and hand it back over to I think it was Taylor who introduced us. Thank you so much, guys. Um, the comms team has really been instrumental in working to promote this conference, so we thank you for that. We know how hard you've been working. Um, speaking of RSVPing to events, uh, today is now your last chance uh, for you to RSVP to participate directly in tomorrow's special session. It's the Accessibility and Affordability Workshop. It's scheduled for 12 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. So if you want to RSVP, then you can do that at the SASA website on the virtual conference page. And with that, I believe, yes, I'm going to hand it over to Agnieszka Archik. I'm sorry, Arkish. <laughs> uh, and she's going to talk about the SASA mentoring team. Okay. Hi, everybody. I hope my computer will be working and Wi Fi and everything. If there, if there are any glitches, please let me know. So, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the conference. Uh, my name is Agnieszka Arcisz. I'm the team leader for the mentoring team. And my lovely team and I, for the past year or so, sorry, um, hopefully. Can I can I share it? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, my lovely team and I for the past year, we have been developing SAS's newest project, the mentorship program. So the mentorship program is designed for high school students who wish to pursue higher education in Asian studies and early undergraduate students who want to continue their education in these disciplines. This program aims to complement ongoing mentorship programs developed within educational institutions and beyond. And personally, the reason why this program has been uh, in development at SASA is, well, because SASA's mission is to increase accessibility in ancient studies. Um, and because as an ancient studies student myself, I'm currently finishing a master's in anthropology at the University of Cambridge. I grew very passionate about making ancient studies accessible to students. And making sure that when they already at university studying ancient studies, they already have certain understanding, not of only what ancient studies are or, you know, knowing their myths and stuff like that, but also a little bit more technical stuff on what it's like to study ancient studies, what it's like to study um, an ancient language, for example. And that comes from my personal experience because I've been fascinating with ancient studies, as so many people are, ever since I was a child. And I'm. Um, but when I came to university, I had no idea how to study an Asian language. I've never done it. I've never had an opportunity to do that. I had no one to ask, really. And emailing some very esteemed Polish and English professors at the age of 17 seemed like a very daunting task. So um, this understanding and my team has very similar experiences. And many people at SASA, who everyone really helped us develop this program, have similar experiences. So we want to get... Uh, to give high school uh, students and early uh, undergraduate students who are interested in studying Asian studies an opportunity to get more of an insider speak. So that's the motivation behind that. So yeah, the goal of this program, which I already talked a little bit about, um, is to help us to help prospective students decide if pursuing Asian degree studies is right for them. Because th there is a difference between, you know, wanting to do it full time and maybe wanting to do it just for one year or just as a module. And all of these options are very valid and they are fun. And you don't have to do a PhD in ancient history or like ancient studies in general, and then go on to be in academia. You can do so much with ancient studies degree. So uh, we want to start this conversation early. We want to 
make our mentees be proactive um, because actually a lot of mentoring programs later on when you are a master student or a PhD student require you to approach the professors, uh, approach other students. But how do um, it's also a skill to approach people to go into safe mentoring relationship when you feel respected um, and when you feel safe. Um, so that's why we think it's better to start as early as possible, also to give our mentees an understanding of what mentoring is, really. Um, and also for our mentors, uh, we want to provide them an opportunity to share their wealth of knowledge about ancient studies. I personally have all these weird experiences for doing undergraduate in ancient history. I have no one to share them with. And maybe some of my mistakes, like, for example, study for exam or stuff like that might help others. Um, but, but this is more, uh, but becoming a mentor in our program means much more, but you can also grow a lot as a person and working with younger people, sharing your knowledge is so beneficial for you. Uh, it's a wonderful experience. And so, yeah, we hope that it's going to be a wonderful experience for our mentors as well. Um, we are using a cohort mentoring method. I'm going to finish soon, um, but um, I just wanted to highlight certain aspects of how the program is going to look like so we are using the cohort mentoring method and that means um we are going to have one mentor who's going to guide two up to three uh, mentees and they're all going to meet together which we hope is going to be a fun alternative because in most academic settings a mentoring is usually done one-on-one -on -one, so our mentees already have an opportunity in doing that um but cohort mentoring um it's also a form of mentoring that happens in so many workplaces and actually in academic institutions too, when you go to uh, different classes um, and stuff like that. Uh, but you usually don't get that much time to really talk about certain things during your classes. I mean, depending on the teacher, of course. Um, so yeah, we just thought it's going to be a fun method. Also, hopefully it's going to help break the ice for our youngest uh, mentees. Um cycle structure so each cycle of the program will run for three months during this time cohort will be expected to meet every two weeks and each cohort is scheduling their own meeting so hopefully there won't be any problem with clashing um, schedules um, and in addition to cohort meetings our teams will organize mentorship events every two weeks and that's yet another opportunity on how you can get involved in SASA without fully joining SASA. Um, you can come in as a guest speaker for life events. So if you have studied ancient studies at some point in your life or have done some project, have done some research, and you would like to host a session for our mentees, uh, we would like you to. Um, so we will host this event every two weeks. And we want these events to be very diverse. Um, so we will talk a little bit about what actually academia is, so what's PhD program, what's a master program, why all of these disciplines have different names and then titles and descriptions. Um, but also we would like to talk about what it's like to study ancient studies and not career in ancient studies. Um, so if you are a person who has that experience, we would very much love to hear from you. Um, and also to provide um, support for our mentors, we will run monthly mentor sessions where you can come in and network and chat, talk about your experiences, share advice for other mentors. So we really hope we can create a community of mentors who will also influence the way the program looks. And also the program is going to be online as um, a remote, as everything in SASA. Um, mentor and mentorship events guest speakers application will open at the beginning of September this year and mentee applications will follow in due course. We aim to start the first cycle of the um, program in October this year. Uh, we already have our space on SASA's website, so definitely go and check it out. Uh, once we start um, actually accepting applications, our lovely communications team will definitely let you know. Um, and thank you so much for your attention. I, I think I'm I'm done here. Um, and if you have any questions, please do let me know. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Agnieszka. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to Tara Woodward, who is going to talk about the SASA fundraising team. Awesome, thank you so much, Taylor. Let me just share my screen. 
All right. Um, in terms of the SASA fundraising efforts, um, our the team, uh, which is Amber and myself, uh, have. Whoops, let me just see if this will let me. There we go. Uh, would like to just say thank you so much if you've contributed to SASA over um, this this last year, or even if you've been participating in just sort of the grants or following along with that. Um, in terms of our funding, we kind of have two different streams. One is uh, grant funding helps our programs, more of our educational programs like reading groups or argue gaming models, whereas our individual donations, which is our fundraising portion, um, helps SAS as uh, more of its day-to-day -day operations. So for example, a little bit more like administrative support or, or our programs that keep that running. So thank you for, for your gifts and for making SAS's, pos SAS's work possible. Uh, if you want to head over to our bazaar, we have a number of really cool different items. And if you use the code VC2023, you'll get 25% off your purchase. There's a number of different items uh, and we've just sort of relaunched that bazaar page. So hopefully you can get some uh, ancient merchandise in that way. So um, also in terms of our major fundraising events this last year, we we always host two. One is our birthday bash. And the other one is our Halloween bash. Our gifts increased this last year by 35%, and we've raised over $7,000 from individual donors. Our birthday bash, which is in every April, uh, we had a matching gift, and um, we raised over 4000 or almost $5,000 um, in the last couple of years. And our Halloween bash is our fall celebration, and it focuses a little bit more on reoccurring small gifts in order to create that more sustainable stream of income. So be on the lookout for that uh, this Halloween. In terms of our bazaar, as I mentioned earlier, the SASA merchandise, which has all sorts of fun swag like teas and mugs and tote bags, um, you can purchase. And then SASA actually uh, receives a portion of the income through the sales and the advertising. So if you do purchase some items through the bazaar or even through our raffle tickets, uh, which we'll announce at the end of the conference, you'll get a goodie bag which has merchandise from our store. You can visit the bazaar page at saveancientstudies.org slash bazaar. Uh, and there's some other merchandise that you can see, like mugs that we've got some fun designs or even cell phone cases or, yeah. Um, and then in terms of donating, you can also click on the saveancientstudies.org page and there's a donate button at the top as well as on the virtual conference page. And all those donations help further our mission, which supports ancient studies um, scholars, as well as making this sort of education free and accessible um, for all kinds of independent scholars and community of learners. So we do appreciate your one-time gifts or even your monthly gifts, which can be given in smaller amounts. In terms of our core fund, which is sort of our, it's our, what we would sort of call an annual fund for SASA. Um, it does four different things, which is communication, research, outreach, and executive team. Those are the sort of basic activities um, that run our day-to-day -day organizations. And you've heard various facets of that in the last couple of presentations. Um, like I mentioned earlier, if you do donate, you'll receive a raffle ticket and that will get entered into to win a swag bag. So for uh, every ticket entry of, of $20, $20 donation, you'll get one ticket and donations of $100 will receive an extra raffle ticket. So 50 for two, 75 for three, and then 100 for five. And we will announce the winner of that swag bag during the social hour tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and then a number of our grants are also supported by a variety of um, organizations such as the University of Northern um, North Carolina Chapel Hill or the Society for Classical Studies, the uh, Gladys um, Crable, the Delmas Foundation, which supported our summer reading groups and the New Jersey Humanities. So uh, they've done a number of really helpful projects for, for them. And we uh, also, um, well, I guess it's in the next page, but I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's that BC 2023 for the Bazaar page, uh, which you can enter to get all these sorts of things. But in terms of our uh, most exciting thing for our grant team is that we received a $20,000 grant um, from the um, Vayner Grain uh, Foundation to fund our next virtual conference in 2024. And that will feature, which we're really excited about, live interpretation of English, Spanish, and Arabic to make ancient studies more accessible and more um, accessible in terms of language as well and location. Um, so thank you so much for all of your gifts and the ways that you contribute to SASA. And that is all we have. 
Thank you so much, Tara. Um, fundraising is a really integral part of what we do at SASA. It really helps us spread the word and save ancient studies. Um, on behalf of the virtual conferencing team, I just want to thank everybody for coming today. We look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to David Danzig, our founder, for a few final words. Thank you so much, Tara, and thank you, Taylor. Um, again, it was one, a wonderful day today. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Tomorrow, we have a great lineup, a great special session. Please RSVP right now on the website if you want to participate directly in the Zoom. And we really look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. Have a good night, everyone.